You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Captain. What? Look in the viewer. Switch lenses. Yes, sir. It was at 255-417. I don't see anything. Maybe not now, but something glittered down there. We went over a lake, you know. I know. It wasn't that. Well... We'll take a closer look, but it's probably the lake. I'm wasting our time again. What are we turning for? I saw something. What? Something metallic, Carter. Yeah? He thinks so. We're almost there. Then we'll know. Trees, rivers, a regular incubation lab on this planet. I know what you're thinking. Don't. It's got to happen sometime. Yeah? Who says? Only the astrophysicists, the biologists, and... Mason, you've got aliens on the brain. You're contact happy. <laughs> Maybe we've been out too long. Do you really think man is the only intelligent... All right, all, all right. So we're going to meet another race. Great. It would be great. It's going to happen sooner or later. Why not to us? Man, that would be something. Another... There it is. In the viewer. Looks like it might be a ship. Don't count on it. Well, let me see that. We're passing over. Aren't we going to... Will you please... We should at least stop and take some specimens. Mason's right, Captain. But it's your call. In your flight chairs, we'll set down. Captain Ross, Lieutenant Mason, Lieutenant Carter, aboard Spaceship X-89, cruising above the 13th planet of Star System 51. In a little while, supposedly, the ship will be landed and specimens taken. Vegetable, mineral, and, if any, animal. These will be brought back to overpopulated Earth, where technicians will evaluate them. And if everything is satisfactory, stamp their findings with the word inhabitable and open yet another planet for colonization. These are the things that are supposed to happen. In actuality, they will not happen at all, but will instead be superseded by events far more unusual, because the 13th planet of Star System 51 just happens to be located in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Death Ship. Starring John Schneider, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. You heard the man. Strap in. We're going down. What's the matter with the captain? Beats me. I can hardly talk to him anymore. He has been acting pretty strangely. You said it. As if he's fighting something. Yeah, us. You really think it's a ship? If it is, I don't see how it could be from Earth. We've got this run all to ourselves. They might have gotten off course. Uh, not this far. Setting down. Right, Captain. Retros. Look out 
the porthole. Mother of God. It's a ship, all right. Or was. Now it's a bunch of metal, twisted and... Easy. Don't open the hatch till we check the atmosphere. I'll take a reading. Put your suits on. We won't need helmets. Air's good. Let's go, Mike. Can't get out there fast enough, can you? What does that mean? It means I don't like impulsive behavior. Impulsive? Have I made any mistakes? You're on the verge. Well, then you let me know when I cross the line, won't you? Oh, I will. Don't you worry. We stay together, nobody takes any risks. That's an order. I understand, Captain. Carter? Yeah? All right, then. Let's go. Looks like one of our ships. Don't jump to conclusions. Well, doesn't it? From what I can see of the markings, it does. Construction could be standard everywhere. Sounds like you're arguing both sides. You don't mean it could be from another species, do you? I don't mean anything yet. It is one of ours. How could it get so far off course? Go aboard, Captain? I don't like it. We have to find out who they are, don't we? How will we know if we don't... All right, but stay together. Put our gloves on. Sure thing. Man. Pretty familiar, isn't it? Even all bent up like this. It's from Earth, no doubt about it. We don't know that. But Captain, look at the shape, the, the styling. We don't know it, Carter. Ugh, that's just jammed. Maybe the cabin's still pressurized. Not likely. Door frame's probably twisted. We'll try it together. If it doesn't open, forget about it. Forget about it? There isn't time. We have a schedule to keep. It's moving. <laughs> Let's go. Well, this must be the main cabin. Looks like our ship. Use your flashlights. Over here. What? It's a body. Turn him over. Don't. Give me a hand. Dear God. Wait a minute. Do you see what I think I see? There's another one against the wall. Help me lift him. Don't, I said. What is going on here? That one has a face like... Nothing's going on. And the third one, he... Carter, try the auxiliary lights. But Captain, Nick, is it just me or are we standing here looking at three bodies with three faces that look exactly like our faces? Auxiliary lights... Understand. It's not what it seems. Not what it's... Just hang on. Here come the lights. All right, then. First things first. Uh, here's an ID wallet in, uh, in this one's breast pocket. And here's his government card, picture and all. It says, Lieutenant Robert Mason. See it? That's my name, isn't it? That's my face, just like the one in my pocket right here. Well, isn't it? Put it back. Everybody see it? The same as mine. Identical. Put it back. I don't get it. The same with the second one. What is this? You're letting it get to you. Get to me? This is my picture. Me. Hang on. Lay them out and... Get something to cover them with, both of you. Captain, look at the third one and tell me it's not... I see it. Cover them now. No, I'm not touching them again. 
Carter. Nobody else touched them. I, I don't know about you fellas, but I need an explanation for this. I need... We're leaving this wreck now. I said now. Everybody out. in there. We're... We're dead. Our ship is where we left it, just as we left it. Look ahead of you. 50 yards, what do you see? That's our ship over there, the same place we left it a few minutes ago. Not this one. And those bodies aren't ours. But they are. No. You saw them. I don't know what I saw, and neither do you. You agree with him, Mason? What? We're going back to our ship and radio the base. They'll tell us what to do. Will they? Sh shouldn't we... What? Bury our... Dead? They're not ours. Get that through your head. Now let's go. You too, Mason. Right. Move! We're alive, I tell you. Alive. Again. I've been trying it for again. Captain, there's no point if it won't. What is this? It was working before. Maybe it's this planet. What are you talking about? Maybe there's an interfering field. That's of... ridiculous. Try the radionic signal. Captain, it's not going to. It's... Will you do as I say? Again. Again. If it doesn't work the first time... They didn't hear us. The return signal is automatic. Do I have to tell you that? All right, let's, let's go over this again. There's an answer here somewhere. Those bodies in the other ship aren't ours. That much we're sure of. Well, use your heads. These are our bodies. These, right here. Agreed? I don't know anymore. Neither do I. Listen. You both remember what they told us in training? About the theory of circumnavigating time. They said it might be possible for us to leave Earth in one year, and when we got back, even though we thought it was the same year, it might be the year before. Or the year after. Remember that? It was only a theory, Captain. It's more than a theory. It's what happened to us. We went through some kind of a time warp right into the future. And that ship over there is in the future. Is that what you're saying? Only the probable future. And what does that mean? It means that we're not dead. It also means that we're going to be dead. Not if we don't take off. If we don't go up, we can't crash. But our orders... They don't say to kill ourselves. We're alive now, and the only way to be certain we stay alive is not to go up. Then we can't possibly crash. We avoid it, prevent it. I've made up my mind. We stay. It's easy enough for you to decide. Meaning? You have no one waiting for you back on Earth. So I have no reason to go back, and I'll be just as happy here as I would be on Earth? Is that it? I think we should vote on it. Oh, you do? You're not the only one, Captain. I'm the only one who gives the orders. Even when our lives are concerned, huh? Especially where your lives are concerned. We stay. For how long? I'm not setting any time limit, Carter. A month? Two months? I'm not setting any limit. We have enough food left for three weeks, Captain. I've no doubt there's edible food outside. You saw the landscape, trees, vegetation... How will we know what's edible and what isn't? We haven't got the equipment to test it. We'll watch the animals. I saw no animals, Captain. Did you? There will be. Well, if there are, there'll be a different form of life. What they eat might be deadly poisonous to us. 
We'll worry about that when the time comes. Right now, there's only one thing to worry about, preserving our lives. It may not even be necessary to stay here permanently. We may figure something out, but for now, the decision is to stay. Not our decision, Captain. Have you a better solution, then? Working at minimum capacity, the ship's electrical reserve can hold out for months. It won't be working at minimum capacity. Why? We're going to need heat. Lots of it. But it's only twilight, and already the temperature outside is minus 13 degrees. Would you rather lift off? Take the risk of duplicating that ship over there? How can we duplicate it, Captain? How can there be two crash ships? Two of me dead, two of Mason, two, two of you. We'll go over it again until we find an answer. Because we have to. I think I'll lie down. Me too. It's been quite a day. And it's getting dark out fast. Very, very dark. You boy, M Mr. Kramer. How, how did you? How did I? When did you get home? Home? On leave, are you? I. You're looking fit. I expect Mary's mighty pleased to have you back. Well, yeah, did did you see Mary? She don't know. I have to go. Oh, wait up! I'll walk you. I don't understand. How long you been home? I uh, just got here. Oh, you rocket boys sure travel informal these days. Mary know you're coming? I don't think so. Going to surprise her, huh? Yes. Surprise her. How long you got? I'm not sure. You all right, Mike? Hello, Mike. Mrs. Nolan? Oman furlough? I, I don't know. Old Mrs. Nolan still makes that long walk to town every day. <laughs> She'll go on forever. Forever. Hey, maybe we can do some hunting while you're home, huh, Mike? Got my shotgun with me. Always carry it now in case I see something. Not that I ever hit anything, but... Hey, where are you going? Oh, I get it. In a hurry, huh? The house. Mary! There's a car. It's parked in front. Mary! Mary, I'm home. In the living room, the, the kitchen. Mary! Where are you? Mary! Mary! Are you upstairs? Oh! Mary! Why are you... Why are you lying there on the bed like that? Is something... I'm, I'm here. Can't you hear me? I'm... What's this? Telegram. To Mrs. Michael Carter, we regret to inform. Carter. Regret to inform. Carter. What is this? I'm talking to you. What are you? What are you? What's the matter? C C Captain. What's the matter with you? I... I was home. Where? Home. My home. You were here. You are here. No. No, I swear it. I... I saw Mary. She was... there with a, a telegram. It, it said that I'd been killed. You're alive. Those people I know. Kramer. Mrs. Nolan. I just remembered they're, they're dead. Stop it, Carter. Grandma was killed in a hunting accident. Mrs. Nolan was... It never happened. There's an explanation for this. What explanation? I don't know what, but we'll find it. We'll find it, Carter. We'll go over it again and again until we do. You, me, Mason. Where's Mason? He was in his bunk. Well, he's not there now, is he? I've been here the whole time. The hatch is still locked. Mason! Mason! Where is he? Well, where'd he go? You tell me. 
There's nothing but his blanket. My blanket. My blanket. What? What's it doing on the grass? Fishing pole? Can't be. Oh, there you are. I thought I'd never find you. <gasps> Genie. I looked and looked. I found him. Can't be. Lunch is ready, Daddy. And mine's hungry. It's all your fault. Genie, is it really you? What's the matter, Daddy? Come here. Oh, come here. Oh, Genie, Genie. What is it, Daddy? Oh, it is you. What's wrong with you? Oh, nothing. I I'm, uh, I you know, I'm just glad to see you, that's all. Oh. That wasn't your mother you were just calling just now, was it? You're acting weird. Jeannie, was it? Yes, Daddy. You know that. Where is she? Over by the table. Where? Where? <laughs> Bob? Oh, you scared me, honey. Bursting out of the bushes like that. I was just setting out the fried chicken. Oh, God, Ruth. Oh, God. Bob, what is it? Oh. Sweetheart, what's wrong? Nothing now. Are you sure? Yes. Uh, yeah. Oh, yes. <laughs> All this for lunch? <laughs> yes. My goodness, so emotional over a little potato salad and chicken. Where's Jeannie? Back there, uh, by the pond. Were you asleep? Are you still asleep? This is a dream. I hope I never wake up. I just hope I go on dreaming and... Mason! Bob? Ruth? Bob? Who's... Let's go, Mason. Why is he here? Stand behind me. But... Just do it. Get out of here, Ross. I said, let's go. Get away from us. You're coming back with me. Back? Where you belong. On the ship. No, Bob. You're having a hallucination, Lieutenant. No, it's real. It isn't. And you're leaving with me. No! Come on, you think you can take me? Stop it! Don't oh, you take me back! You're coming back! I'm staying here. You can't! I won't let you! No! Yes! Back! 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 I don't want to be here. I don't want to be here. Take it easy. <laughs> Ruth. <laughs> Ruth. Ruth. There was no Ruth, no genie. You lie. <laughs> Let go of me. Oh. Look in your billfold, look. What does the clipping say? Read it. Leave me alone. I'll read it for you. Space pilot's family dies in car crash. The wife and seven-year-old daughter of astronaut Robert Mason died early this morning when the car they were in... It's not true. Now do you still insist you were with them? You alive? They dead? I was with them. I was, and you took me away. It's not true, Mason. You took me away from my wife, my home, I... You were here all the time. You and Carter. Uh, he was gone. No. We just couldn't see him, that's all. What are you talking about? I know what it is now. That's what I'm talking about. Give me that clipping. I was wrong. It, it had nothing to do with circumnavigating time. Nothing at all. Mason, remember what you thought when you saw that ship over there? Alien contact. That's what you thought. And that's exactly what's happened to us. The captain, there are no such things as... Listen to me, neither of you was where you thought you were, at, at home. That ship over there isn't ours, and those bodies aren't ours. We, we've been tricked. By who? Well, by whoever it is that lives on this planet and doesn't want anyone else to live here. Now who's crazy? Don't you understand? We haven't seen them, but there are aliens here. 
but aliens who aren't strong enough to chase us away by force or kill us. So what can they do? How can they keep their planet from being colonized? By mind control, that's how. By picking at our brains and finding the death fear and making use of it by showing us our ship crashed and us dead inside of it, scaring us so much that we didn't dare take off again and therefore haven't been able to make our report about this planet. They even know that we can't radio or report to Earth because there's too much interference. You didn't believe there was interference before. I believe it now. Everything that's happened to us since we landed on this planet has been a delusion. No, it happened. I was home. I was It with was a delusion. Even Mason's disappearance? W well, why not? If they can make us believe we saw a crashed ship, saw our own bodies inside that ship, they can make us believe anything. That ship over there, that pile of twisted metal, it's not real. Is that your theory? You may see it, even think you touch it. That doesn't prove it exists. What's going to prove it doesn't exist, Captain? What's going to prove that everything you've said is true? I'll tell you what's going to prove it, Lieutenant Mason. Us. Going up, taking off, and going all the way back to Earth. Proving that there's nothing holding us back but fear and delusions. Now take your positions and let me at the controls. Wait a minute. In your seat, shoulder straps. What if you're wrong? I'm right. You thought you were right before. You were ready to keep us here indefinitely, you were so sure. Then in a few minutes, we really will be dead. Flight seats, now. No. What do you think you're... I'm with Mason on this. Get your hands off those switches. That's an order. Are you so arrogant that you'll take a chance on killing us just to prove your point? I'm still the captain of this ship, and you'll do what I say. You're not the captain of our lives. Put your sidearm away. You are not taking us up. You want to stay here then? Starve? Freeze? Never see Earth again? Put it away, Mike. That's no answer. Then what is? I suppose he's right. You agree with him now? He's got a point. It's a big one. We can't just stay here. We do that and we know what'll happen. That's a given. It's a matter of food and the power supply and the temperature at night. We don't have a choice. I guess we don't. There's only one place left to go, and that's up. God have mercy on our souls. Pressure. Rising. Drive reactor. Check. Coordinates. Check. Gyro stabilizer. Active. Vertical thrust. Energized. Then prepare for liftoff. Check. Three hundred, five hundred, here we go. One thousand, twelve fifty, fifteen hundred, Captain. <laughs> Look at that. Twenty two fifty, twenty seven fifty, three thousand, four, five, six thousand. We're out. Release shoulder straps. We did it, boys. Check the viewer. Checking. Well, see anything down there now? You were right. If I ever see anything glitter in that viewer again, I'll keep my mouth shut. I was right. Captain? What are you? What are you doing now? Taking her down. We're landing. What? But say that again. Now that we know what it is, there's no reason we shouldn't go back, is there? No reason? Are you out of your mind? Captain, for God's sake! Think. The other ship, the bodies that looked like ours, all an illusion. That's what we were afraid of, but none of it was real. 
Maybe. That's still a hypothetical. Yeah, we have to get out of here while we have the chance. Now stand aside. Get your hands off the controls. We have orders, Carter. Pick up specimens for analysis. We are going to pick them up. No, we're not. You're not going to... Now you've done it. Now you've done it! Let me at the main controls. You were right the first time. That was us down there. We're gonna crash. Now! No! We're going to die. We're not going to die! I'm not going to let us die. Auxiliary thrusters. It's no use. The stabilizer. The stabilizer. <laughs> I don't understand. Shut up. You're a coward, Carter. You don't even have the guts to fight for your own life. We're still going to land? You bet we're going to land. And when we do, you're going to see that the other ship is gone. Vanished. Because it was never there in the first place. Retros. Slow airspeed. I've got it. Now get in your places. We're not gonna crash. He's been right all along, hasn't he? I don't know. Prepare for touchdown. Now, take a look out the port. It's too dark to see anything. Use the spotlight. Looking. Well? Landscape looks the same. Clear. Clear, but how do we know we're facing in the right direction? Give me that. Go on, take a good look. Hills, trees, and... What is it? Let me see. Oh, no. No, no! Gone, Captain? Vanished? Is that what you said? All right. It's still there. I'll say it is. The same wreck. That doesn't mean... I'll tell you what it means. It means you're wrong. Dead wrong. Hang on. There's an explanation for this. And that would be... I don't know yet, but... You'll never know. And neither will we. Now we'll have to go up again, and this time we'll really crash and be killed and end up looking just like those, those four... No. What did you say? We're not going to crash. <laughs> How do you know? We're not going to crash because we already have crashed. Explain that. Stop fighting it, Captain. You're all out of explanations. What are you... There's only one explanation left, and you know what it is. Mason? I know nothing of the kind. Yes, you do. Carter was home, and that telegram was really there. I was with my wife and daughter, because I'm like them now. No. Accept it, Captain. Accept what? Stop trying to prove that we're alive. We are alive. I don't know what it is that's happening here, but there's an answer somewhere. Somewhere. I've given you the answer. I don't accept it. We're going over this again. We're going to find the real answer. Maybe you should listen to him. Can't you see that's what we've been doing? Going over it again and again? Then we'll just have to keep going on until... What happened to the lights? Mason, I... Let us die, Captain. I, I can barely see you. It, it, it's like I can see through you. Let go of us. Let us die. No. No! We're alive. Alive. We're going over it one more time from the beginning, you hear me? One more time.
Captain. What? Look in the viewer. Switch lenses. Yes, sir. It was at 255-417. I don't see anything. Maybe not now, but something glittered down there. We went over a lake, you know. I know, it wasn't that. Well, we'll take a closer look, but it's probably the lake. I'm wasting our time again. What are we turning for? I saw something. What? Something metallic, Carter. Yeah? He thinks so. We're almost there, then we'll know. Trees, rivers, a regular incubation lab on this planet. I know what you're thinking. Don't. It's gotta happen sometime. Yeah? Who says? Only the astrophysicist, the biologist, and... Mason, you've got aliens on the brain. You're contact happy. <laughs> Maybe we've been out too long. Do you really think man is the only intelligent... All right, all, all right. So we're going to meet another race. Great. It would be great. It's going to happen sooner or later. Why not to us? Man, that would be something. Another... There it is. In the viewer. Looks like it might be a ship. Don't count on it. Well, let me see that. We're passing over. Aren't we going to... Will you please... We should at least stop and take some specimens. Mason's right, Captain. But it's your call. <sighs> In your flight chairs, we'll set down. Captain Ross, Lieutenant Mason, Lieutenant Carter, aboard Spaceship X-89, cruising above the 13th planet of Star System 51, in a little while, supposedly, the ship will be landed. Picture of a man who will not see anything he does not choose to see, including his own death. A man of such indomitable will that even the two men under his command are not allowed by him to see the truth. Which truth is that they are no longer among the living, that the movements they are now about to make, the words they are now about to speak, have all been made and spoken countless times before, and will be made and spoken countless times again, perhaps even unto eternity. Pictured of a latter-day flying Dutchman sailing into the Twilight Zone. Death Ship, starring John Schneider with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Jeff Lupiton, Tom McElroy, Frenette Lebo, Amanda Amari, Doug James, and Ellie Weingart. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Dick Brescia Associates, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Audio editing, sound design, Foley effects, and mix for the Twilight Zone radio dramas are by Cerny American creatives Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, Bob Benson, and Jason Rizzo. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking.
You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Time to feed the kitty. I've been feeding it all night. Yeah, that baby's hungry. Let's go, boys. You heard the man. Put in two chips. Two times how many hands? The auntie's eating me alive. You got some cards coming. I can feel it. Yeah? That a money-back guarantee? You pay your money, and you take your chances. Dealer aunties. Let's go, Johnny. I gotta give it some thought. My stack's getting pretty low. <laughs> Look at who's sitting this one out. That right, Johnny? I'm thinking, I'm thinking. I know one thing. Takes money to win money. Yeah, yeah. Listen to the man. Are you in or out? Give me one minute, all right? Take it easy, John. Hey, you don't look so good. Maybe you should kick back, watch some TV. Hey, hold on. I came here to play cards. Hand me that remote. Say, what are you... Just give it to me. The old fire hall is there. So You're going to let one lousy player hang up the game? Three. Don't worry about it. Johnny here needs some time out. You know the old saying. What's that? Money talks and suckers walk. Scientists are baffled as all communications in and out of Peaksville remain blocked. For live coverage, our eyeball news team takes you inside the city limits following this broadcast on the 11 o'clock report. And that's a wrap of today's news. I say deal them. All right, boys, here we go. Down the derby. Okay, already. I'm all in. You ain't even looked at your cards. What's the difference? One more hand and I'm out. Sure, Johnny, maybe you'll double up. I got a good feeling this time. <laughs> Me too. I'll see that and I'll raise you. Raise? Everything I got's in the pot. Separate side bet. I fold. Dealer raises again. Call. Cards, John? Three. Keeping a kicker, huh? All right, four. Come on in! Who's that? A friend of mine. Said he'd stop by. Heck of a time for it. It's open! Jody Hallam? Who wants to know? Mr. Hallam, will you come with us? You got a warrant? No, sir, but... Then get out of my room. My associates and I are having a friendly game of cards. This is a federal matter. We have a car waiting downstairs. Oh, good for you. You see any money on this table? Because I sure don't. There's no time to lose, sir. If you'll just come with us. Hey, why the cuffs? Someone wants to see you in Washington. Uh, be seeing you, Jody. I'll just hold on to my chips for now. Let me call my lawyer. No need for that. What's this all about? A matter of national security, sir. You might say a matter of life and death. Excuse me, gentlemen, if you don't mind. We'll just fast forward out of here. Hey, will somebody tell me what this is all about? Winning lottery numbers coming up, but first the news. In world news, the asteroid known as Wanderer continues on a path toward our solar system. But there's no cause for alarm. Scientists say it will miss Earth by several million miles. Repeat, despite rumors, there is no danger. Wanderer poses no threat to our world. And now, here's a handy household hint from our home economist. Portrait of a man who has just been granted a reprieve. Not from a card game because it's a sure bet he would have won, given his considerable skill as a dealer. No, the two men in gray suits have saved him from almost certain deaths. His name? Jody Hallam, a gambler and con man who lives by his wits, and wants above all else to go on living. At the moment, the odds still look good for Mr. Hallam, but he is about to discover that the laws of chance don't always apply. 
in the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Pattern for Doomsday, starring Henry Rollins, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. And I can tell you that its progress has been closely watched for the past month, as is the case with all unidentified objects sighted in space. May we have the slide, please? Excuse me, General? Yes. The Eighth Man, uh, he's here. Showman. Yes, sir. Has he been briefed? Just the basics on the way over. I'll handle it from here. Mr. Hallam, have a seat at the end of the table. Well, aren't you going to introduce me to everybody? After the presentation, General Sinclair has the floor. Sit, please. Okay, okay. Now then, slide please. This is a routine photo from the 200-inch Hale telescope on Mount Palomar. Must be some camera. Shh. I don't see anything. Let me use the pointer. That short white line in the star field is the first picture we have of Wanderer. May I ask a question? Dr. Uh, Conrad, is it? Yes. When exactly was this taken? A little over a month ago. October 3rd, to be exact. I see. Next slide. This photograph, taken only three weeks ago, indicates that Wanderer is indeed headed for our solar system. Next slide. And this shot conclusively establishes what astronomers feared, that Wanderer is on a collision course with Earth. What? Next. This picture from two days ago allows astronomers to accurately measure Wanderer. It is about 2,000 miles in diameter, a little less than our moon. Can we have the lights, please? Hey, General, is this on the level? I wish I could report otherwise. The fact is, the time of collision is now 53 hours and 40 minutes. Couldn't we blast it with an H-bomb or something? I saw that in a movie one time. Efforts are underway to destroy or deflect the asteroid, but unfortunately, there isn't much hope for success. Hey, General, if, as you say, astronomers have known about it for some time, why is it that the public hasn't been told the truth? To begin evacuating the cities, for example. To avoid panic. Virtually all heads of state are in agreement. And the damage is projected to be so widespread that there's no longer any point. But what about us? Why were we dragged here if this thing's going to hit in a couple of days? And I thought I was washed up. Now I find out the whole world's done for. What do you expect us to do, General? Most of us are ordinary citizens. Mr. President. Please remain seated. Have you finished your briefing? I have, sir. I wanted to meet you all personally. It's a great service you're about to perform for your country and for the world. I don't like the sound of that. He's not as tall as he looks on TV. Please, hold your questions. That's all right, General. They're about as confused as the rest of us. I'll get to the point. Out of the entire population, you eight people are among a very few to be made aware of the situation. Let me tell you why. I can handle that part if you like, Mr. President. No, no, they deserve to hear it from me. I'm the one who signed the order. It's taken 10 years for the United States to build its first nuclear-powered spaceship, the Varuna-1. It was intended for the exploration of space. That ship now stands on a launching pad in New Mexico, ready for its first and last mission that of transporting human life to a new planet, to grow and multiply. To put it simply, you have been selected to represent the future of the human race. And we're really in trouble. You can say that again. Is he serious? That's crazy. Why us? know that in you rests the heritage of all humanity. Our prayers go with you. Good luck and Godspeed. Thank you, sir. Are you the psychologist? Dr. Russell Conrad, Denver, Colorado. I'd like to shake all of your hands. Francie Blaze, Los Angeles. I, um, 
entertain. Pleased to meet you. Jody Howland, Mr. President. I'm from Chicago. I guess you could say I'm a speculator. I see. R Regina Walsh, Kansas City, Missouri. I'm a singer. O or I was. Is that right? D. Clark, Spokane, Washington, bacteriologist. How do you do? Philip Jewell, New York City. Mr. President, I'm not sure I approve of all this. I don't You're understand... You're Dr. Jewell? Yes. I've read several of your books on philosophy. Thank you. But about what's happening here... General Sinclair will fill you in on the details, Doctor. Lily Wong, San Francisco. I am an artist. Hello. Harvey Winteroth, Traverse City, Michigan. And just an auto mechanic. Don't say that. You all have very valuable skills, chosen to complement each other. Believe me, the hopes and aspirations of the world go with each and every one of you. Try to bear that in mind. And now, goodbye and good luck. Thank you for taking the time, sir. Never thought I'd get to meet the president, but there I was, shaking his hand and talking to him. General, I demand to know... Yes, Mr. Jewell? Just how did eight people get picked to represent the human race? It was not at random, I assure you. It was a matter of careful selectivity. A computer was programmed with all relevant factors. Physiological, psychological... Who did the programming? Panel of experts from several disciplines. Based on what criteria? General health, adaptability, fertility. That's why you all had examinations. Varied backgrounds, genetic history, immunity to disease, long-term stability on the cellular level. Out of what sampling? The entire population, Doctor. At least those we had preliminary data for. General, how come the president isn't going? He's a very important man. I would have thought... He's married, which was one of the disqualifying factors. For those of you who are interested, the criteria are listed in the background report. I have copies if you like. Well, I'd like to see that report. On the table at the back of the room, there's a packet for each of you. Look at me. What a mess. I better fix my face. You look fine. Don't kid me. We're not here because of our looks, that's for sure. Must be because we're in such good shape. Yeah, you're a regular bodybuilder. I'm serious. Other kids got the measles, but not me. I was always lucky that way. Goody for you. Oh, maybe not 100%, but when I lost, it was because someone else was dealing. <laughs> Man, I sure wised up in a hurry. A dealer, huh? I can spot one a mile away. Fingers always twitching. Just keep them to yourself. Hey, now, baby, I never done anything crooked with these fingers. I know. You just help the cards along. The suckers get greedy, that's all. So they get restless and overplay. Is that my fault? Can I help it if they want to make it all in one night? I ask you, who's the smart one, me or them? You heard what the general said about brains. We'll see how you make out where we're going. Listen, Jody Hallam always makes out. You remember that. Just don't try any magic fingers on me. Ha! Don't flatter yourself. Come on, I want to get the lowdown on this game. After that, it was all entered into the memory banks. The results were collated and sorted until we had it down to this number. Ah, so we have a machine to blame for being here. Blame? You should be happy the machine picked you. Should I? Then why do I feel as if I'm deserting humanity in its hour of need? General, how soon will the Varuna leave Earth? In less than 24 hours. We'll all be flown to the launch point. What about food on the ship? It will be stocked with bread, soup, meats, even ice cream in a concentrated form. Enough for a lifetime if necessary. You won't be hungry. Uh, how can I get that much chow on one ship? It will be made from continuously harvested tanks of chlorella, a fast-growing single-celled plant. A plant. That doesn't sound very palatable. Hey, General, where are we supposed to land? There's an area on Mars if we can confirm it's suitable for a small colony. How about if it's not? Ship's nuclear power pack can take you all the way to Alpha Centauri if necessary. Using a new form of hyperdrive. 
That's the nearest star system with habitable planets. Maybe there'll be people there like us. I read a story about a princess on Mars. Then you can go into your dance and knock their eyes out, if they have eyes. Who's kidding who? I was never a very good dancer. I was never very good at anything. But I got along because people would pay for it. All that's over with now. You better believe it. I'll start over up there. Be me this time. I'll be what I want to be, not what they want me to be. Right. Keep that attitude. I have a question. Who's flying us to where we are going? We've assigned a crew of two. That should be sufficient. Captain Gerald Vickers and Lieutenant Robert McKenna. You will meet them when... Oh, excuse me. Sinclair? Yes. Right away. Limousine is downstairs, ready to take you to the airport. No calls for us? To say our goodbyes? I'm sorry, Doctor. We can't risk breaching security. Now, if you'll all come with me, please. You have a great adventure ahead of you. Perhaps the greatest in the history of mankind. Oh, wow. take off. Oh, don't worry about it. The odds are on our side. Are you serious? <laughs> this crate could fall out of the sky at any time. Relax. You got more chance of being hit by a car. Yeah, sure. I mean it. You see the giant seal? What? There ain't no animals. Are there? The seal of the United States of America. This is some kind of official plane. They're not going to take any chances. What if we get... get hijacked? Now you're really dreaming. We got searched. Nobody could bring a gun in here. Oh, yeah? What about them? Who? The guys up front. With Sinclair. Take a look. They both got pieces under their coats. How do you know? I know. You don't think I ever saw a shoulder holster before? Well, if they got him, it must be okay. Secret Service or something. A lot of good they can do us now. Easy, baby, easy. Ladies and gentlemen, in a few moments we shall be landing. Thank you. ID, please. General Sinclair and Company to Operations. Oh, right, General. Operations is the first building. Straight ahead. I know where Operations is, sir. Yes, sir. Open the gate. Just follow the walkway to the entrance. How do you do, sir? Good to see you, Captain. Lieutenant John McKenna, General. At ease. This is your pilot, Captain Gerald Vickers, and Lieutenant McKenna. Mr. Hallam, Miss Walsh. Welcome. Hiya. Captain, huh? Miss Blaze, Dr. Conrad. Hello. Miss Clark, Dr. Jewell, 
Miss Wong, Mr. Winteroth. Hi. Nice to meet you. You're the pilot? I'll do my best. I sure hope you know what you're doing. Nice to meet you. Nice to meet you. Well, there she is. Where? Out in the field. Take a good look. That ship's gonna be home for a long time. It's beautiful. Wow, some design. A little small, isn't it? Not really, Miss Blaze. It's a very efficient design. Just enough room for eight passengers. Eight? Don't you mean... I'll go over the details in a few minutes. For now, they're expecting us inside. If you'll follow me... General Sinclair? What is it? General, I have a communication from the Pentagon. Priority A. Very well. That will be all. Yes, sir. Hmm. What is it? Don't tell me. The flight's overbooked. You might as well know. The nuclear missiles we sent up from three countries to intercept Wanderer have made contact. All detonated on impact. They hit Wanderer? And? Well, don't keep us in suspense. There was no appreciable deviation. The asteroid is still on course. What does that mean, in plain English? It means that there's no last great hope for Earth. I would say, then, that this group is our hope. Captain Vickers. Yes, Doctor. Something you said a moment ago. What was that? Well, you said there was only room for eight people aboard the ship. That's right. Does that include you and Lieutenant McKenna? I'll answer all your questions at the final briefing. But... This way, please. Sit down, if you will. How many more hours do we have? When are you going to feed us? I'm a little queasy myself. In about an hour. We're on a tight schedule. A general, I asked a question outside. I think I deserve an answer. We're eight people. The captain and the lieutenant make ten. But if the ship will only hold eight... I have an announcement in that regard. When this group was organized by presidential order, two reserves were included. Who? You mean we're not all going? Why didn't you tell us the truth? What are they arguing about? They got an angle. I knew it. There was no way of telling if you were all alive and well, or even if you could be located once the selection was made. The reserves were a way of preparing for any contingency. As it turns out, one that didn't occur. So who are the reserves? They were not specified. What? Then we don't know if we're on the list or not? In that case, I volunteer to stay behind. I'm afraid I can't accept your offer, Doctor. I'll give up my place. I have friends who are going to die. I'd rather spend my last hours with them. I sympathize with you, Miss Wong, but I can't accept your offer either. Then how... It was provided that in a case like this, the matter would be decided by chance. Leave it to me, General. Don't make me laugh. It just so happens I have a deck of cards with me. We'll cut for it. High cards go. Mr. Hallam. You want to be fair, don't you? This is the only way. Never fails. Aces and kings, sure winners. After that... I can't let you do this. Deuces and trays on the low end. Got it? Everybody, come up one by one and... We are not using cards, Mr. Hallam. I'm in command here. Then how? We flip a coin? Sometimes the old ways are best. We'll draw straws. Whatever you say, General, makes it simpler. Watch me. I'm tearing out matches. I'll make two of them short. Sit down, Mr. Hallam. No matches? Well, in that case... I said sit down. All right, all right. Just trying to help. Captain Vickers has prepared the straws, or their equivalent. Captain? Yes, sir. I have eight pencils here. They've already been measured, so there can be no mistake. Who's first? Miss Blaze? Why me? The order won't make a difference. Go ahead, Captain. Anyone at all. If you say so. Here goes. Just take one of the ends and pull it out of my hand. This looks like a good one. 
I'll go next. Now, Dr. Jewel. Followed by Miss Wong. Mr. Winteroth from Michigan. Miss Clark. Miss Walsh. And Mr. Hallam. There. That does it. Everybody hold them up. The short ones are Miss Clark and Mr. Hallam. You two will not be going with us. Hey, wait a minute. Sit down, Mr. Hallam. I was the last man on the totem pole. I didn't have a choice. Someone had to be last. Sure. Give everybody a break, but me. Statistically, it doesn't matter. The result was random. All I'm asking for is a fair shake. Game over, Mr. Magic Fingers. But I'm telling you, it ain't fair. You should talk, honey. Sit down. Are we free to go? You are, Miss Clark, with my profound thanks. You may go to the bunker with the rest of the personnel to observe, if you like. Or I can have you transported any way you choose. I'll have to think about that. Of course. There's a rest area down the hall. Lieutenant McKenna will open the beverage machines for you. Thank you. And goodbye to you, Mr. Hallam. And thank you, Mr. Hallam. Yeah, thanks for nothing. Come on, let's get out of here. Why don't you sit down? You're making me nervous. Yeah, yeah. Miss Clark's right. Would you like a cup of coffee? I'd like a shot of scotch if you want to know the truth. Cream and sugar? Black. Do you have family, Lieutenant? Yes, ma'am. I mean, miss. Uh, back in Austin. Oh. Are, are you going there to be with them? I sure hope so. If there's time. It's a terrible thing, I suppose. The little tragedies. We have time to absorb them. But something like this, it's, it's too vast to comprehend. I know what you mean. Cut the chatter. What is this, a funeral? You might call it that. Well, I tell you one thing. The game isn't over till it's over. You never know what's going to happen at the finish. This isn't a horse race, Mr. Hallam. We'll see about that. Give me the coffee, will you? Of course. Yeah. Tastes like mud. If you'd rather have a soft drink... Forget it. Sorry you didn't care for it. Yeah, sure. Where do you come off so high and mighty? Uniform, shine on your shoes. You know something? Underneath, you're just like the rest of us. Scared out of your gourd. I'd better see how the general's coming along. Will you sit down? It won't be much longer. Then you'll be back with your own kind. I don't see why you're so anxious to go home. One of them in there could have a heart attack or something. And then what would we do? Draw straws again to see which one of us goes? Sure, why not? At least try to face reality and make peace with it. Listen, if they let me do it my way, you think I'd be sitting out here? Oh, you mean you'd have fixed the cards. Lady, when your life is on the line, you try anything. Even if it means pain or misfortune for others? If that's the way the chips fall. <laughs> you amaze me. I thought I'd seen all kinds. You ain't never seen Jody Hallam before. Thank God for small favors. I would say, Mr. Hallam, that you're nothing special on the evolutionary scale. More along the lines of a throwback. I mean, you've hardly advanced beyond your one-celled progenitors. Say, is that a wisecrack? I've seen your kind under microscopes. Bacteria don't have a conscience either. Oh, but they do? In there? How do you know Vickers didn't fix it the way the General wanted? Don't be absurd. It was impartial, and we lost. I'm ready to leave whenever they let me. Go ahead, give up. That's what you learned in your school. But where I come from, it's a different story. General? Yes? General, I'm sorry I blew my stack before, but 
Well, it's a hard thing to take. It really hit me, you know? Believe me, I understand. Everybody all set? They've had their final instructions. Everything worked out, huh? No hitches? Ladies and gentlemen, you'd better get ready for the pre-launch. Look, do you think it would be all right if I see him to the ship? Wish everybody good luck and everything? Mm, I don't see why not. That doesn't sound like you, wishing everybody but yourself good luck. No? Why the change of heart? Can't win them all. You ought to know that. That's not what you told me before. Well, that's what I'm telling you now. Miss Blaze? Yeah. I mean, yes, sir. We're going to the ship now. Follow me. Sure thing. Uh, not you. General Sinclair said it was okay. Only fly personnel on the field. I know. <laughs> I'm gonna say goodbye to him on the ship. General? It's all right, guards. Let him pass. Proceed. Sure, thanks a lot. Nice gun you got there. Oh, you coming with us? You'll have to use the ladder one at a time, please. Well, this is it. So long to the good old U.S. of A. It was a rat race. But I think I'm gonna miss it. It just doesn't seem possible to think that all this will change in a few hours. How much time? Uh, not long, by my watch. The Barbuda One is now on internal power. Look at all those stars. The sky's like this in Michigan. There's a place I used to fish at. I guess I won't see it again. We'd better get aboard. Move ahead to the control room at the end of the passage. Guards, stay with us a moment longer. How long to lift off? Eight minutes. I'll give the engines a final check. Thrusters, powered up. Retros, all clear. Gyro stabilizer, charged. I feel like a sardine already. Relax, baby. This is one tin can nobody's gonna open. Aren't you supposed to wave bye-bye now? Let me have your attention. This is it, Mr. Hallam. Shh, I want to hear what he says. The president has asked me to extend his blessings and his hopes for a safe journey. Also, he's aware of the hardships that lie before you. He wants to remind you that in all the years to come, you must not lose sight of your purpose. Guards, There's a sir, library see Mr. Hallam back to the building. Yes, sir. Each of you come with me. In a minute, I said. It will be your trust to nurture the first generation born off Earth. For upon this, a new civilization will be built long after we are forgotten. This way. Right. What kind of gun are you packing? 45 automatic, huh? Keep moving. Can I see it? Keep your hands. I just want to look at it. Wh what in the. Back off! Drop it. Not on your life. Watch him. He's got a gun. He's. Ah! <laughs> Hold it! Now, General, since Dr. Jewell here won't be making the trip, as his reserve, I'm electing myself to take his place. He didn't want to go anyway. Do you think these people would have you after this? No more pretty speeches. You and the guards, make yourself scarce and drag the doctor with you. Something wrong with your hearing? General. Touch your holster, flyboy, and you're a dead man, too. Do as he says. That's better. <laughs> well, what do you know, honey? Looks like we're gonna get better acquainted after all. What do we call you now, little Caesar? Just what do you expect to gain by this... this murder? Life, my friend, in the big blue up there like the rest of you. Oh, I know you're thinking you'll make me pay, but you won't. Not if there's only eight people left. You're gonna need me. Keep your distance, buster. 
Now, Francie, you know better than that. A man gambles, he loses here and there, but the game's not over till the last card's been played. Am I right or am I right? Hey, you! Keep your hands where I can see them! I can't let you do this. Back out of here real slow, like. You too, Lieutenant. Are you going to shoot them too? If you do, who will fly the ship? Back out, I said. I'm not going anywhere. Neither am I. Put the gun down. <laughs> yeah, sure. There are too many of us. Guards, Mr. Hallam is going to surrender his weapon. Take him into custody. Yes, sir. You're invading my space, flyboy. You're surrounded, mister. Hand it over. Now. Don't make me laugh. If he won't, I'll just have to take it. I warned you, the next one won't miss. Try me for a target, little man. Let go! Drop it! Drop it! Now look what you've done. That ain't in the rules. Does he have a pulse? No, sir. Dr. Jewell. Are you all right? It's just my shoulder. The bullet passed through. Guard, get the medical kit. All right, General. We won't be going anywhere, General. The second shot took out the control panel. Can it be repaired? Not the telemetry system. Then replace the module. There is no replacement. It would take days to assess the damage. He's right, General. <sighs> is that true? You mean we can take off? How can we? What are we going to do? Yeah, what are we going to do? I wish I knew what to say to you. Damn him! Just because he wasn't going... He was right. What? He always said he was lucky. And maybe he was. Now he won't have to face the odds. What's that? Whatever it is, he's sure in a hurry. General, up here! This just came in, sir, from the president. I am happy to tell you all that the danger is past. The president informs me that gravitational forces in the solar system have apparently torn Wanderer apart. You mean it's not going to hit Earth? Initial reports are that it is broken up into five pieces. Each will miss us by many thousands of miles. Let's get out of here. One at a time, folks. Can I give you a hand, Miss Blaze? You can give me two hands if you want. <laughs> a big, brave captain like you. Call me Francine. Okay. Francine, I'll help you down. The launch has been scrubbed. What about him, Mr. Big Time Gambler? There'll be an ambulance on the way. He doesn't need an ambulance. He needs a hearse. Jody Hallam from Chicago. I got three words for you. So long, sucker. Portrait of a man who lived by his wits and wanted to go on living. The odds looked good, at least for a while. But when billions were marked for death, he lost faith in the laws of chance. Jody Hallam, who played a desperate last card and ended up the only man on earth to die as the direct result of a threat that never came true. In the Twilight Zone.
Pattern for Doomsday, starring Henry Rollins with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Jerry Soule. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Linda Ryder, Richard Hensel, Roderick Peoples, Jeff Lupiton, Jamie Barron, Steve Key, Nikki Lindgren, Elaine Robinson, Kurt Nabig, Jennifer Joy, Doug James, Carl Amari, Alex Opener, and Vince Amari. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. And finally, boys and girls, I hope you've all been to the school library. We'll begin book reports on Monday. Till then, have a happy Thanksgiving. Walk, please. No running. And button your coats. It's cold outside. Knock, knock. Oh, hi, Lynn. Did you get your car fixed? Not yet. You're kidding. It was supposed to be ready yesterday. Something about a part they had to order. Well, come on. I'll give you a ride home. It's only a few blocks. Don't be silly. You're right on the way. I have to straighten up first. Straighten what? Your classroom looks better than mine. You know, Helen, they have people who come in after we're gone. They're called janitors. <laughs> I know. You're very kind, really. But I, I have to... I, I have to, um... Have to what? Who's that? Where? In the hall. I don't hear anything. That song. Hello? Is someone there? What, what's the matter? I thought I heard a child. Take a look. All the kids are gone, and we're off for four whole days, okay? Now grab your stuff, and let's get out of here. We can have a drink, if you want. I know a perfect little place. I don't know. I do. Trust me, they have a great happy hour, and you won't believe the men. From the bank, and that new office building downtown... You go ahead. I'm fine. Oh, I get it. Hot date tonight, huh? Nothing like that. I, I have a test to grade. So, you've got till Monday. I know, but maybe some other time. All right, be that way. Get your papers. I'll walk you out. How long has it been now? Hmm? Since you started teaching. Oh, about a year. Two next spring. Then don't you think it's time to loosen up? Do something for yourself once in a while. You know what they say, all work and no play. I go out sometimes. Yeah? When? Well, see. It's just that with all the homework and the extra credit... You spend more time on it than they do. You know something? It sounds funny, but I really don't mind. I mean it, Lynn. Kids grow up so fast, they need all the help they can get. They're not the only ones. But they seem so... vulnerable. Well, maybe they are. But they survive. The bumps and bruises, the sore throats and earaches, it all works out, one way or the other. Look at us. What? We made it, didn't we? In spite of everything, we survived? I guess. <laughs> Don't ask me how. I'm parked across the street. Last chance. Careful, the light's about to change. <laughs> Come on, Helen. We don't have to wait for the crossing guard. We're grown-ups, remember? That man. What man? In the car. Mmm. Sort of distinguished. Don't stare. 
he's staring at you. Have you seen him before? Not around here. I'd remember. Lynn, do you ever see people and they remind you of someone but you're not sure who? Someone you might have met once and... <laughs> All the time. The trouble is, they don't remember me. It's just a feeling I get sometimes. Sorry, I don't know what I'm talking about. I'll open your side. Get in. No, I'll walk. But it's freezing. It's all right, honestly. It'll give me a chance to think. Are you sure? I'm sure. See ya. Hey, you have some place to go on Thanksgiving? What? Oh, yes, yes, of course. Dr. Anderson's. Doctor, huh? You didn't tell me about him. <laughs> He's an old friend of the family. Well, if it doesn't work out, you can always come over to my place. I'm cooking a really big bird. Thanks, Lynn. Call me later. I will. November. A wind stirs. Leaves blow in the streets. And people move a little bit faster just to get home before dark. To this, add a young woman named Helen Foley, age 28, who has a calling. She believes in helping children whenever and wherever she can. Taken all together, these are the improbable ingredients of a basic human emotion called fear. And the recipe is almost complete. All that's needed now is the face of a little girl, as perfect as a cameo and as solemn as a sphinx. Because Helen Foley is about to learn the properties of terror, in a few moments, a most unusual child will take her by the hand and lead her on a journey into the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Nightmare as a Child, starring Bonnie Somerville with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Hello? Is anybody there? It's all right, sweetheart. You don't have to be afraid. I'm not. Well, hi. Hello. And how are you? Fine. You're new here, aren't you? What? Just that I've never seen you before. You haven't? Are you visiting? Is that it? Are you visiting someone in the building? Not exactly. You aren't very talkative, are you? Not much to say? Actually, that's good. That's very good. It's not wise to talk to strangers. I don't. I guess I'm a stranger. But it's all right. I'm kind of an expert on children. Quiet ones and noisy ones. All kinds. I know. You do? But how would you know that? I'll bet you don't know that I teach school. I know all about you. I see. I even know what you're going to do. Do you? You're going inside. Because this is your apartment. You're right. It is. Would you like some hot chocolate, honey? Well... On cold afternoons when I come back from school, that's the first thing I usually make. A nice cup of hot chocolate. But no marshmallows. What? You don't like marshmallows, do you? Why, no. As a matter of fact, I've never liked them. I don't either. All right, then. Absolutely no marshmallows. Here we are. Aren't you coming in? If you want me to. Oh, you really should tell your mother where you are. Why? I wouldn't want her to worry. She won't. Well, if you're sure, go ahead and sit down. The couch is over by the... Oh, I see you found it. I'll just take off my coat before I put the milk on. You don't have to hurry. All right, but I can hardly wait to have that cocoa. It's awfully chilly, don't you think? Mm Mm-hmm. So, tell me, are you in school? In a way. What grade are you in? Different ones. Different? It depends. My, you must be very smart then. What brings you to this floor? I mean, if you don't live in the building. Of course, if you do live here. I came to see someone. Oh? I thought so. A friend of yours? Sort of. What's her name? Maybe I know her. Maybe you do. Really? 
I must say, you've caught my curiosity. Don't let it get too hot. Hmm? The milk. Oh, yes, thank you. It didn't start to boil yet. Good. Here we are. I hope I didn't make it too rich. No, it looks just right. Careful. It might be hot. It's fine. I'm glad it isn't too hot. I don't like hot things very much. Mm, I don't blame you. I don't either. I know. You got burned once. What? A long time ago. With hot tea. How did you know that? I just do. You still have a scar. Right below your elbow. But how could you... When you were a little girl, a pot of tea fell off the stove. You were playing in the kitchen. That's how you got burned. Is it? Don't you remember? Why, no, I, I didn't remember. Until just now, when, when you said it. My arm, yes. My arm. How could you forget that? There are a lot of things I've forgotten. What kind of things? Things that took place when I was... A certain age. It seems like a different life now. Does it? Something else must have happened to me then, a long time ago. I'm not sure exactly what it was. But there are some things that I'm, I'm rather vague about. I know that too. How in the world? I know all about you, remember? Yes. Yes, I do remember you're saying that. What's the matter? Nothing, I just... I think I've had enough cocoa for now. Is that why you're going to the window? To open it? Because you're hot? I'm not going to open the window. That's ridiculous. It's too cold outside to open the window. In fact, I hear there's a storm coming tonight. There is. You know that too, I suppose. Yes. What else do you know? Oh, um, about people. Which people? The ones you see when you're walking. When I'm walking? They look familiar to you sometimes. Now, why ever would you say that? When you pass them on the street, or see them in a bank, or they walk by you, they look like somebody you used to know, don't they? Well, w once in a while. But when you try to remember where you saw them, you can't, no matter how hard you try. I wouldn't say it's quite like that. Yes, it is. It happens lots of times, like today. Today? Did somebody go by you today who looked familiar? Why, why no. Really? It's not very polite to contradict people. I told you, I, I didn't... Didn't what? Nothing. You just remembered, didn't you? There was someone. That's right. Outside the school, you were crossing the street. There was a man in a car. A man in a car, yes. Stopped for a light. I looked at him through the windshield as I walked past, and then he drove on, but I wondered... You recognized him? No. No, I didn't recognize him. He just looked so... So familiar to you? Yes. He made you frightened, didn't he? I really don't know what business it is of yours. But he did. It's okay. He makes me feel that way, too. You know him? I don't know his name. He looks familiar, though. Like somebody I saw once. In a dream. And I know he frightens me. Just like he frightens you. That's ridiculous. Is it? Who are you? I told you. No, you didn't. Where do you live? Around here. What's your name? Don't look away from me. Do you have a name? Marky. That's not my real name, but that's what people call me. I said it's Marky. Did you hear me? Yes. Yes, I heard you. Marky. That's a... that's a pretty name. It's my nickname. Is that all you've got to say? I think it's a very cute name. What more do you want me to say? I thought it might remind you of something. Well, it doesn't. Feeling warm again? No, I'm not. Thank you. Then why do you have sweat on your forehead? What? Oh. You're right. It, it does seem a little warm in here now. I don't think so. I think it's very comfortable. No, it's warm. Strange, I haven't turned the heater on yet. What's that? I didn't hear anything. I did. Oh, that was the front door of the building down below. What floor is he going to? How would I know? He's coming here. 
to the fifth floor. Well, we're not the only people on this floor. There are four other apartments. I know, but he's coming to this one. Is he? I have to go. Honey, there's nothing to be afraid of, I promise. There is. Do you have a back door? Yes, but... I'm going now. Wait, please. Goodbye. I'll come back later. <gasps> Who is it? Miss Foley. Uh, Miss Helen Foley? Miss Foley, do I have the right apartment? Who is it, please? It's Peter Selden, Miss Foley. I don't know whether you remember me, but I, uh, I knew your mother very well. Who? Ah. Oh. That's oh, better. Mr... Well, do you remember me now? Why... Why, you do look familiar. Ah, that's a start. Didn't I see you? <laughs> I thought you looked at me a little oddly. Yes, yes, that's right. In front of the school, I was stopped for a red light. So you were. Uh, do you mind if I come in for a moment? Why, no. Please do. Thank you. Won't you sit down, Mr... Uh, Selden. A friend of my mother's, you say? I'm not sure I... It's been a lot of years, Miss Foley. Quite a few, indeed. Uh, 18, or 19, at the very least. That long? Then I must have been... Got you stumped, huh? <laughs> well, it's no wonder. Yes, you were just a child then. You couldn't have been more than 10 or 11. Uh, but I remember you. See, I used to work for your mother. Peter Selden, her financial consultant. Any bells yet? I do seem to recall the name. I'd heard that you... Well, after the tragedy, you were ill for a time. Isn't that right? Yes. Quite some time. What were you able to recall? Pardon? You said you seemed to recall... Um, not sure. It was also terrible. In that time of, of recuperation, afterwards... No, 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 I, I shouldn't bring this up. No, it's all right. Well, in all those weeks and months, were you able to recall what it was that... <clears throat> what I mean is, Miss Foley, you drew a blank after that evening. I wondered if it ever came back to you. Any of the details uh, to help with the investigation. That evening? The evening of the tragedy, when your your poor mother was killed. I don't know that I... No, it, it, it must be very painful to even think of it. I, I, I should apologize. No, it, it comes back to me in pieces sometimes. Only vague, disjointed things, that's all. I suffered from shocks. Hmm. Trauma, the doctors called it. And then it, it, it took me a while. I, I was in therapy for a long time. After I got better, I, I moved to Chicago. I lived with an aunt there. Yeah, so I'd heard. I've only been back here for a year or so. I teach elementary school. Yes, I'd heard that, too. You'll forgive my interest, but I remembered you so well. I always wondered what became of you. Then I was passing through town on business, and, well, someone pointed you out to me, and I... I just felt I had to stop and say hello. I'm glad you did, truly. Your mother was a very special woman. Yes, she was. You say you worked for her. I still can't quite... I worked for her almost a year. I handled some of her investments at the time. Yes, there was someone. Selden, you say? That's right. But enough of the past. It's wonderful to know that you've grown up the way you have. I, I don't know how wonderful it is. And now you've become a special woman, too, in your own right. Very, very special. As anyone can see. Oh, I should have known. It couldn't have been any other way. <laughs> Please, Mr. Selden. There's nothing in the least special about me. I live alone. I go to work in the mornings, come home. Nothing at all out of the ordinary, believe me. Oh, on the contrary. You know, I was always quite fond of you. Such a beautiful little girl. Long, golden hair. All children are beautiful at that age. Oh, not to such a degree. Then I'm afraid your memory may be playing tricks on you. No, no, I remember it all perfectly. I lived in the same apartment complex. I heard you screaming that night. I was the first one to find her. Miserable. Tragic thing to be attacked like that for no reason. They, uh, they never found the person who did it, did they? No, no, I don't think they did. Though I can't be sure. I'm not sure about anything that went on then. 
It just sort of left my mind, all of it. Oh, that's probably a blessing. At least for you. All I remember is a kind of vague, nightmarish feeling. Waking up in bed, hearing my mother scream, seeing this... this person. You, uh, you saw his face? I don't know. I, I really don't. If I did, it's one of the many things I've forgotten, or at least pushed out of my mind. Pity for the police. There's no statute of limitations on murder, you know. The police did all they could under the circumstances. So tell me, Mr. Selden, are you here for a while? No, 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 I'm just passing through. So you said, I forgot. Well, I'm delighted you stopped. The pleasure is mine. Excuse me for a second, would you? Oh, certainly. Hello? Hello. Sorry to bother you. Dr. Anderson, how are you? Very well. And you, my dear? Oh, I'm fine. Just a little cold in the apartment is all. They say there's a storm coming. I don't mean to intrude, but I wanted to remind you about tomorrow night. Tomorrow? Thanksgiving dinner. Come as early as you like. And please don't bring a thing. We have more than enough food. You know, I really should be going. No, please. I'll be right with you. You have a visitor? That's all right. A friend of my mother's. And uh, who might that be? Someone who worked with her. Hmm. How do you feel about that? Any anxiety? No, I think I remember him. You do? You've never mentioned him before? It's beginning to come back. He worked with her on some things. We'll talk about this tomorrow. For now, I want you to make note of any associations that come to mind. If you're troubled by any new recollections, call me at once. I'm always available, my child. Thank you, Doctor. I will. I promise. Yeah, I've kept you too long. I'll be going now. I'm sorry. Wouldn't you care for a coffee first or... or... A cup of cocoa? Well, it looks like you already poured one for yourself. I interrupted you. And now, it's gone cold. This cup? Why, it's not mine. I put mine in the sink. It's... Something the matter, Miss Foley? That's odd. What is? She'd almost finished her cocoa, or at least I thought she had, but here it sits. Untouched. That is odd. But she's a rather odd little thing herself. You're referring to... The little girl who was in here. Just before you came. Strangest little thing. So solemn. So... so wise, you might say. That's the only way I can describe her. Well, I'll say goodbye now. I must ask her how she does that. <laughs> it does what? Her trick. Sitting there sipping cocoa and leaving a full cup. <laughs> yes, that sounds like a regular magician. Little Marky, I mean. Marky? That's her nickname. She wouldn't tell me her real name. Marky, that's what she calls herself. You don't say. Don't you care for the name, Mr. Selden? Oh, in fact, I like it very much. That was your nickname, Miss Foley, when you were a little girl. They called you Marky. 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 Something wrong? What? Oh, nothing's wrong, except that it's quite a coincidence. This little thing camping on my doorstep having the same name as I did. <laughs> I, I suppose it is. Now that's odd, too. I'm sorry, what is? The way things are coming back. Oh? You're right. I was called Marky. I haven't thought about it in years. But that is what people called me, isn't it? I'm sure that given time, you'll remember a lot more. Is, uh, is that what the doctor said? Dr. Anderson? Yes, that the memories would come back gradually? He doesn't know. None of them do. You're looking a bit pale. Here, perhaps you should sit down. No, I'm all right. I was just listening. Full of talents, our little Marky. Well, how do you mean? Her singing, for one. Oh, she sang for you. She's singing now. I don't hear anything. Has she stopped? I mean that. Listen. Uh, to what? Her singing. Can't you hear the singing? No. I guess... I, I guess you have better ears than I do. She stopped now. Oh, there's something else. It almost slipped my mind. I'm really surprised you couldn't hear her. It was very plain. What's that? I thought you might like to have this. It's a snapshot. Yeah, see? But how... Look at those golden curls. The eyes... She looks so much like her mother. Wouldn't you agree? Where did you get this? Your mother gave it to me a long time ago. 
so very much like your mother now. Why, when you, when you opened the door and I got a good look at you, I, I was... I don't understand. What, Miss Foley? I'm sorry, what don't you understand? This. It's a picture of the little girl, the one who came here today. A picture of Marky. Don't laugh at me, I'm telling you. I'll do something about it. I will. Get out. You... Mommy? Help me, please. Help me. Silence. Mommy. Mommy. Marky? What are you doing sitting out there? Playing with my doll. Did that man leave yet? He left some time ago. I must have fallen asleep on the couch. Marky, it's very late. Is it? Past your bedtime. Don't you think you should go home now? Your mother will be terribly worried. No, she won't. She won't be worried at all. Yes, she will. I don't have a mother. Not anymore. You don't have a... Do you remember now? About Marky? Do you, Helen? I think I'm beginning to. And the time you burned your arm with the hot water from the teapot? Yes. Yes, that too. You got a nasty burn. What are you doing? Showing you my arm. Here's the scar. Just below the elbow. Let me see that. The same as on your arm. Who are you? What's your real name? You better let go. You're hurting me. I'll let go, but first I want to know who you are. I want to know where you're from and what your true name is. Tell me. Do you understand? Tell me. You don't know? You don't have any idea? And you were doing so well, Helen. You were starting to remember things. What things? Remember what things? What's that? Where? On the coffee table. I wanted to ask you about this picture. Mr. Selden left it. Is it familiar? He said that's supposed to be me. That's supposed to be me when I was a little girl, about your age. But it isn't. It isn't me at all. It's you, Marky. And that's impossible, too. How could it be? You and that's still don't understand, do you? Understand what? And that's imp Dan, That I'm you, Helen. And what? Now, and that's Dan, Dan, do you? I'm you. What? Now, and that's a talk is me. I'm you. I'm you. What? Now, and that's a I'm you when you were you. I'm old you. What? Now, and that's a Marky when you were you. I'm lived with your mother in now, the other apartment. You were I were asleep in the bed that night. It was so cold. And the man came to visit. And your mother let him in. I don't know what you're talking about. I think you do. He was arguing with mother downstairs, and she tried to run away. And she ran upstairs to her room. And the man came after her and caught her. And he choked her. Remember, Helen? Yes. He choked her, and then... Then he picked up something heavy, and he hit her on the head, and she fell. And then... Then you screamed. And the man looked down at you. He looked right at you. And you screamed, Helen. You screamed so loud. The storm. It was raining that night, too. The lights, they've gone off. Marky? Stay close to me. I'll light a candle. I have one somewhere. Marky? Marky, where are you? Be careful. Who's there? Uh, take it easy, Helen. It's only me. Lynn! Oh, God, I thought... What, thought what? I don't know. I fell asleep on the couch, and I must have been dreaming an awful dream. I, I shouldn't have walked in like that, but I heard your voice, and the door was open. You okay? Oh, come in, please. I got to thinking about you, over here, alone. I'll bet you haven't eaten. Actually, no, but... So I thought, I'll stop by, and if you're hungry, we'll order something to go. You must be soaked. I got here just in time. Now the power's gone out. It looks like the whole block. I was looking for a candle. Now where are those matches? I've got some. Here. Great, thanks. Who were you talking to? Oh, that was Marky. Nice name. Where have you got him hidden? <laughs> it's a little girl. I want you to meet her. Maybe you can tell me if what she says is... Marky, honey, you can come out now. I don't see anybody. She was here, I swear. It's raining really hard, but we can still order Chinese. They deliver. Yes. 
Yes, I'd like that. Oh, something hot. Sweet and sour, whatever. What's the number? I think it's... Oh, no. What? There's no dial tone. The phone lines must be down. I'll make us some coffee. How far is the restaurant? Just at the corner. Then I'll go get some stuff. No, I couldn't let you do that. Don't worry about it. You have an umbrella, don't you? Yes, but... Plus, I've got my car. No problem. Honest. I'll get soup and everything. The works. Then I'm paying. Just let me get my purse. You're too nice, Lynn. <laughs> Tell that to my last date. Here. That should be enough. I'll get the coffee going. Be back in a flash. I'll get an extra fortune cookie in case your little friend shows up. Where did you say the umbrella... Behind the door. Got it. Don't open it indoors. It's bad luck. <laughs> if you say so. Is she your friend? Marky! Her name's Lynn, isn't it? Where were you? In the other room? She's nice. Not like that man. Mr. Selden? You're wrong about him, Marky. He's very nice. He just stopped by to say hello. He's an old friend. No, he's not. You don't even remember him. But you've seen him before. I know I have. Is it coming back yet? Is what coming back? The last time you saw him, before today. I don't know what you're talking about. Now sit down, and I'll make you some fresh hot chocolate. Hear that? Someone's coming. She must have forgotten something. Lynn, is that... Hello again, Miss Foley. Mr. Selden? What are you... We didn't quite finish our conversation. Where's Lynn? Oh, I wouldn't worry about her. Why do you say that? That's just it, Miss Foley. There are things you don't understand. See, we need to talk. In private. I want to bring you up to date. You've been living in ignorance too long. My friend's coming right back. Any minute now. I seriously doubt it. At the moment, she's resting quietly in her car outside. I'm sure no one will notice her until tomorrow morning, the earliest. What are you saying? I want to impart some knowledge, Miss Foley. Obviously, it's begun to come back to you in bits and pieces, as you say. I should be the first, don't you think? It's only appropriate, you see, because I was the man in your mother's condo that night. The one who followed her up the stairs to her room. The one you saw, however briefly. Get out or I'll scream. Oh, I'm afraid that wouldn't do any good. There are people in the other apartments. No, no, they're all empty. It's Thanksgiving week. Or have you forgotten that too? They're away visiting their families. You're alone on this floor. Eh, quite alone. Stay away from me. Oh, I plan to. I'll be long gone and no one will know I was here. Even your doctor friend doesn't know my name. Just as soon as I tell you about how I killed your mother. But why? Why? Well, there was some trouble with the books. I pleaded with her to cover for me, but your mother, rest her soul, was a particularly rigid, straight-laced woman, and she was about to inform on me. When she went upstairs to the bedroom, I had to follow her. <sighs> Only you had stayed in your room. I would have gone after you next, but your screams brought people there, and I had to get out in a hurry. It wasn't until later that I learned you had no recollection of who you saw. You blacked out the entire incident. Don't worry about the candle. I can see you in the lightning. There you are. Let me go! You haven't been neglected all these years, Helen. I've kept tabs on you. Chicago, college, then here. Yeah, I knew there'd come a day when the pieces would finally fit together. And you'd start to remember. That's why I came back. I had to come back. To take care of unfinished business. You're the only person who knows exactly how your mother died. What are you going to do? Oh, simple fall, I should think. It was dark, you tripped on the stairs. Only that much more believable with the power outage. Come on. Come with me, Helen. We're going out onto the landing. No, 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 no. Don't look down. It'll be easier then. No! No! Come. Here. Go! Oh. oh, look at the kick you have there. Oh, don't bother to run. There's only one way down. Help me! Somebody please help me! Come along, Helen. You know I'll find you, even in a darkened hallway. You keep away from her. Well... 
Wow. Who do we have here? Don't you know? That voice. I'll light the candle so you can see. You cursed my bad. Marky, look out! The stairs! Yes, the stairs. One more step, and up we go. Watch out, mister. Wherever I go, you're going with me. You... No! Marky! Marky! Hey, Fran, want to get a picture of the body? Sure thing, Lieutenant. How is she, Doc? Gonna be all right? I have given her a sedative. She's a very fortunate woman. If she were any less fortunate, we'd have a homicide victim on our hands. At least that's the way she tells it. So where's the other one? Arthur? Uh, she keeps talking about some kids as a little girl fell downstairs with him. There is no other body. Only the man. Name of Selden, according to his ID. The child she speaks of. That is her. What? A part of her buried deep inside. A memory that finally had to come out. It took the form of herself as a child. <laughs> Too weird for me, Doc. Well, the human imagination itself is weird. But sometimes in a crisis, it could mean the difference between life and death. Here's her other friend, Lieutenant. Just like she said, found her in a car half a block down. Somebody slugged her on the head and dumped her inside. Helen? Where's Helen? Oh, she's doing okay. Just a couple of bruises. Take it easy, young lady. I want to see her. There's plenty of time for that. You're both going to County General to get checked out. Here's the ambulance now, sir. Lynn, is that you? Here. I'm here. to work. I was sick for a while, but now I'm better. I have a whole classroom full of kids about your age. They're waiting for me. Oh, are you a teacher? Yes, I am. You know something? What? You have a lovely smile. I do? It's wonderful, truly. Do me a favor. Don't ever lose it. My dolly has a smile, too. See? Yes, you both have wonderful smiles. If you're still here later, I'll make us a nice cup of hot chocolate. Would you like that? Oh, yeah. Good. I'll see you then. Take care of yourself. Take good care. Miss Helen Foley, who lived for a time in darkness and woke up from a nightmare, who found a spot on the tapestry of her life and rubbed it clean then stepped back and got a good look at what she had left behind in the Twilight Zone. Nightmare as a Child, starring Bonnie Somerville, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Hetchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling. Heard in the cast were Dana Bokor, Roger Mueller, Elizabeth Lido, David Darlow, Roderick Peoples, Doug James, Jeff Lupatin, Linda Ryder, Meg Falcon, and Amanda Amari. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group and Westwood One. 
Sound design and custom Foley effects for the Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Point oh one niner, steady and holding. Fuel consumption, normal. On course X six, hold coordinates. Oxygen supply, check. How does she look? Beautiful, General. Just beautiful. Flight path? Right on the button, sir. No corrections? Hardly any. A couple of degrees starboard pitch right after takeoff. And the crew? A okay, sir. A little cramped on the ship, but that's about it. Good. The White House will be pleased. About a test flight? The president's a big fan of the X-6. He pushed it through Congress. Hey, then maybe I'll have a job next year. You will, Billings. You will. Count on it. This is the first step. She makes it back in one piece, and it's all systems go. General, I've got the telemetry report. Send it over to data control. Right away, sir. You boys have done well. So far, so good. Bring her in smooth, and you can take tomorrow off. Oh, you got it, General. Couple more hours and she's headed back home. Patch me through to the ship, will you? I'd like to thank the crew personally. No problem. Set frequency. Roger that. X6. Calling the X6. Do you read? Try again. X6. Do you read? This is flight control. X6. Calling the X6. It must be some electrostatic interference. Keep trying. Yes, sir. I want to thank those boys for a job well done and tell them we'll be waiting with bells on. Maybe not a ticker tape parade this time, but that'll come. Sir? Yes? They seem to be... Seem to be what? What's the problem? Well, I... I don't know. Out with it, man. Something wrong? It's just that I can't find them on the radar screen. Let me see. What does that mean? It means... Well, sir, it means... They seem to have disappeared. What? Could be a tower malfunction. I'll switch the backup. Nope. Main system's working. Clear skies. No commercial flights in our airspace. There's nothing. Absolutely nothing. Give me missile tracking. This is General Carstairs at flight control. Yes. Do your instruments show a crash? Not just in the desert. Anywhere in North America. Are you sure? Then do this. If you register an impact, call me on the secure line. No, I don't expect one. Just a routine check. Yes, I'm positive. We have nothing here. Not a thing. What's going on? It's not on the screen. It has to be somewhere. It's still sweeping, sir. Where did it go? Sir? If you had the X-6 on the screen and you spoke to the men on board... Less than five minutes ago. Then where are they? A spacecraft doesn't just disappear, vanish into thin air, does it? Well, does it? No, sir. No, sir. Then in heaven's name, where is it? As you may have gathered, the name of the ship in question is the X-6. Her type, a new experimental craft on a high-altitude test above the Earth's atmosphere. Purpose? To gather data for the construction of the world's first space station. Recent history? Unknown. At least to those who weren't on board. But in short order, we're going to meet the crew and hear the story from their point of view, and a very unusual story it is, of a flight that departed from its course long enough to pass through the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, And When the Sky Was Opened, starring Barry Bostwick with Stacey Keach as your narrator. Well, Doc? Uh, Just a minute, Colonel. What's the verdict? Pulse is fine. On the slow side, in fact. 
Correct me if I'm wrong. We went through this yesterday, didn't we? You know the Air Force, check and double check. They've got a big investment in the X-6. So, there's a little glitch. Probably an O-ring. A little glitch? The hydraulics froze and the soft landing chute didn't deploy. You are lucky to be alive. That's what all the flight training was for. Relax your arm. Doctor. Hold still, please. I want to ask you something. Don't move your arm. 115 over 80. Not bad. Told you, Doc. I could have phoned it in. All right. That's all for now. Get yourself some breakfast downstairs. Hey. Go easy on the cholesterol, okay? How's the colonel? Who? Jack Harrington. You're the only colonel I've seen this morning. <laughs> I get it. You call me in, but he gets to stay home and sleep it off. Pretty nice duty. Harrington. Where have I heard that name? You have a heck of a sense of humor. Did you have a question? It can wait. I want to, um, check with someone first. Well, look, try not to worry about anything. You may be a little disoriented for a day or two. Need any, uh, medication while you're here? Sleeping pill? Muscle relaxant? Me? Never felt better in my life. If you experience any headaches, neck pains, that sort of thing, give me a call. Now forget about me. Garch's the one with the busted leg. He's still on the third floor. Yeah, he'll be in a cast for a while. He's healing fine, though. Third floor. Room 14, wasn't it? Well, you should know. Gonna stop by? I was thinking about it. Go ahead. <laughs> Give him a hard time, just not too hard. Tell him, uh, tell him I'll be by on my rounds. Oh, and congratulations, Colonel Forbes. To both of you. What? Haven't you seen the paper? You're heroes. <laughs> we flew the course. Nothing special. Well, the force is proud of you just the same. The nation is. Just doing our job. Here. Take this with you, if you like. I've um, already seen it. Then give one to Major Gart. They've got copies all over the base. But they're going fast. Um... Colonel, come here. Can I ask you something? If it's not classified? Yes. What happened up there? How do you mean? When they lost you on radar. If I could tell you, Doc, I would. You and the General and everyone else. All I know is we must have lost pressure because we blacked out. For quite a few hours. The next thing I knew, we were down and the chopper was airlifting us out of there. That's it. End of story. But you made it. That's what counts. Yes. Yes. I guess it is. I want her completely broken down, piece by piece. Whatever it was, we've got to find it. Doing the best we can, sir. How's the investigation coming? Well, so far, everything checks out. Meaning... The only damage evident is from the touchdown. She came in on her belly at something close to 300 miles an hour. Must have buckled part of the landing gear. Wasn't fully extended. That's why the wing looks the way it does? She plowed through a sand dune just before she stopped. If you want my opinion, sir. By all means. I don't think you're going to find anything wrong. Well, that may or may not be. But for now, we've got a mystery on our hands. We need answers. Well, it would be my suggestion. Yes? That if you want to unravel this mystery, you better check the crew, not the aircraft. The crew can't tell us a thing. How's that? We had them on radar for the first couple of hours. Everything went strictly by the book. Then they disappeared for 24 hours. Well, until they crashed down in the Mojave Desert. They must have lost consciousness because they don't know anything. The only way we're going to get answers is to dismantle the aircraft. Unless... One of the crew members gets his memory back and fills in the blanks. And so far, they're not talking. I'll be that as it may. I want to see every nut, bolt, and screw laid out on the hangar floor in order. Every wire, every piece of insulation. If there's anything wrong with this baby, anything at all, we're going to find it. Yes, sir. I'm the double, sir. Dr. Bridges to the infirmary. Dr. Bridges. 
Oh, hello, Colonel. I didn't see you. That's all right, nurse. No harm done. How are you feeling, sir? Fine, thank you. How's Major Guard? Coming along nicely. You can go on in if you like. He'll be glad to see you. Thanks. I will. Is that one of the pilots? The ones who crashed? Yes. Colonel Forbes. He's cute. He is. But did you see his eyes? Blue, I think. No, that's not what I mean. I mean, th they've got a kind of far look. Like his body's here, but I don't know, his mind's somewhere else. I don't know where. I just hope he's okay. Come in. There he is. And there you are. The prodigal colonel. Not disturbing you, am I? Nothing could disturb me in here. More like a prison ward. No playboys, no hot fudge Sundays. I was on my way out. Can't stay away, huh? Doc wanted to see me. Nothing serious, I hope. Me? No, no, just routine. I'd offer you a drink, a shot of straight orange juice. How's that leg? Can't feel a thing, which is good. One more thermometer and I'm gonna absent myself from this establishment without official leave. Pull a chair over here by the bed. Take a load off, Colonel. Sure. Now, go ahead, tell me. What's it like in the outside world? Great, Bill, just great. I can't wait to get out of here. Talk to any of the guys? Yes. What about the ship? Did you look her over? It's under wraps. They've got everybody but the president's cabinet checking it out. Bill, did you see the paper? Sure. We made the front page. Only page three today. Take a look. Ooh, steady, Colonel. You go off on a toot last night? Why? Your hands, they're shaking. They don't look so good. Thanks. A little hungover, huh? Ah, no big deal. So what's it say? Bill, I, I wanted to talk to you about that. They spell our names right? First, I've got to uh, get oriented. If you don't mind, I'd, I'd like you to answer some questions. Shoot. When did I leave here? Huh? And when did I get discharged from the hospital? Yesterday morning? Don't you know? I don't know anything anymore. Easy, Colonel. All I know is... All I know is I need to verify a couple of things. Now, that shouldn't be very complicated. Around 9.30 yesterday morning, I walked out of here, didn't I? About that time, I guess. And who did I walk out with? Are you kidding? How am I supposed to know who you walked out with? Some nurse you picked up in the hall, probably. What's the matter? Can't remember a name? I mean, when I left the room, this room, who was with me? Nobody. That's just it. You say nobody. I'm pretty sure I was awake, yes. If you remember it differently, I... What's today's paper say? Go ahead, tell me. What's it say? Two astronauts crash in Mojave Desert. Over a picture of you and me before the flight. What else? And in effect, it says that two intrepid voyagers into the unknown return from the unknown in one slightly dented spacecraft. Sounds about right. What about the picture? I've seen better. What's in the picture? Look, if this is a literacy test, I can assure you that even though I'm not a West Point graduate, I can read and write, count up to ten. <laughs> Gart, don't get wise with me now. What's it say under the picture? Read it. Colonel Clegg Forbes and Major William Gart just before their historic flight that ended in a mysterious crash. That's what you remember? I don't... <sighs> You and me, the X-6 taking off, about two hours up, we black out, and 24 hours later, we come to in a crashed aircraft in the desert. We don't know where we've been or what's happened. Right so far? You remember something different? Bill, there were three of us in that craft. There was you, me, and another colonel named Harrington. What? Jack Harrington. Don't tell me you've never heard the name. He was 36 years old. He was my best friend. I'd known him for 15 years, and you'd known him for five. That ship took a crew of three, and we were the three. Now, I want you to listen very closely, because, Bill, I swear, I can prove it to you. I've got to, or I'll lose my mind. What are you talking about, a third crewman? They brought three of us back to the hospital when they found us in the desert. You, me, and Harrington. 
Jack and I were just scratched up. You got the busted leg. Yesterday morning, they discharged Harrington and me. There was three beds in this room. Now, wait a minute. We said goodbye and promised we'd come back today to visit you. Then Harrington and I left to do the town. Now, you tell me none of that sounds familiar? Clegg, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't know anyone named Harrington. Whoever he is, he wasn't on the crew with us. The X-6 carried two men, you and me. Nobody named Harrington. Nobody else at all. When you walked out of here yesterday morning, you walked out by yourself. There were never three beds in this room. Only two, yours and mine. Something's happened to you. I mean it, Clegg. This is an after-effect of the crash. It has to be. I think you'd better tell the doctor on some tests. Look, Bill. Let me... Let me describe to you what I remember. Go on. I'm listening. I'll give you a chronological breakdown of everything that happened as of yesterday morning. First of all, I saw the paper. The one you just showed me? No, not that one. Yesterday's edition. I saw it on the stands downtown, only it said that three men came back. There was a picture of you, me, and Harrington on the front page, taken just before we took off. That's impossible. I know, it must be impossible. You say there were two of us. Everyone else says there were two of us. And now, that's what it says in today's paper. Well then, that should tell you something, shouldn't it? A reality check. But I know there were three of us in that aircraft. They picked three of us up in the desert and airlifted us in a chopper, and three of us were checked over and debriefed. They kept you here because of your leg. And it was Harrington and I who left this room yesterday morning. Then we requisitioned a staff car and got a ride into town together. Bill, you... You said goodbye to us from that bed. And then you said... Harrington, keep an eye on Forbes. He can't hold his liquor. Those were your words. I don't know what you expect me to say. Don't say anything. Just listen. I was standing right at that door, and Harrington went back to your bed and made like he was going to sock you. I swear. I swear to you, Bill. It happened. I know it happened. And Harrington, keep an eye on Forbes, will you? He can't hold his liquor. <laughs> Hey, why you? I'm going to let you have it, you fresh kid. I'm going to fix this punk's wagon. I wish somebody would. I'm going to tell the medics he's one very sick cookie, and they should hold him for observation another seven years. You think that's long enough? Hmm, I don't know. And every Saturday night, Major Gart, the colonel and I will phone you from whatever bar we happen to be in, and if you're nice, we might even let you talk to some women. Let's go already. I hate long goodbyes. <laughs> Go on, both of you. Leave me here to suffer in my loneliness and despair. Take care, Bill. We'll come in tomorrow to see you. Meanwhile, you can all read about yourself. Better memorize this in case you lose it. See? Three space travelers return safely. And nothing about your broken leg. Well, that's the press for you. Get out of here! I'm going to pick one up for my mother so she can frame it. One time, a fortune teller in a carnival in Des Moines said I'd be famous. Eh, it doesn't say anything about you, though. Out! <laughs> and did you pick up a paper on the way out? Why? You said you had proof. I should have kept it. But it wouldn't make any difference now. If you could show me in black and white... Hold on. There's more to the story. When we got to town, Jack and I hit the bars. The first one was the plush monkey on 11th. You know the place, don't you? Yeah, a dive. Beer signs and bar girls. And a big mirror behind the bottles. We walked in trying to keep a low profile, but the blonde spotted us. That's them. No, it's not. It is. Don't stare. <gasps> Give me your hairbrush. Welcome, gents. Take a load off. With pleasure. Say, aren't you the two guys who was up in space? Eh, not that far. Just the ionosphere. I thought so. That and a couple of bucks should get us a beer apiece, right? <laughs> you bet your life. But never mind the two bucks. This is on the house. Why, thank you, my good man. Very kind of you. I don't get many celebrities in here, so go ahead, boys. Drink hearty. You earned it. I don't even mind you cracking up the ship. And I'm a taxpayer. I like your attitude. <laughs> <laughs> 
Got a match? Not since Superman. A light from my friend here. Sure, pal, sure. Anything you want. Evening, ladies. Hi there, Captain. Colonel. Oh, <laughs> sorry. She's new in town. Care to join us? Hold that thought. I'll ask my friend. You do that. We ain't going nowhere. Hey, Jack. Hmm? Something wrong? No. Look at yourself in the mirror there. Not exactly a happy camper. Uh, I was just thinking. About what? Oh, I'll tell you after I taste the beer. To happy landings, whenever and wherever possible. I'll drink to them. Oh, sorry. Something is wrong. That's okay. Ain't the last glass of draft in the house, let me tell you. It just slipped out of my fingers. Don't worry, I'll clean it up. Get you another one right away, Colonel. You're sick, Jack? No. No, I'm not sick. I, I just got this funny feeling. What kind of feeling? I don't know. I never felt anything like it before. Maybe we should go. Don't worry, I said. It was just for a couple of seconds there. It was like a... It was like I didn't belong here. Like if I were to let myself go, I'd... You'd what? Like I'd... Disappear. Here you go. Thanks. Happy landings. You don't like it? I want to call my folks. Good idea. I should call Amy, too. Where's the phone? All the way in the back. You sure you're okay? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, be right with you. I'd like to place a call. Collect, please. To Des Moines, Iowa. The residence of uh, Mr. James Harrington. That's right. Oh, my number? Uh, let's see. Uh, Fletcher 90632. Uh, that's what it says here. My name? Oh, that's uh, Jack Harrington. That's right. Thank you, operator. I'll hold. I'm sorry about the broken glass. My friend's sorry, too. Ah, uh, forget it. I can sweep it up. As soon as I get my mop. Clegg! Yeah? Come here. Will you come here quick? Coming. Please? Does he need some change? I'll see. What's up? I just called home. Called my folks. My mother answered. Yeah? How is she? I don't know. How come? I told her it was me, and she said... She said she didn't have any son named Jack. That's what she said. Can you beat that? I asked to talk to my old man, and when he got on, he kept saying for me to hang up. He didn't want any practical jokers bothering his wife. Said he didn't have any son at all. That's weird. Clegg, what is this? What's going on? A uh, gag, maybe, or... No. No gag. It's part of this feeling, Clegg. The feeling I've got that I shouldn't be here. That none of us should be here. It's as if... It's as if maybe... What? Maybe we shouldn't have come back from that flight. Maybe somebody, something, made a mistake and let us get through when we weren't supposed to. Now stay put. I'm going to get you a good stiff drink to go with that beer. I have to. I told you to stay here. Shot of whiskey, please. Make it a double. Sure. Say, Colonel, you th think you could do me a favor? What? Sign this newspaper? My boy would get a big kick out of it. Wait, where did you get this? From the machine outside. Here, here's a pen. Uh, could you sign it to Richie, right on the picture? But it's wrong. What is this, a joke? You have it printed up? Two spacemen return and crash in Mojave Desert? Huh? That's you, isn't it? Colonel Forbes? The other guy's still in the hospital, right? Which other guy? It says right here, Major William Gart. But there was a third man. See for yourself. He's back there in the... Back where? In the phone booth. It looks empty to me. Nope. Nobody's been in there all day. What? Buy me a beer, honey. I'm awful thirsty. My buddy, the one who was sitting here on the stool next to mine. You just got him another... Hey, where's his beer? Uh, what beer? My buddy's drink. Colonel Harrington, where is it? 
The one you gave him in place of the one he dropped on the floor, right here by the- Nobody dropped nothing on the floor. Y you see any broken glass? I don't. Dry as a bone, too. What are you trying to pull? I, I don't know what you mean, Colonel. Y you came in here alone. <laughs> you don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy, you know that? Crazy, you hear me? If you think a thing like that, you got you gotta be out of your mind. What do you want? Room 8A, here's your pizza. Oh, yeah. How much do I owe you? Uh, let's see, yeah, I got the bill right here. Keep the change. Thanks. Hey, say, aren't you, uh... No. Yes? Ready with your call to Des Moines. Thank you, operator. Hello? Hello? Who is this? Mr. Harrington, this is Clegg Forbes. Who? You remember me, sir? I had Christmas dinner with you and your wife last Christmas. You... you and your wife, and Jack. Jack who? Your son. What is this, another crank call? Because if it is, it's not funny. Who is this, anyway? Uh, perhaps I don't have the right house. Is this James Harrington? I'm James Harrington, but I don't have any son, and I've never heard of you. You live at 43 Elm Street? All my life. Got two daughters, both married. One lives in Sioux City, the other moved to Binghamton, New York last year. I should know whether I got a son or not. And don't call me again! Now what? Look at that face in the mirror. I don't know myself anymore. Uh, operator, I'd like Anderson Air Force Base, please. Commanding officer's residence. That's right. Call me when you get through. You've got some nerve. Amy. Amy, honey, am I glad to see you. Keep your hands to yourself. You, Colonel Clegg Forbes, are a devious, miserable, two-faced, two-timing. Amy, you won't understand this, but I need your help. You send me a telegram that you're getting out of the hospital in the morning and that you'll meet me at the station at 2. Well, I was at the station at 2. Amy, listen to me, please. I was also there at 3, and I was still there at 4. I could have had my pick of several Marines and an elderly gentleman who owns 25,000 shares of AT&T, but there was a missing Air Force officer named Forbes who didn't have the simple courtesy to leave a message or even a number where he could be reached. I can explain. Do you have any idea how many bars I've been to? How many hotel lobbies? D did it ever occur to you to... Amy, please! You look terrible, by the way. All right, Clegg. What kind of trouble are you in? And what are you doing in this motel? Are you hiding out? Oh, I don't even know where to begin. I sent you the wire because I did get discharged from the hospital that morning. Jack and I... The wire. It was in the telegram. What was? I told you that Jack and I were getting out. Wait. I wrote down the message when I sent the telegram. That'll prove it. I wrote it on a piece of paper. Now, where? Wrote what? Here it is. I wrote it right down here. See? It says, Dear Amy, I'm getting out at n nine. No. I was sure of it. I wrote down that Jack and I were getting released from the hospital. Both of us, understand? J Jack and I were... Am I missing something? Who's Jack? Don't you know? I don't know any Jack. Who is he? There were three of us in the ship. Gart, me, and Harrington. Jack Harrington. And I was with him, and he just... disappeared. But you know him, Amy. You know him. You've met him a hundred times. We've eaten dinner together. We've gone to dances together. We've double dated. Clegg, what is happening to you? I don't know. I swear to God, I don't know, but... Yes, yes. Uh, put him on, please. Hello, General. This is Clegg Forbes. Yes, sir. That's right. General, about Jack Harrington. Harrington, sir. 
<laughs> well, you know, Jack, we were in your wing at the field. We were there for your... Harrington, sir. Jack Harrington. We were on the X6 together. Jack Harrington! Stop it! Jack Harrington. Jack Harrington. You need help. If you'll, if you'll tell me who to call, I... No, I know. I know this is a put-on. That's what it is. A big, uh, uh, earth-shaking, highly complicated, practical joke. He's still back at the bar. Of course he is. Uh, Amy, that's where he is. He has to be at the bar. Clegg? Clegg? Locked. Locked? What time is it? It's late, Clegg. There's nobody inside at this hour. Open up. I know you're in there. Come on, Harrington. You gotta be. Don't! Jack, you can come out now. Some joke, and I fell for it. Where are you hiding? The phone booth? That's gotta be it. Where are you, Jack? Please come back, will you? Jack! No. No! No! That's some story. I don't know what I did then. Just... just... ran, I guess. All the way down the street like a crazy man. I left Amy standing there. I don't even know what happened to her after that. And I don't know Jack Harrington. I never heard of him before now. He's an illusion or something. He has to be. He's not an illusion. For some reason, he's been... Ah, he's been yanked out of here, taken away. You're letting this get to you. Didn't you hear what I said? He told me, he told me he had a feeling that maybe somebody or something made a mistake and let us get through when we shouldn't have. And maybe they'd be coming back to get us now. Maybe somebody from up there. Clegg, it doesn't make sense. And now, I've got the feeling, too. I've got this idiotic, oddball feeling. I don't know how to describe it. It's, it's weird, Bill. It's just plain weird. Like, like I don't belong. I don't want it to happen, you hear me? I don't. I don't want it to happen to me, too! Clegg! Clegg! Oh, I gotta stop him. Somebody get him! Somebody! Hey, hey, did you want something? Where is he? Where did he go? Who? Colonel Forbes. Colonel... I saw him run into the hall. When? Just now. I didn't see anyone. He has to be here. He can't just... What are you doing out of bed, Major? You know, you shouldn't be walking yet. If the doctor saw you... Somebody's got to help Colonel Forbes. Somebody's got to help him right away. Grab a hold of my shoulder. Now, come on. I'm talking about Forbes. You know, Colonel Forbes. He was brought in here with me. In here? That's right. In the other bed, next to mine. Look, this is a private room. What? There's no other bed but yours. No. You see? All right, now, lie down. Now, raise your cast. That's it. What do you mean there's... Oh, no. Dear God. What happened to the other bed? Okay, try to rest. I'll call the doctor. Here, would you like to look at the paper? You're a hero. Do you realize that? Spaceman completes journey... Lone Traveler returns to Earth. Lands in Mojave Desert. It's a nice picture of you. Would you like a glass of water? Major William Gart. Just before his historic one-man journey into space. Hey, Doctor. I was sorry to hear about that crash. 
Uh, what did they call it? The X6? Yeah. Well, we do the best we can when they come back. Sometimes it's out of our hands. Mm -hmm. At least it was an unmanned flight. Well, that's the one consolation, I suppose. Anyway, I wanted to check the ward. How are we fixed for beds? I've got some men in the infirmary. Um, let's see. Two open rooms at the moment, Doctor. Great. Oh, and number 14's empty at the end of the hall. Mm. It can take up to three if we move some beds in. Well, that should do. Order some beds up from QM, will you, nurse? Yes, sir. Right away. Once upon a time, there was a man named Harrington, a man named Forbes, and a man named Gart. All were officers in the United States Air Force, trained for experimental flights into the upper atmosphere. They used to exist, but don't any longer. Someone or something took them somewhere. At least, they're no longer a part of the memory of man. As to the aircraft, the X-6, it's still supposed to be housed in a hangar on the base, or it will be one day. For the record, it hasn't been built yet. It's still on the drawing boards, but be careful. Don't let anyone hear you arguing about the reverse, or they might question your sanity. If you have any questions about the aircraft or the men who flew her, be sure to speak softly and only in the twilight zone. And When the Sky Was Open, starring Barry Bostwick with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Rod Serling, based on a story by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Mike Starr, Jeff Lupiton, Meg Falcon, Joby Cerny, Christian Stolte, Kurt Nabig, Richard Hensel, Doug James, Vince Amari, Justin Kaufman, Elizabeth Lido, Carl Amari, Jennifer Joy, and Tracy Hernandez. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etchison, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Come on, Mac. Let's go. Out in the backyard. You got plenty of water, big guy. What's the matter? Something out there? Hey, maybe it's a squirrel. Nothing you can't handle. <laughs> See you in the morning, big guy. promise. Daddy and I are in the next room. Hey, sweetie. Ready for bed? Daddy, I want Mac. He's outside where he belongs. But I need him. No, you don't. This is where you belong, in your room. But I... You're a big girl, aren't you? Yes. A very big girl. And big girls have their own rooms. 
In the morning, I'll make your favorite breakfast. Waffles? Waffles for all three of us. But it's scary in here. Tina, honey, stop it. Will you leave the door open? Sure, sweetie. Plus, you have your nightlight. Come on, Ruth. But, Mommy... If anything frightens you, call for me. I'll come right away. Nothing's going to frighten her. The house is locked up tight as a drum. But what if the bad man comes? Oh, Tina, really? Hey, then Mac will get him. He's a good dog, isn't he? Yes. Go to sleep now. Can I have a drink of water? Of course. Night-night, sweetheart. Night. Don't let the bed bugs bite. She's been scared of her own shadow lately. Yeah, separation anxiety. New room and all. Did you hear what she said? The bad man. Where did she get that? Maybe she's on to something. What's that supposed to mean? Like Mac. He hears things, doesn't he? He's a dog, Chris. Well, kids hear things. See them, too. Oh, I remember when I was little, my sister used to tell me about the Nighthawk. The what? That's a good question. I never did find out. But she'd say, the Nighthawk's gonna get you. Oh. Kept me on my toes. What a mean sister. Mm, maybe she was just looking out for me. I thought I saw all sorts of things. Face in the window, something in the yard. You would. Just the same, maybe there are things we can't see. Just kids and animals. That's enough, Chris. Like when Mac hears a squirrel or smells another dog down the street, but we can't because we don't have the senses. Next, you're going to tell me that there is a bad man. I didn't say that. Now I won't sleep a wink. That's not what I mean. Oh, what do you mean? Nothing. I don't know what I'm talking about. No, you don't. Come to bed. Sorry. You should have been a science fiction writer. Visible world. Nice. Makes me feel all safe and secure. I said I'm sorry. Well, this is the real world. Remember that. I'm turning out the light. Mommy? Uh, now what? Oh, I forgot to get her a drink of water. If you get up every time, she'll never go to sleep. But I promised. One time. That's it. Agreed? Agreed. Mommy? Daddy? The voice of one frightened little girl. Name, Bettina Miller. Tina for short. Description, six years of age, average height and build. Blonde, quite pretty. Last seen being tucked into bed by her mother only a few minutes ago. Last heard, Aye, there's the rub, as Hamlet puts it, for she can still be heard quite clearly, despite the curious fact that very soon she won't be seen at all, not by her father or mother or anybody else. Present location? In the next bedroom, or so it seems. At this moment, it might be more accurate to say that she's just become a resident of an unseen world called the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Little Girl Lost, starring Stephen Tobolowski with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Chris? <sighs> Not again. But she sounds so scared. Yeah, yeah. Mommy? Listen to her. I'm going. Where are my slippers? I don't know what's wrong now. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll talk to her one last time. <sighs> All right, sweetie, daddy's coming. Quiet, Mac! <sighs> what's the matter now, Tina? T. Where are you? Against the wall? Here I am. Take my hand. Tina, where'd you go? 
<laughs> Did you fall off? I'll lean down it. Not against the wall, huh? Did you roll under the bed? Take it easy, I'm here. <laughs> Tina! <laughs> Where are you? <laughs> Over here. Come on out, baby. You must have crawled under the bed. Now reach out. Reach out for my hand. What happened to you? Daddy. Where in the... Hold on. I'll get the light switch. Daddy, help me. I'm trying, baby, but I don't see... Chris, what is it? I don't know. What's the matter? She's not here. What do you mean, she's not? I turned on the light. I can't... Tina? Mommy's here. See for yourself. This is ridiculous. Tina? Tina! I already looked under the bed. All the way to the wall. It's clear. There's nothing. Mommy, pick me up. I'm trying, baby. Chris? Where is she? I don't know. But I can hear her right in front of me. I can't, too. It doesn't make sense. I'm looking under the bed. The, the floor's clear. It's absolutely empty. There's, I don't see anything. Honey, I don't know what to tell you. What are we going to do? Quiet, Mac! Listen, what's happening to her? Where is she? I'm tired, Mommy. Going to sleep now. Tina? Tina? Bill. Yeah. Bill, it's Chris. Oh, hi. What time is it? Can you come over? When? Now? I'm sorry, but it's an emergency. What's the matter? It's Tina. What happened? That's just it. I don't know. You don't... She's disappeared. From the house? You mean she wandered off? No, no. Somebody took her? She hasn't been kidnapped. Well, then what? I can't explain. She's here. Is she injured? I don't think so, but... So she's okay? I don't know. Let me get this straight. She's there, and she's not hurt, and she's... She's here, but she's not here. I don't follow. Bill, for God's sake, get over here. I don't know who else to call. And hurry. She's still asleep. That's what it sounds like. Ruth, stand up. Shouldn't we wake her? I called Bill. Bill? He's coming over. He's a physicist. Maybe he what can... What do we need a physicist for? It's all I could think of. Shouldn't we call 911? And tell them what? That our daughter rolled off the bed and now we can hear her, but we can't see her. Oh, God. Where is she, Chris? Where is she? I'm going to look under the house. Under the house? Why? There's no hole in the floor, is there? Not that I can see. Oh. I better let Mac in. He's going to wake up the whole neighborhood. Sit on the edge of the bed. Wait here for me. Get the flashlight. It's in the kitchen. Right. Come here, boy. Mac, where are you going? Mac! What's wrong with him? He's after something. Like he's got a scent. He's trying to get under the bed. Grab him! I can't! Where did he go? I don't know. Step back. He's got to be under there. Mac! Come on out, boy! Here, Mac! He's not, is he? Now don't jump to conclusions. He's with Tina. Oh, he's here. Bill. I got here as fast as I could. Thanks. What's up? 
I'd tell you if I could, but you wouldn't believe it. Try me. I wouldn't know where to start. You better see for yourself. See what? They're in the bedroom. You remember Bill, honey? From work? Ruth? She's still asleep. Listen. Where's your daughter? Uh, under there? Take a look. I don't see anything. Neither do we. Do you have a flashlight? Here. You were right. About what? Don't believe it. Let's move the bed. Bill, where is she? I'm about to lose my mind. Well, at least she's breathing normally. So, she must be okay. Take the other end. Got it. Wait. It's not that heavy. Uh, we better mark where the legs were. Why? Do what he says. Anything will work. You know, those books in the corner. Put one on the floor here, and here. I don't see. Thanks. Now, from the front, lift. Right. Two more under this end. Here? Perfect. Now, lift it away from the wall just a few feet. There. All right, now set it down. Okay. You can still hear it. That, that's her breathing? Yes. And these four books mark where the bed was. The sound of her voice is inside the rectangle. The dog was, too, a while ago. Dog? Mac. I let him in the house, and he ran straight for this spot, dove under the bed, and poof. He was gone, too. But we could still hear him. Not now, though. Not now. You felt the entire area? All over, several times. And? Nothing. Okay. What are you doing? Stepping very, very carefully into the rectangle. Looking for... The opening, maybe. The... I want to cover everything between here and the wall. The opening to what? I don't know yet, Ruth. Quiet. There. Do you hear? I hear. You're moving as if you're afraid you're going to step on her. But there's no hole in the floor. You can see that. Yes. Why are you moving your hands? To cover the air above the floor as well. I did that. We both did. Well, maybe not every inch, but... All right, take it easy. I'm almost at the wall. I don't get it. Get what? It's not in front of the wall. So that means it must be... Bill! Look out! Your hand's going into the wall. Pull out! Pull out! I guess I found it. Found what? Bill, what was that? Your whole hand disappeared into the wall. It did. I saw it. So did I. This must be it. What is? The opening. To where? I'm not sure. But off the top of my head, I'd say... to another dimension. Another what? Dimension. You think this is a joke, Bill? No, I don't. Then why? I don't know if I'm right or not. I can't think of anything else, though. Anything else but... Look, there are three dimensions that we can see. Height, width, and depth. The fourth dimension is time. Now, if you know these, you can place anything. Where something is and when exactly. Like, uh, what time is it now? 1.12 a.m. on this particular date in this location. Why are we talking about this? Wait, hear him out. There may be other dimensions as well. Science is still arguing about how real they are. But there could be doorways to these other times and places. Other realms. And some of those doorways have been verified. Have you heard of wormholes? I don't see what all this has to do with my little girl. Wait, I think I'm getting it. Tina must have fallen out of bed. Accidentally rolled under it and gone through. Like my hand. Did that actually happen? I couldn't believe my eyes. Well, one way to find out. Let's try it again and be sure. Bill, don't! Right about here, wasn't it? I was touching the wall to see if it was solid and... 
It's happening again. Oh, this is it. An invisible opening of some sort. I can't see your hand. Pull it back. There. I'm okay. What did it feel like? Well, there was no sensation. It's just that for a second, my hand was out of the visible spectrum. Where was it? That's what we have to figure out. I, I don't care about the reason. I just want Tina back. That's where Mac went to? Must be. He's probably with her now. But why? He could have sensed it. Animals are sharper about that sort of thing than we are. He must have known she was in there and gone after her. But we have eyes, too. Why can't we see them? Because some things may be right in front of us, but we have a blind spot. Such as? Do you have any change on you? What? Wait a minute, I do. Here, here, here's a quarter. Now, hold it out at arm's length, between your thumb and your finger. Yeah, that's it. Now, I want you to stare straight ahead at the ceiling light and move the quarter just off center a few degrees to the right. Approximately the three o'clock position. But don't move your eyes. Go ahead, try. Wait a minute. What do you see? Nothing. I can't see the quarter anymore. Exactly. But if you move it an inch or two right or left, or up or down, there it is again. It always was there, right in front of you, but you couldn't see it. Do you know why? Because you have a blind spot on your retina. It's a very small area where the optic nerves tie together. You'd never know it. How can you be aware of what you can't see? But whatever's there is still there, isn't it? I mean, whether you see it or not. I never noticed that before. You could go your whole life and never notice it, unless there was some reason to. But it's been there all along, invisible, like the quarter. Well, now that I know where she is, I'm going after her. No. Don't try to stop me. She's my little girl. We don't know what else is in there or how far it leads. My daughter is in there. I know that, Ruth, but we can't just... Why not? You put your hand in and you pulled it out twice. We don't have enough information yet. Tina is right in front of us on the other side of this dimensional opening or whatever it is. All we have to do is reach in and... If it's that simple, why hasn't Mac found her yet? If I'm right, and this is a, a kind of gap or blind spot, a, an opening to another dimension, it wouldn't be laid out the same as our world, would it, Chris? There must be something we can do. Listen to the man, honey. You got a pencil? Anything to write with? Check Tina's drawer. Only crayons. That'll do. Uh, a black one. Here. Now... Let's see just how big this thing is. I'll have to mark up your wall. Go ahead. This is solid. And this. And this. Ooh, but not here. The same spot I touched before. All right, I'll mark it with a dot. Take your hand out first. Right. And all around the edges, where it's still solid, There. These marks form a rough outline of the opening. And you're saying it's always been there? Oh, my God. That's why she didn't want to sleep in here. She knew somehow. She could have fallen through at any time. Oh, uh, I doubt it. Why not? Because locations are in space and time. The fourth dimension, remember? <sighs> Lord knows, I'm no expert on this, but... Well, it's still pretty theoretical, but for now, I can connect the dots in at least two of those dimensions. So you're establishing the perimeter? As best as I can. I suspect that junctures, like this, are anomalies. You know, freaks of nature, or of the space-time continuum, if you prefer. Occurring, well, who knows how often. Rarely, though, I'd say. I hope. Now, if I take these points and extend them geometrically and then draw lines to connect the limits, we should see the projected boundaries of our so-called doorway. That's it. The outline? All right, let's step back and see what we've got. Kind of a vertical rectangle. Looks like a doorway, all right. Not quite symmetrical. 
and a bit small, about three feet across, maybe four feet tall. Exactly the size of Tina. She could have stepped through. Do you still have that quarter? Here. Throw it. What? At the wall. What for? It's a test. Toss it between the lines and, and we'll see what happens. Okay, here goes. Where is it? It went through. The quarter's in. The other place. Wherever that is. Now what? Well... What are you doing? Shh. This is where I heard her. Where the bed was. The sound was the loudest just off the floor, but now... I can't hear her anymore. Chris! Let me try. Put your head down as low as you can. She's right. I can't even hear Tina's breathing. No. No. Tina? Answer me, sweetheart. Where are you? Tina? <gasps> What's happened? The temporal dimension may be shifting. In that case, she could be anywhere. Tina? Tina! Hold it down. You hear anything at all? No. She's gone. Get up, Ruth. Move around, both of you, and keep listening. What's the point? It's a chance. Do it. Psst. Over here. That's her. In the corner. What in the name of... Quiet. It's getting weaker. Where's she going now? Tina, come back! Keep looking for her. But how? Come on. Where? Anywhere. Try the whole house. I'll take the living room. Tina? <laughs> Tina? <laughs> what is it? She's gone. Gone and never coming back. We don't know that. We don't know anything. Come on, babe. You gotta be strong. For Tina. In here. Bill? What are you doing by the television set? Put your ear next to mine. Mommy? Daddy? I want my dolly. Tina? I'm here! Mommy? I can't see you. What is this? First she was in the bedroom, now she's in here. I've told you what I think, Chris. But she went into this other dimension in the bedroom. What's she doing here? If I could tell you, I would. You've got to think rationally. How can we think rationally about an irrational situation? One step at a time. We try every possibility. Cross off the ones that don't work. I'm not going to wait. Neither am I. We can't get ahead of ourselves. My daughter needs me. I've got to go to her somehow, some way. I've got to go to her. I'm afraid it's not that simple. Get out of my way. Slow down. Let's think it through first. We have to do something. I know, but what? She could be somewhere else entirely now. Are you saying it's hopeless? Chris, if she's beyond our world, everything's different where she is. The normal rules don't apply. The slightest movement on her part might seem, to us, to be all over the place. But she might just be turning over in her sleep. Then what do we do? I have an idea. Call him. Who? The dog. Call him. Hurry! Mac! Here, boy! That's it. Here, that's a boy. There she is. I hear her. Where are you taking me, Mac? I don't want to go. Stop it! Tell her to go with him. Tina! Mommy? She hears you. She hears you. Go with Mac, baby. Please, go with him. Where are you? Here, baby. I'm here. Just tell her to go with the dog. Sweetie, go with Mac. Right now, baby. Where are they taking me? Where we are. 
You want to be with mommy and daddy, don't you? Yeah. Then go. Will he take me to you? Yes, baby, he will. All right, mommy. Hurry, Mac. Let's go. The dog should go back to the place where he entered. Yes. Now, get down on the floor in front of the wall. I don't hear anything. Call the dog again. Mac! Here, boy! Here! Nothing. Bill, can't we help her? It'll have to be the dog, Ruth. We can't take a chance going through ourselves. Why not? If Mac could do it... Mac has a better sense of smell and hearing. He might be able to find his way. Mac! Come here! Right here! Come on! I hear him. He's doing it! Man, what a mutt! They're not getting any closer. This way, Mac! Come! Tina? Mommy? I can hear him. But they're not coming through the wall. They can't see the opening where they are. Come to me, Mac! To me! Daddy? Bring her out, Mac! Now! Here, baby. Right here. Just a little bit farther. Follow Mac. I can't see you. Mac, you better come. Right now. Why doesn't he do it? Maybe he can't. He's confused. If you can't see him, he can't see you. No. I won't have it. What are you doing? Reaching in. Stop! Pull your arm back! Tina! Take my hand. No, Chris. It's too dangerous. Let go of me. My hand, Tina. Take hold of it. I can't see it, Daddy. I'll lean a little further. See it now? No. Chris, here. Here. Chris! Chris! Chris? Yes! You all right? I'm okay. I got through. Can you hear me? We hear you, pal. Don't move. But I have to. Don't move an inch, or you'll never find your way out. But I'm just here, on the other side of the wall. What do you see? I'm not sure. It's dark. There are lights. Millions of them. Like... like stars. Some of them are flashing, moving past, and there's some kind of mist. I can't make out anything else yet. Don't even try. Stay where you are. I've got to find her! Let her come to you, Chris. Call her. Yes, call her. Tina! Daddy? I can hear her. She's close. Come to the sound of my voice. I don't know which way. I gotta help her. She can't see any more than I can. Chris, I mean it. Daddy, I'm scared. Don't. Wait there for her. I don't have a choice. She needs me. Tina! Where are you, Daddy? Right here. Where? Is Mac with you? Yes. Grab his collar. Can you see his collar? I think so. Put your fingers under it. Mac, where are you going? I'm coming, honey. Chris, Chris, don't go after her. I have to. Tina, where did you go? Tina, Tina. Stand still. I don't like this place. Don't be afraid. I'll get you out. Where's Mommy? Waiting for you at home. In your room. She's waiting for us. Listen to my voice. Come to me. I, I don't know where you are. I can't see you, Daddy. Where's Mac now? Here. Grab onto him. Hold tight. Can you do that for me? I'm trying. Chris! Hurry! 
Got his collar yet? Yes. Get a good grip now. Okay, Daddy. But he wants to run away. You have to stay with him. Don't let go. Mac! <gasps> Bring her here. Bring her to me, Mac. <gasps> Is he bringing you, Tina? Yes. Hold on tight, baby. Go where he wants to go. I will. You'll be here in a minute. Mac knows the way. Just hang on. Come on, Mac. Come on, boy. Chris, we're running out of time. <gasps> that a boy. Here. <gasps> right here. Can you see her yet? I'm not sure. Their shadow's moving. Yes! Tina! Here, boy. <gasps> That's right. Daddy, pick me up. Take my hand. I'm right in front of you. Reach out. A little closer. I can't see you. <laughs> I know it's hard. Just try. That's it. Closer. There. I got her! Oh, Daddy. Oh, baby. Baby. You're okay now. Daddy, Daddy. Oh, baby. I got her. I got her. Hi, Mac. <laughs> You, you big, beautiful animal. You did it. You found me. I want to go home. Me too. That's where we're going. Mac, let me take your collar. Now go. Go to Tina's room. Where is it, huh? Put your arms around my neck, honey. Hold tight. Here they are. Tina! Mommy! Take her. I've got his legs. I'm pulling as hard as I can. There. There. I told you you'd make it. Oh, Chris. How does she look? Fine. She looks beautiful. Mommy. Come on, honey. Let's get you out of this room. I better go with him. Sit down on the bed. Get your bearings first. Oh, man. Man. What happened anyway? I pulled you out. Feet first? How did you do that? Half of you was still here. But I was walking around. You only thought you were. I was holding on to you the whole time. I didn't feel it. I know you didn't. How come you kept telling me to hurry? Because... Yeah? The opening was getting smaller. What are you talking about? The time element. At least that dimension was changing, or starting to. And if it had happened, we would have lost the location on both sides. For how long? <laughs> I couldn't begin to guess. The opening was shrinking? Well, see for yourself. <sighs> Solid all over, now including the area inside the lines. It was closing up the whole time. You mean... Another few seconds, and it would have finished closing, with half of you here and the other half there. <sighs> I would have been cut in two. Yeah. Mac? <sighs> you did good, Mac. Real good. How would you like to sleep in the house from now on? Keep an eye on things. Yeah, that a boy. Better put some boards on the wall for now, until we can figure out what happened and make sure it doesn't happen again. Can we do that? Well, we can try. Meanwhile, you might not want to let her sleep in here for a while. Are you kidding? No way. Tina will never have to sleep in here again. Looks like she got a wish after all. From the mouths of babes, huh, Chris? From the mouths of babes. And good old boys like Mac here. <laughs> uh. A brief journey into another dimension, perhaps. But which? The fourth? The fifth? Or one not yet charted by theoretical physics? They never came up with an answer, despite a battery of research scientists equipped with every instrument known to man. No explanation was ever found. Only a little more respect and 
uncertainty about what can happen in the Twilight Zone. Little Girl Lost, starring Stephen Tobolowski with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Alyssa Frayden, Dana Bokor, and Doug James. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Don't you like to dance? I need a breath of fresh air is all. Well, don't stay out here too long. The dance is just getting started. <laughs> Billy Ben, that you? Who are you expecting? You're late. Sure I'm late, pretty thing. I've been to town today. Why didn't you take me with you? I did the next best thing. Thought of you every step of the way. You got a sweet and lying tongue. And you are a fair young thing. What did you do in town? Stop trying to kiss me. What will folks say? There's nobody here. Just you and me and the man in the moon. You're a right high-spirited man to have walked to town and back. I was there for a right high-spirited reason. Looking at all the pretty girls, I'll bet, in their fancy clothes and high-heeled shoes. None as pretty as you. Close your eyes. What are you putting on my finger? You can open them now. <gasps> Why, that's the prettiest ring I ever did see. It sparkles even in the light of the moon. It's a genuine zircon. Oh, Billy, I'm proud enough to cry. I love you with all my enduring life. And I have the same for you. Can I show it to everybody? If that would pleasure you. Oh, how the girls will envy me. Come on, let's go in the barn. The Twilight Zone has existed in many lands in many times. It has its roots in history, in things that happened long ago and got handed down from one generation to another. And in the telling, the story gets added to and embroidered on until what might have happened in the time of the Druids sounds as if it took place yesterday in, say, the Blue Ridge Mountains. Like the story you're about to hear. Even though such tales are best told by an elderly grandfather on a cold winter's night by the fireside, if possible, in the southern hills of the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, Jess Bell, starring Stephanie Weir, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Friends, now that everybody's here, I am proud to bid you welcome. 
I want everybody to dance till you wear out the fiddler and eat till you let your belt out to the last notch. <laughs> My land was good to me this year. The good Lord blessed it with rain when rain was needed and a kindly sun to follow. And this barn is heavy with the yield of it. But that's just one reason to celebrate here tonight. A decent, good, and true man came to me and asked for the hand of my daughter, Elwyn. She has my enduring love. And now I've given her my blessing to marry Billy Ben Turner. Oh, Elwyn, I'm so glad for you. Thank you. You must be so proud. I am, I am. Excuse me for a minute. Billy? Yes, honey? What's wrong with Jess Bell? Huh? Well, look at her. She's walking out. Going home early, I reckon. See if you can talk her into staying. She'll come back if she's of a mind to. Night's young yet. Ruin my party if folks start leaving early. Go on. Okay, I'll do what I can. Jess? Jess, Bill? Don't you come near me. I was hoping you'd wish us well. You'll have nothing from me but my curses. Uh, no need for you to take on so, Jess, Bill. Do you want me to go in there and throw my arms around her? Tell her I'm glad? Jess, I'm sorry. You weren't sorry the first night you came whistling up Eagle Rock Trail. I was washing supper dishes and heard you call my name, remember? And I ran like the wind to meet you. Jess, don't. All those things you told me, I believed. Remember when we clung together in the sweet night grass on Eagle Rock Mountain and the moonlight made the sea of silver mist on the fog below? I remember. And the day we ran together through the Scotch broom field and the sun was blazing down and we fell together and you touched me and the fire in me burned as hot as the white sun. The fire has gone to ashes now, Jess Bell. It still burns inside. It's different with Elwyn and me. Her pretty clothes and her daddy's land. Is that the difference, Billy Ben? No, that's not the difference. I love her in a quiet way. I don't want to know. You tell your love a thing for me, will you, Billy Ben? What's that? Tell her not to start making her wedding dress right away. Why tell her a thing like that? Because she ain't married you yet, Billy. Maybe she never will. Fair was Ellie Glover. Fair was Jess Bell. Both they loved the same man, and both they loved him well. Go away. I've got to see you. If you come to my house, just walk right in. I don't Ask nobody here. Granny Hart? What do you bother an old woman for this time of night? Folks say you got power. Folks say a lot of things. They say that all of Moses Crowley's cows sickened and died after he shot that hawk you used to keep. That hawk was my pet. He used to roost at the black pine tree outside the door. And when Molly Unger's baby was dying of fever, Molly went somewhere and got a potion for him. Folks said she came here. She did. And that baby lived, too, didn't he? Lived, but he's cursed with fits. His mama don't let him out of the house. What else do they say of me? They say you're a witch. Sugar, if I was a witch, I'd be flying around on my broom instead of sitting here at home minding my own business. Whatever you are, will you help me? Depends, sugar. I want to win a man's love. Womankind's got her own kind of witchcraft for that. He was mine for a while. Came sneaking off at night and kept it quiet what went on between him and me. Never took me any place for the world to know. 
He made me promises. Made them when his face was hot as blood and forgot them just as soon as he was ten feet from my door. Don't know much about men, do you, sugar? Only him. What man? Billy Ben Turner. Ooh, a pretty one he is, with strong round arms to hold a girl. And a fickle heart like the whole race of men. How you want him to love you, gal? There's lots of ways of loving. Tell me some kinds. As many as there are people. Could you make him love me like he did when he couldn't let a night pass without seeing me, when he'd fight if any other man so much as looked at me? How much money did you bring me? I don't have any money. Then how do you expect to pay me? I'll give you my pearl hairpin. The pearl is real, brought back from across the seas by my daddy in one of the wars, and the stick is made of silver. Ah, silver! Put it out of my sight. That all you got to offer me? That's everything on earth I own, save the clothes on my back. You better go home, gal. Live your life without Billy Ben Turner. I won't have any life without him. You've got to help me. There's something I can give you, but the price is high. I told you I didn't have any money. Taint money. If it's in my power, I'll pay it. Oh, it's in your power. What is the price? You'll know in the midnight hour of time. Whatever it is, I'll pay. Take this little bottle. Drink. All right. What was that? The first sign of your new self. Does he love me now? After his eyes fall next on your face, they'll never look at another woman as long as they can look on you. I feel faint. Well, let's go in the corner. You're trembling. The night's turned cold. Don't seem cold to me. I felt a cold wind. And something on the wind, like my own voice crying far, far away. I wish our wedding were already done. And me. Give me a kiss. Is kissing all you think about? Everybody, choose your partners. I'm a fool for dancing, too. Then let's not keep the fiddler waiting. Hey, there's Jess Bell. She come back. Come on, Jess Bell. Be my partner. Why, thank you, John. Now change partners and circle round. First man in the circle, choose your girl. Go on round, Billy. I'll be waiting. Hello, Billy Ben. Jess, you look different. Dance with me. Just us two. Well, all of a sudden I don't feel much like dancing. Let's go someplace. Billy, are you going to dance with me or not? Uh, in a little while, Elwin. I gotta go outside. Come on, Jess Bill. Where's he going? Come along, Elwin. You sit with Mother for a while. Maddie? Oh, Daddy. I never in my life. What come over the boy? Whatever it was, he better get over it, or he'll answer to me. It's a shame and a disgrace. If Billy Ben expects you to marry him after this, he'll have to think again. He won't be marrying me. I'm glad you got spirit, child. I'd still have him if I could. If this very minute he would come back in that door and call my name, I'd go running to him. I'd not let you shame yourself so. But he'll not be back. I won't even get the chance. Jess Bell bewitched him. Just before she took him away, he turned and looked at me. 
It was like he'd never seen my face before. enough to drive a man crazy. You're a master hand with sweet words, Billy Ben Turner. When we're married, it'll be hateful to leave you of a morning. I won't let you leave. I'll lock the door and keep you home all day. Then how will we live if I don't work my land? When you go into the fields, I'll hide behind a juniper tree and sing songs to tease you home again. And where will the money come from for the pretties I'll buy you? What will you buy me? Dresses of silk and combs for your hair, rings for your fingers, and... There's only one ring I want. If it's in my power, I'll get it for you. Oh, you can get it all right, Billy Ben. All you gotta do is ask Elwyn to give it back. I reckon she's gonna hate me now. She can't hate any more than she can love. What'd you ever see in that girl, anyhow? I... I forget. You're a right fickle man, Billy Ben. Maybe you'll forget me, too, one day. Hang me for a fool if I ever leave your side. Looks like the moon is going down. I better go. I won't let you. I'm going to keep you here all night. I can't. Why not? Mama's home by herself. She'll worry about me. You never worried about your mama before. Let me go. I don't want you away from me. Billy Van, let go of my arm. What'd you do that for? I told you, it's late. I can't be here anymore. All right, then. It don't matter, Jess Bell. Can nothing change the love I hold for you? I have to go home. Hold up. Just leave me be. I'll walk you, sure enough. I said good night. Just one more kiss. No! Who was that brought you home? Nobody, Mother. Go back to bed. Honey, don't go right to bed. Come sit a spell and tell me about the dance. In the morning. Good night. Jess Bell, what are you locking yourself in your room for? Because I don't want you to see what I am now. By day she knew a woman's form, by night a witch's spell. For love of Billy Turner, accursed was Jess Bell. Honey? Oh, Billy Ben. I didn't mean to scare you, Jess. What are you sitting out here in the woods for? I was just thinking. I got something for you. Hold out your hand. Ellie's ring. Jess's ring now. It belongs to the one I love, and the one I love is you. Every minute I'm away from you is a suffering and a torment. What do you know about suffering and torment? I know what's finding a girl who's your heart's craving and having her keep putting the wedding day off. There's all kinds of torment in the world. Like the one that comes from buying something and finding out that the price is dear. What did you buy that cost so dear, Jess? something I love. Do you love it still? Better than life. Better than me? Nothing I love better than you. I've been to see the preacher today, Jess. What did you want with him? You've been taking so long to set the day. I said it myself. He's gonna marry us next Sunday. I I can't be ready by then. I spoke to your mama. Your wedding dress will be all sewed. My house is clean. Everything new and waiting for you. Oh... (laughs) Billy! Jess, have you changed your mind? No. Then why keep putting the wedding day off? I just can't tell you, Billy. There's no room for secrets between you and me. 
Wait, where are you going? I have to be gone from you for a while. Stay now, Jess. I got a craving to be with you every minute. Let me go, Billy. Never knew a man could have such love as I hold for you. There's no peace from it, Jess. It burns in my brain night and day. I tell you... Th Let me go. Ow! What'd you scratch me for? Billy Ben Turner. Have you gone and fallen in love with a Hellcat? Womb of frog and heart of bat. Tongue of sparrow, blood of cat. Grasshopper's eyes and lizard skin. Yolk of egg from a strangled hen. Cut of cow and puppy seed. Snout of swine and adder's weed. Graveyard dust and breast of dove. Bubble, bubble, wine of love. <sighs> Didn't you hear me knocking? <laughs> Never let trouble in the door if I can help it. How do you know I'm in trouble? <laughs> Child, there's little I don't know. Then maybe you can help me. You change your mind and now you got what you want? I haven't got what I want. Don't tell me, child, that you haven't got the love of Billy Ben Turner. Oh, I've got his love, all right. But I can't take it for fear he'd find out the price I paid. It's the same as if my heart's been cut out and a stone put where the heart was. It ain't your heart, gal. What, then? Oh, everybody's got a different name for it. Some call it a soul. That was in the bargain, too? That's always in the bargain when you barter with witches. You said you were a witch, that you just had power. Well, you might as well know the truth, because you're one, too. I changed you, sugar. Then change me back. Gal, you can't ever change. What you are is what you're going to be till you die. Then I hope I die soon. You're looking at it all wrong. Be a witch and take a witch's pleasure. Take the man you bargained for. Don't you think I want to? But how long do you think I'd keep him if he found out what happens when the clock strikes 12? That's the worst of all. Waking up when it's over and not knowing what I've done. Please, I promise I'll pay. Your promises don't mean a thing. You're already trying to get out of paying for the first favor I did you. I can't live this way. Take what you bargained for, gal. It's not fair to Billy Ben. Then go away from here, witch. I've got no time for you. I tell you, I can't do that to Billy Ben. Billy Ben? Jess, I've been out of my mind. I've searched the county over for you, cursing myself every step of the way. Jess, where you been? I went off by myself. Did you think about me? You were all I thought about. And did you think about me with love? Yes, Billy. I won't try to talk you into a quick wedding anymore. Whatever it is that's on your mind, you don't even have to tell me. You set your own day for the wedding. There will be no wedding, Billy Ben. Oh, don't say a thing like that. Not between you and me. I'd as soon hear my death bell as what you're saying. I'd as soon hear my own death bell as say it. To forget it was said. I love you, Jess Bell. I want you for my wife. You wouldn't want me long. One night and you'd turn away from me. Curse me for a fool if ever that day should come. Your flesh would crawl and you would hide your face from me. I set you free, Billy. Take this ring back. It belongs here, on your finger. Hear that? A night bird calling his mate. But his mate won't come. I saw her on the trail tonight, winging up against the sky, but then a night hawk swooped up out of the pines and tore her breast open. She fell at my feet, 
and ran off into the bushes to die. A night bird calling to a mate that's dead is the lonesomest sound in the world. It would grieve me too much to do that to you. Jess, it wasn't an omen. It don't mean you're gonna die. Billy Ben, if I saw old man death come walking down Eagle Rock Trail, I'd run to meet him and I'd beg him on my knees to take me with him. Jess, Jess, what is it that's cursing you? I got a right to know. Oh, it's late. I've got to go. Not yet. Billy Ben, if you love me, stand aside. It's my time. Jess! Jess Bell! An awful night was spent by all On Eagle Rock did dwell Strange things were seen by moonlight's fall But none saw Jess Bell Billy Ben's place. But how... Take the man you bargained for. Give him a witch's love. No. Nothing can change your sugar. Which you are and which you'll always be. No. You've paid the price. Take what you've paid for. Take what you've paid for. Take what you've paid for. What? Jess Bell. Morning. You all right? Of course I am. Sorry about last night. Me too. I never saw such a night. Fell asleep at the kitchen table. The animals in the barn kept crying out. The cow got fractious and nearly kicked the stall down. Sheep bleating like they were seeing wolves. I had to go out two or three times to quiet them. Let me fix you some breakfast. Now there's my girl. I'll start the fire. I'll fix it for you every morning, and your dinner and your supper too. Then go up on the hill and pick wildflowers to make the place nice. Honey, ain't I been begging you to do just that? I made up my mind. Next Sunday, come what may, I'll be your wife. Oh, Jess. You're a long way from home, Ellie Glover. Oh, hello, Jess. What are you doing up here on Eagle Rock? I came to pick some flowers. Same as me. Lots of wild ones around. There's a patch of old maid's fern farther up the mountain. I notice a lot of vixen wart around myself. I just come from seeing Billy Ben. Fixed his breakfast for him. I reckon that's no concern of mine. He's going to marry me when the circuit preacher comes next Sunday. I wish you happiness for his sake. You still love him, Ellie? Still dream about his strong arms and his sweet talk? I'll love no other man. How come you never tried to get him back? The last time I saw his face, he was under a magic spell. Even the love I hold for him couldn't break it. Oh, there's ways, but... Such ways end bad. What ways you talking about? I think you know. Jealous, ain't you? No. Heart sick. To see wrong done to a good man. I hear there's a wildcat loose in the county. Ain't you scared to be out here? I'll be home by dark. It won't venture out till nightfall. No telling what a wildcat'll do. I reckon we don't have much to fear. My daddy says that killer cat will be dead by morning. <laughs> Since when can your daddy look in the future and tell what's gonna be? He's going hunting for that cat tonight. Him and Obed Miller and Billy Ben. All the men in the county. Billy Ben didn't say nothing to me. 
My daddy's gone over to ask him right now. If that cat's smart, it'll stay home tonight. Maybe. Stand still, Jess. You're as nervous as a fox in a forest fire. Mama, is it going to take you all night to fix that helm? You never would have had such a fine wedding dress without Billy Ben hadn't give me the money, you know that? I saw Ellie Glover today, up on the mountain picking wildflowers. How did she look? Sickly, like she might die soon. Why, I didn't even know the poor thing was ailing. I ought to fix some of that tonic I used to make and take it to her. You and your tonics. You're worse than Granny Hart. Granny Hart? Everybody knows she sells old potions and things. She ain't sold any to you, has she? Don't talk crazy. It always struck me peculiar how Billy Ben turned from Elwyn on the very night their betrothal was announced. Turned from Elwyn and gave his love to you. Loved me long before he ever loved her. Loved her enough to want to marry, then turned away from her. Why, Jess? Don't ask me. Men are strange people. Sometimes they do strange things because of potions and powders. Is that what made him blind to every other woman? Oh, where would I get the money for potions and powders? That old woman don't always ask for money. Jess, how did you pay her? Oh, God, Jess, how did you pay her? With my flesh and my blood and my soul and my heart and my head, I paid dear for Billy Ben. Kneel down with me. Let us pray. It's too late, Mama. My prayers aren't heard in heaven anymore. <laughs> then I'll find a way to help you. If you want to see me alive again, bolt my door tonight. And no matter what happens, don't open it till morning comes. Okay, man, you know what to do. Kind of late in the year for a big cat to be roaming these parts. By this time, they usually range in farther south. Luther. Billy Ben. I brought my shotgun. Howdy, fellas. Howdy. Got a full moon. That cat will be out tonight for sure, hungry or not. This ain't a hungry cat. Kills for the pleasure of it. Hunger or pleasure, a full moon will fetch him out. Howdy, Obed. Howdy, Luther. Howdy, man. Brought my gun and my hound dog. Nothing gets past old Daisy. Good, good. Well, I reckon everybody's here that's coming. Let's pull out. You okay in here, Jess Bell? It's late, Mama. Go to sleep and let me be. But it's almost 12 o'clock. Jess! How'd you break the window? Where have you run off to? Hold on, man. I think old days have found something. Which way? Over there, through the trees. She struck a trail. That's my land. We come full circle. Quiet, Blue. What's the matter with you? What's the matter, Blue? Having a bad dream? Nothing's gonna hurt you. What are you looking at? Something up in the loft? What is it? An owl? Why are you scared of a... <gasps> Ellie! Ellie! Up there! Look out, Daddy! Daisy, come here! Raise the lantern! Never seen no cat like that. Black as night, it is. Shoot, men! 
I think we got it. Where'd he go? Hold your lanterns high. It's gone. Can't just disappear. The cat was a witch. Witch? Never seen nothing like it. Daddy? That thing hurt you, Ellie? No, Daddy. I fainted, is all. You see it, Billy? I sure did. Nothing here now. Well, our work is done for the night. Go on home, men. Whatever it was ain't here no more. Can you stand up, Ellie? I think so. I'll help her, sir. You do that while I tell her mother she's all right. I'm fine, Daddy. I'll just be a minute. Here, take my arm. Did it hurt you, Billy Ben? No, I'm all right. I'm enduring glad to see you, Ellie. Pretty as always. It's good to see you, Billy. It's been a long spell. Yes. It has. What's that shiny thing in your hand? It was right next to you, where you fell, like it dropped down from the loft. Looks like the ring. It sure is. The same one I gave to you once. Only how did it get here? Maybe it's an omen. Elwyn, uh, I'd appreciate it if, if I could come and sit up with you again some night. That would pleasure me right fine, Billy. Come whenever you feel like it, and make it soon. Warm was Ellie Glover, cold dead was Jess Bell. And husband would be Billy Ben of the one he loves so well. Come on in. Hello, Billy. Miss Aussie, what are you doing here? I won't stay but a minute, Billy Ben. Just wanted to wish you all the happiness in the world on your wedding day. I appreciate it, Miss Aussie, but won't you be at the wedding? I wouldn't spoil the day for Elwyn. She'd see me and think of Jezebel. There's no shadow of Jezebel between Ellie and me. God grant there never will be. A full year now Jezebel's been dead. How do you know she's dead, Billy? I saw her die. Billy, I brought you something. This pearl and silver stick pin. It used to belong to Jezebel. Poor Jess. I appreciate it, Miss Ossie. It's made of silver. And silver is one thing a witch is scared of. What witch could want to harm Ellie? There's a terrible thing I've got to tell you. A secret about Jess Bell. What secret? That same night she disappeared, she mentioned Granny Hart. Jess Bell was witched. <laughs> it's a bitter thing for a mother to know that her only child's a witch. Billy... She ain't dead. I was there. Fire some shots myself. Billy, some months back, I went into Jess Bell's room. Sitting on her pillow was a wart toad. I grabbed a broom and brought it down with all my might. That toad disappeared in a puff of smoke. It could have been a cloud of dust. It was the spirit of Jess Bell. Another night, a bat flew in the house. I tried to kill it, but it turned to smoke, too. Miss Ossie, I saw her die. Don't you know you can't kill a witch? They just change into something else. If a person is good and strong, then a witch can't harm them. Ellie will have nothing to fear from Jess Bell. And now, Miss Ossie, I, I'm going to be late for my wedding if I don't hurry. I hope and pray, Billy. There'll be no one there who wasn't invited. love and to cherish till death do us part. To love and to cherish till death do us part. According to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I plight thee my troth. According to God's holy ordinance, and thereto I plight thee my troth. 
Those whom God hath joined together, let no man put asunder. I now pronounce you man and wife. Come on, honey, let's get on home. Yes. Billy Ben looked a mite nervous, like he was gonna pass out. Well, I remember feeling the same way when I married you. Oh, you get along now. <laughs> Here we are, sweet thing. Billy Ben, are you gonna let your bride walk across your threshold? Never. Now put me down if I'm gonna get changed out of this pretty dress. Billy! What's the matter? Something has hold of my arm. It ain't me. But I can feel it. What are you doing? I don't know. I... What'd you do that for? It wasn't me. It sure was your hand. Oh, Billy, I drew blood. I never did that of my own will. Something's took hold of me and moved my hand. I didn't see nothing, Ellie. There's something in this room. Something we can't see nor hear. Something evil. Can't you feel it? Um, not sure. Look, a mouse on your grandfather clock. Ellie, careful! Oh, Billy, it could have killed me. I've got you, honey. It was a mouse, as black as night. Take me home. This is your home now. But something doesn't want me here. I know what it is that's trying to chase you out. Sit down. Hold on to this Bible. I gotta be gone from you a short time. Do you trust in the Lord? Yes. Then his word will keep you safe. If the devil himself comes in this room, don't leave that chair. Doors open. Granny Hart, I'm short on time. You need a new sweetheart. I got one, and I just made her my wife. Ellie Glove with the golden hair. Ah, she's a beauty. I'll not have her beauty long unless you tell me how to rid myself of a witch. Jess Bell don't like you being married. I'm the one who witched that gal. So she could win your love, Billy Ben. I never wanted no witch's love. Witch's love is wild and sweet. Humans don't know nothing about it. I know enough that if anything happens to Ellie, I couldn't live without her. Jasbel won't hurt your little wife. She's just pleasuring herself a little, teasing and having a good time. Granny, my wife's alone. I, I gotta get back to her. Then go, boy. Nothing holding you here. How can I rid myself of Jasbel? You could kill her. There's nothing to kill. She just turns to smoke and then comes back again. There's ways. What you gonna pay me? I brought money. <laughs> Not enough to kill a witch. This is all I got. Take it or leave it. Mm. I'll take it. Now go home. Get a dress that Jess Bell has worn. Hang it up so it looks like she's standing there. And then... If you're man enough, stab it through the heart with silver. I'll do it. It's got to be one she wore. This was to be her wedding dress. She put it on once when I was making it. Thank you, Ossie. For me and my bride. And Billy, if your hand fails you, remember there was a good part to Jess Bell, too. And that part of her would bless you for ending her torment. I told you not to leave the house. I wanted to wait for you out here. What's that package? Stay outside a minute longer. 
That thing you felt was the spirit of Jess Bell. She was a witch, Ellie, but I know how to get rid of witches. All right, but you'll never be rid of me. Jess Bell. Come on, Billy Ben. Dance with me in the moonlight. No, get away. Let me in. Take the dress. Hang it up like she's standing here. Okay. Now, the stick pin! Oh, Billy. Oh, what have you done? Stabbed you through the heart, just like Granny Hart said. Oh. Now I'm giving you your eternal rest. Oh, Billy. Goodbye, Jess Bell. I loved you, Billy Ben. Billy Ben. Nothing left but the dress. Ellie! 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 Let hell swallow me if I've killed you too! Billy, I remember a wedding. Did I dream that? No. You are my pretty little wife. Then I should be cooking you some supper. Help me up. Not too fast. Look up there, Billy Ben. That star just danced in the sky, then went shooting down behind Eagle Rock Mountain. My mama says when you see a fallen star, it means a witch has died. So I've heard tell. Come on inside. It's our wedding night. Ellie Glover, dark was Jess Bell. Both they loved the same man, and both they loved him well. A tale told in one form or another, as long as there have been people to tell it. And if you're thinking it's just a fairy story, here's a piece of advice. The next time the moon is up, put another stick on the campfire. And if you see a falling star, be sure to make a wish. It just might keep you safe from the great darkness out there. A darkness that extends all the way from the Blue Ridge Mountains to the Twilight Zone. Jess Bell, starring Stephanie Weir, with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Earl Hamner, Jr. Heard in the cast were Jeff Lupiton, Michelle Graff, Linda Ryder, Roderick Peoples, Meg Falcon, Peggy Roter, Doug James, Craig Harris, Jennifer Leterio, Choby Cerny, Carl Amari, and Roy Malanzi. Musical bridges for this Twilight Zone radio drama sung by Doug James with guitarist Roy Malanzi and harmonica by Jeff Lupiton. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for the Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Yes? 
Mrs. Pratt? Oh, hello there, Ida. How are you? Can't complain. And yourself? I was just making some lemonade. Come on in. I shouldn't stay. My son's coming to dinner. I have to put a casserole in the oven. Just for a moment, then. I'll get you a nice tall glass in the kitchen. Well, if you don't mind. You can be my taster. You absolutely must tell the truth, though. If it's too sour, I'll add more sugar. It looks lovely. Where'd you get the lemons? From Mr. Takamori's backyard. He brought me a whole bag of them. How thoughtful. Oh, he's an absolute jewel. I swear, that man can grow anything. He's certainly done wonders for the trees on this street. Mmm, it's delicious. I always say there's nothing like fresh lemonade. I see Arthur's doing your lawn now. Yes, he's such a fine young man. Isn't he? Always so polite. Do you think he'll take over his uncle's nursery? Oh, I seriously doubt it. With college and all, he has his sights set on something higher. May, I was wondering. Mm -hmm. Couldn't Arthur do Mr. Fenton's lawn, too? Mr. Fenton? Well, I believe he'd rather do it himself. You know that man. Yes, but his place has been a fright lately. Oh, such a shame. He used to keep that yard so neat... I hear his wife moved out. The boy doesn't charge much, and Mr. Fenton's lot's going to seed. It lowers property values, you know. Well, then, why don't you ask him? Oh, I couldn't. He'd think I was being a busybody. Arthur, I mean. He can stop by after he finishes here. It wouldn't hurt. I suppose. If he needs the job. I expect he does. That family's worked so hard. Can't have been easy after the war. You don't think... What? Mr. Fenton was in the service, wasn't he? The Marine Corps. I hope he doesn't have a problem, then, with the, the Japanese. Oh, that boy's as American as you and I, born and bred. I know, but there is a feeling with some people. Not in this neighborhood. I'm sure Mr. Fenton has put all that behind him. I should hope so. I was just about to bring Arthur some lemonade. You can mention it now. If you think it's all right. Of course it is. What went on back then was a terrible, terrible thing. But believe me, the war is over. In our town, it ended a long time ago. A trip back in time to an era that's now ancient history. The period, the early 1960s, 20 odd years since Pearl Harbor. The war ended long ago, but for some, so much bitterness and loss are not easily forgotten. Such is the case with our two antagonists whom you are about to meet. Mr. Walter Fenton, veteran of World War II and an officer in the United States Marine Corps. And young Mr. Arthur Takamuri, first-generation son of Japanese immigrants who has no memory at all of those years. Despite their best intentions, this unlikely pair will soon square off for a battle with the ghosts of the past in the darkest, most haunted reaches of the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, The Encounter, starring Stacy Keach and Byron Mann. Uh, get a load of this stuff. Where did it all come from? What a mess. Not a nuke at all. Shoes, clothes. Hey, there's the old radio. Plug it in, see if it works. Well, well. A whole lot of junk and nothing but. Say, what's in the trunk? Well, will you look at that? The sword. Oh, yeah. I remember this. 
How could I forget? Wish to heaven I could. <laughs> yeah. Mr. Fenton? Anybody home? Up here, in the attic. Sorry to bother you. I can come back later. That's okay. Front door's open. All right. Mr. Fenton? It's me. Sorry if I disturbed you. What do you want? Well, Mrs. Bowles down the street sent me over. Oh, she did, huh? Said you wanted somebody to take care of the yard. My yard? How would she know? Oh. Well, if it was a mistake, I apologize. No, no hold on. A matter of fact, she's right. Might as well come in. Are you sure? Yep. Well, if you say so. Lots of cobwebs. Haven't been up here for a while. Oh, that's okay. Haven't I seen you around? Maybe. I cut the grass with some of the people on the block. My uncle runs the nursery at the corner. Oh, yeah. So, um, what do you think? About what? The lawn. Yeah, I could use a hand, I guess. If it's just the front, I can take care of it twice a month. Charge you the same as Mrs. Bowles and Mrs. Platt. Sounds fair enough. Anything more would have to be extra. Like? You know, the backyard, or the lot. Is that yours, too? Yeah, don't worry about that. At least not right away. I ought to warn you, though. Yes? It won't be steady work. Sir? Don't get the idea it's a regular job or anything. Oh, that's all right. I've got plenty of other jobs. Good, because I'm going to sell this termite dump as uh, soon as I find someone fool enough to buy it. I understand, Mr. Fenton. Got it listed already. A little fixer-upper, a handyman's dream with a semi-vacant lot attached. <laughs> Sounds pretty good, huh? I can only come on the weekends. I go to school the rest of the time. Sold. I'll be back at the end of the day, then, if that's all right. Good enough. When us meeting you. Uh, wait a minute. Yes? What's your hurry? I better get back to Mrs. Platt's. Sit down. We'll have a beer on it. <laughs> no, thanks. Just the same. I'm serious. Plenty on ice downstairs. Besides, we have something else to talk about. We do? Pull up a box and take a load off. Well, I haven't started Mrs. Bowles' lawn yet, and it's, it's getting pretty late. Nuts to Mrs. Bowles. Knock off for ten minutes. You need extra money, right? Sure. Same as everybody. I got an idea. What's that? There's a way you can make some more cash on the side. Could add up. How? All you have to do is give me a hand. Do some sorting, get some cardboard boxes. I'm, I'm pretty busy already. Uh, hear me out, at least. Well, ten minutes then. Uh, Mm. Uh, let me make room for you. I can stand. No trouble. I need some help with this junk up here. Anything you see, you can have. Most of it, anyway. Resell it, whatever you want. I just have to get rid of it before I show the house. What do you say? I'm not very good at garage sales. I don't care about that. Never know what you might find. Yeah, I got a lot of clothes, gadgets, old magazines, books my wife and I like to read. I don't know. What's your name, boy? Arthur. Arthur? Arthur Takamuri. Anything wrong with that? No, no, it just it sounds funny. Why? Well, you have to admit, you don't look like an Arthur. I'm an American citizen. Yeah, sure, sure you are. I was born in this country. Who said you were? Uh, did I say that? None so many words. Then take that chip off your shoulder. I gotta go. And what about that beer? No, thanks. I'm not thirsty. Come on, I didn't mean anything. You're awful sensitive. Am I? Maybe I am. There, see? My given name is Ito. I changed it because nobody ever spells it right. So, a rose is a rose. You know what I mean? Not really. Uh, watch your head there, Arthur. The ceiling's pretty low. What a junk pile, huh? I've seen worse. I bet you have. The attic's been this way for 20 years. I don't go up here much. The wife used to yell about it. <laughs> but I was so stubborn. I... Now she's uh, gone to stay with her sister. Or so she says. Wouldn't be surprised if she never comes back. Sorry. Man, nah, don't be. We all get what we deserve. Don't you think? I couldn't say. Well, I could. You ever know something before you know it? How do you mean? In your gut, in your bones, the way a dog knows an earthquake's coming, the way the birds get quiet right before a storm. Uh, it doesn't matter what anybody says. It's a fact. It's closing in on you, and there's nothing you can do about it. We always have a choice. 
Doesn't mean a thing. I know it and she knows it. She's got my number, all right. A guy who's never going to amount to a hill of beans. And he's drowning in junk. I'm sure these things meant a lot to you. Or you wouldn't have saved them. What else could I do? It's all I got. I couldn't just let it go. Even stuff from the war. Uh, you see that mannequin in the corner? Was that your uniform? Sure was. Get a load of it. Used to be pretty spiffy. <laughs> I'll bet. Don't mind the dust. Yeah, I put this on and people would step out of the way. Even when I got home. My dress cap, brass buttons, like they thought I was a movie star. My girl was proud to go out with me to the movies, to get an ice cream, and just to walk around. I was a war hero. But after a while, um, that didn't cut it anymore. You ought to pack it away, put it in mothballs. What for? I'll never wear it again. Hard to imagine this monkey suit used to fit me to a T, with all the buttons and everything. It probably still would. No, you're being polite. I turned into a tub of rancid lard, I know that. But I was pretty tough once. Where are you? I went all through Saipan and Okinawa. Oh. Check the fruit salad. The what? Uh, that's what they call the ribbons and medals. I got a whole box of them from this and that campaign. All put away. I don't know what for. Never wear them again as long as I live. I don't know much about the war. No? It's before my time. Hmm. Yeah. You ever see one of these? Yeah, in the movies. A genuine samurai sword. Not a fake like you see nowadays. I took it from a Jap who was trying to cut off my noggin. A what? Oh, uh, excuse me, a Japanese officer. You see the blade? Got something engraved on it. Mm-hmm. Hey, you think you could translate it for me? Could I? Well, I can't read it. I always wonder what it means. Sorry to disappoint you. Why? I don't know the language. You don't? Only English. Oh, come on, boy. My mother used to speak Japanese around the house when I was little, but I never learned. That a fact. You said you wanted help with this junk? Oh, yeah. Uh, but first, uh, let me get those beers. None for me. Well, I need one. My throat's full of dust. I can't stay. Be back in a jiffy. Oh, better put that sword away. Uh, the blade's still razor sharp. You! You! Ah. It can't be. I don't know how or why, but I'm gonna kill this man. I'm gonna kill him. I can feel it. I'm gonna kill him. With this sword. Here you go. A whole six pack, nice and cold. And yeah, maybe I, I will have one. Go ahead, you're entitled. I even brought an opener. Thank you. Mm. Always tastes better in glass, don't you think? Yeah, I, 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 guess, I guess so. You partial to beer, you know? American beer, I mean. The name's Arthur. Oh, yeah, I forgot. It's just, when I look at you, I don't think Arthur, you understand? You don't look like much of a soldier, either. Oh. Huh. You got me there, boy. You sure do. And while you're at it, Mr. Fenton, I don't like to be called boy. Europeans always call the natives boy and moan about the white man's burden. Hey, now, simmer down. The fact is, I'm a full-grown man, I work for a living, and the name I answer to is Arthur, or Artie, to my friends. And once in a while, believe it or not, to Mr. Takamuri. Man, are you wound up? Do this every time a guy offers you a beer? Sorry, nothing personal. No, it sure isn't. I just wanted to set the record straight so we understand each other. I get tired of being treated like I'm... like I'm different. Let's forget it. The war's over. Yes, it is. 
And in case you don't know it, there isn't a serviceman who saw combat in the Pacific and doesn't respect the Japanese army. They fought like tigers. Well, that's what soldiers do. Fight when there's a war. It was a rare thing to take them alive. They just wouldn't give up. Is that supposed to be a backhanded compliment? I guess it is. Well, here's the bravery. Bantai. <clears throat> okay, okay. I get it. Say, uh, where did I put that pig sticker? What? The sword. I put it back in the holder, like you said. Then I set it on those, um, those National Geographics. Well, it's not there now. Well, maybe it slipped down. Not that I can see. Funny if it got lost. I've been trying to lose it for years. I never could, though. Why would you want to do that? Oh, this thing gives me the willies. I should have left it instead of taking it as a souvenir, you know what I mean? Maybe you should have. I tried to sell it, hawk it, give it away, even throw it out in the trash. Each time it, uh, it comes back. I suppose you're going to tell me it's haunted. No, I don't believe in that jazz. But when people refuse it, even as a gift, and when the man on the garbage truck leave it, well, you give up after a while. Say, why don't you take it? <laughs> I don't think so. Why not? What would I do with it? Well, you could frame it, put it on the wall, sell it, or you could always give it back to me. Point first, if that's what you'd like to do. I don't know what you're talking about. No, I'm just kidding. Anyway, I don't blame you for not wanting it. It's a pretty ugly thing. Not really. Sure it is, if you think about it, especially with what's engraved on the blade. I thought you couldn't read it. I can't, but I like to imagine. I always thought it said something real poetic, like, this sword will avenge me. What do you think? I wouldn't know. Oh, come off it, Arthur. Look, Mr. Fenton, I'm kind of in a hurry. I work hard and... So what's so special about working for a living? You said that twice. Don't you think I work for a living? I didn't say... I've worked since I was a kid, and I had jobs a lot tougher than cutting grass. I used to drive a cat. You know what a cat is, Arthur? It's no sports car, let me tell you. It's a big earth mover. <laughs> you ever move the earth, Arthur? No, of course not. You manicure it. I've got to get going. What's the rush? Drink your beer. Just tell me where you hid the sword. Where I... You buried it in here somewhere, didn't you, when I was gone? You're crazy. To get it out of the way. For what reason? Oh, I don't know. It could be dangerous in the wrong hands. Whose? Mine or yours? I left the sword with you next to this stack of magazines. I remember distinctly. Uh, tell me something, Ido. I mean, Arthur. You don't seem very relaxed. Are you, by any chance, afraid of me? <laughs> Why should I be? Oh, I can think of a few reasons. Such as? Well, my background, for one. What's so special about that? Because I was a soldier. So were a lot of people. Really, there's no point in talking about it now, is there? I was in a fighting outfit. You know what that means? It's not like the recruiting posters, let me tell you. Pictures of a nice, clean-cut kid helping little old ladies cross the street, starting fires by rubbing two Boy Scouts together. A soldier like that wouldn't last one night on the beach or in a foxhole. A real soldier is a highly trained machine, made for one purpose, combat. Split-second reactions in place of emotions. He's on a high wire, always on his toes. His nerve ends are dead, and he's as cold and hard as this helmet, like this one right here. Saw me through plenty. Yeah, it still fits. It always will. Like it's a part of me, the part that survived. He doesn't feel anything. Funny thing is, he doesn't even hate anymore. He can kill without hating. He'd better. It takes time to hate, see? They don't talk about that at home. But he's really something to fear. In fact, nothing, nothing is more terrible to meet on a dark night than a trained U.S. soldier with an M1, a Thompson, a grenade, a trench knife with brass knucks or his bare hands. Yank! Come out and die! Some dirty little son of heaven was out there in the jungle just asking for it, so I thought I'd oblige. I started circling wide to get behind him. Yes. Yes, it was night. A, a very dark night. It was a simple exercise, basic training. All it took was someone with more luck than brains. Yank! Yank! Over here! Come 
I kept moving. Then I saw something. It was the machine gun nest. They had a great position up high behind the trees. So I stayed low and headed around the side. But before I got there... You! No more, Yank. Now you die. Go on. Do it. Do it, you dirty little... No, wait. Stop. Stop! What? Put the sword down. It was only a story. A story, yes. Don't get carried away. I, I was only telling you how it was. Uh, I'm... Uh, I'm sorry. Uh, man, for a minute there. Uh, man, for a minute there. I, I don't know what got into me. Where'd you find it? What? The sword. It, um, it must have slipped down behind the trunk. All of a sudden, I, I saw it and... You handled it like you were gonna prune a tree. Good thing you hesitated. That officer I was telling you about, he would have gotten me for sure. Yes. I know. What do you mean by that? Something tells me you didn't get that sword the way you said you did. No? No. You shot him after he surrendered. What? The Japanese officer? He dropped the sword and surrendered. You killed him in cold blood. All right, so what if I did? So what? I don't know. That's your problem. I, um... I don't feel well. Um, what am I doing here? I've got to get out of here. Yeah, maybe you should. The door's stuck. You must be off a week. Pull. <clears throat> It won't move. Did you lock it? How could I? There's no lock on the inside. Uh, here, let me try. I'll pull with you. I, uh, I guess you're not supposed to leave just yet. What do you mean? Uh, if I knew, I'd tell you, but I don't. I don't understand any of this, but I'd say we're locked in here together, just the two of us, for better or worse, till death do us part. Still stuck. I'll try the window. Just our luck, that won't open either. You're right. I don't know what's making it to this. It hasn't happened before. Uh, never mind, there must be some tools up here. I can take the hinges off. Yeah, you do that. Ah, forget the window, it's too high up to climb out. Of course, we could break the glass and yell for help, but that'll be a last resort. Uh, see if you can find a screwdriver. I wouldn't know where to look. What are you doing with that sword now? Don't worry. I'm only looking at it. Thinking about becoming a samurai? Couldn't I? If you ever come at me with that thing again, I'll chop you up like hamburger. I don't like that kind of talk, Mr. Fenton. Oh, you don't, huh? No, I've got a short fuse. So don't strike matches. A short fuse, huh? From what, kid? Too much sake in your oatmeal? I was born in Honolulu. Near Pearl Harbor. No kidding. Were you one of the pilots? I was four years old. My parents lived in Hawaii all their lives. My father worked for the Navy as a civilian contractor. Yeah? Doing what? Sabotaging the planes? He helped build the docks of Pearl. He was foreman of a construction gang. Almost a genuine war hero. He was a war hero. He was on the docks when they came that Sunday morning. He was there when the first wave of bombers flew over. Standing there, watching men that looked like him, destroying what he built with his own hands. The plane circled overhead. I stood on the hillside where we lived and looked up at the sky and, and uh, saw them. And my mother held my hand and tried to make me run inside the house, but I... 
But I stood and watched the airplanes. While down below at the harbor, my... My father tried to warn the sailors. Tried to tell the men on the ships what was happening. But the bombers came anyway, and I could hear the... Boom. 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 As the bombs exploded, and I could see the smoke, and my mother was crying. My father was yelling to warn the sailors, yelling for them to fire back, and... The Navy gave him a medal, posthumously. He was a hero, a great hero. That's some story. My mother and I were shipped to California one year later. We were placed in a relocation center. Yeah, I heard about those. Do you know what a relocation center is, Mr. Fenton? It's a fancy name for a concentration camp. That's where I grew up. In a stinking concentration camp, especially reserved for American citizen who happen to have slanted eyes and yellow skin. That's what the son of a hero got, Mr. Fenton. Sometimes I think, I think they should have dropped more bombs. Easy, kid. I'm such a liar. What? We all are sometimes. Don't be so hard on yourself. It didn't happen that way. Oh, come on. It was a traitor. He signaled the planes. He, uh... He showed them where to drop the bombs. Do you hear what I'm saying? My old man was a traitor. Here, you need this. I gotta get out. Sure you do. The whole thing's stupid, isn't it? You come up here to make a few bucks and I ask you to have a beer because... Well, if you want to know, I was kind of lonesome. You see, the wife got a little teed off at me before she left. But she'll be back. Wait and see. I guess maybe she's right. I, I do drink too much. You married, Arthur? No, I guess not. You know, you guys are way ahead of us as far as women are concerned. You really know how to treat them. It's an ever-loving fact. I saw it with my own eyes over there. And Sonny... That's one part of Japan culture we could use. We give our women too much freedom, see? I mean, too much status. And what do they do with it? They kick us when we're down. That's what they do with it. Look, Arthur, you're a pretty nice show. I could tell that right away. That's why I asked you to stay for a couple of beers so I could admit to you, man to man, that it's been rough lately. The truth is I didn't retire. They canned me from the job. That's right, they put somebody else on the cat. Can you imagine that? Just because of a few lousy drinks? Why, Arthur, I've been driving that thing around since the war, slicing crummy lots for crummy houses out of the crummy hills. It wasn't the booze, that was just an excuse. It's the cheap labor they're getting nowadays. We let them in from everywhere, Mexico, Puerto Rico, foreigners. We, we make Hawaii a state and what do we get? A lot of... A lot of what? Say it. Oh, no offense to you, Arthur. You're different, 100% American, born here and everything. Not like you're, like you're old man. I'm talking about those others who'll be trying to snatch your job, too. One fine morning, you'll show up and find some gook at work in your flowers, clipping your hedges, mowing your lawns, taking the bread right out of your mouth, and it won't matter if you're sober or not. They'll work a lot cheaper. So you've had it, buddy boy. Ooh, but I'm getting off the subject. Uh, the wife. Like I say, she went to her sister's, said we were all washed up. Can you beat that? That's gratitude for you. But never mind, she'll be back. She knows which side her bread's buttered on, and if she doesn't come back, who needs her? A man can make it alone, Arthur. Women are a dime a dozen. Anyone who's ever been to the Orient knows that. You're awful quiet, Arthur. Still holding on to that sword, huh? What's the matter, Arthur? Or do you want me to call you Ido now? I have nothing to say. 
Listen, don't take it so hard. I mean, just because your old man was a sneaky little double-dealing traitor doesn't mean you are. I mean, what the hell? You don't have to go and change your name and all and forget you know how to speak Japanese. There are plenty of sneaks and double-crossers on both sides. Like you! Hold it. Hold it right there, buddy. You were no better. You were a murderer. You killed a defenseless man. Now take it easy. What happened on Okinawa? Well, you can't blame me. You know we had orders not to take any prisoners. That's right. No prisoners, they said. Seems the little monkeys were coming in with their hands behind their heads and grenades in their loincloths. And they'd pitch them at you without the slightest hesitation the first chance they got. The kamikaze philosophy. So, no prisoners. That was the order, straight from topside. You had your philosophy, too. You can't hold a man responsible for obeying orders, can you? You get shot in wartime for having a mind of your own. Follow orders if you want to stay alive. Oh, yeah, I know, those Nazi generals in Nuremberg. You're gonna bring that up. Well, let's face it, they had a point. They were ordered to do what they did, and they had to obey. The oldest offense in the world. So, who's guilty of what? Think about it. Where does it begin and where does it end? In the Pacific, we were told you people were some species of ape, not even human. So we shouldn't worry about burning you out of caves. Today, all of a sudden, you're fine people, highly cultured, and it was all propaganda about your lousy transistor radios. Is that all we represent to you? Come on, Arthur, put down the sword and let's have another beer. Stay where you are. I don't like to drink alone. And I'll tell you the truth, I'm a little shaky today. Last night, I put away a fifth of scotch. Can't hold your liquor, huh? Arthur, Arthur, don't you get it? The wife up and left me. I'm all alone now. And yesterday, when I called about getting my job back, the foreman hung up on me. I'm not a bad guy, Arthur. Why is all this happening to me? All right, don't answer. Kill me if that's what you're here for. Go ahead, I dare you. What's that? A judo pose? I told you I'm a trained soldier. Okay, Ido, come on. I'm waiting for you. You're ridiculous. Oh, so that's it. You're trying to scare me. So all right, I'm scared, but not a dying, of living. I can't make it anymore, Ido, or Arthur, or whatever your name is. There's nothing left, nothing. I got a box full of decorations for killing highly cultured people. And I've been pushed and pulled this way and that till I hate everyone in the world who's not the same as me. Look, I'll prove it. Come and get your beer, you dirty little chap. Why, you? Just bring it. I'm ready for you. Ah! Like that, huh? Huh? Ah. Judo nothing. Ah. Old American beating. Stand up and take it. Oh, you can't, huh? Well, here, I'll finish the job for you with a razor-sharp samurai sword. You don't have the guts. No? No? No. Let go of it! Pick up the sword! Pick it up! Where is it? You gonna keep holding on to it? Roll over! Let's see what... Fenton? Fenton? What happened? What have you done? What have I done? How do you know? It really is you. Mr. Fenton. Uh, I'll call an ambulance. Uh, it's too late. It went clean through me. What do you want me to do? Pull it out. Pull it out. <clears throat> oh, that's better. I didn't want to kill anybody. I was just trying to make a point. Oh, my God. Oh, my dear God. Mrs. Pratt? Mr. Fenton, is Arthur in there with you? Mr. Fenton?
Two men in an attic, locked in a mortal embrace. Their common bond and their common enemy? Guilt. A disease all too common among men, both in and out of the Twilight Zone. Starring Stacey Keach and Byron Mann was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Montgomery Pittman. Heard in the cast were Linda Ryder and Ilyssa Fraden. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. begin. Recording. Act two, scene one. We open on a wide valley, the Alps in the background, as a ragtag army of men in brass helmets descend, followed by a bunch of elephants. In the foreground is their leader, Hannibal. Make that a herd of elephants. No, no, strike that. A thundering herd of elephants. Next shot. <sighs> I need a drink. I say, I need... Oh. Yes? Greg? Uh, <clears throat> you have reached the home of Gregory West. At the tone, Cut it please out, leave... West. I know you're there. For one thing, you don't have an answering machine. For another, I can hear you sweating. Hello, Sammy. You know what day it is? It's Monday. You were supposed to have the script on my desk this afternoon. Mm, oh, that, yes. Um, my typist is running a little behind schedule. Your typist? Well, you know I don't use a typewriter. Well, so get a word processor or a laptop. Never. Dictation is the only way. Helps me get the dialogue right. What's your number? Hmm? Who? Your typist. I'll send a messenger. Not until I have a chance to look it over. Make any last-minute corrections. The network wants pages, Greg. They don't have to be Perfect. Just give me a couple of more days. I can't stall them much longer. They want to shoot Hannibal's animals in the spring. Well, they doubt me? They doubt their own grandmother if they had her under contract. They've got a lot of writing on this. Well, you tell them I'm not some Hollywood hack. I'm a legitimate writer. They're lucky to have my services. And you're lucky to have a six-figure deal. This isn't Broadway. It's TV. And you've got a mortgage to pay off. I'm aware of that, Sammy. Oh, I shouldn't have answered the phone. One time I do. Is it Harold Prince? Hmm? Is it the Theatre Guild? No, it's my agent with dialogue out of a Bud Schulberg novel. Bud who? Look, the script will be ready when it's ready. Do they want it fast or do they want it good? Hmm? Ask them that, would you please? They want it tomorrow. That's what they want. I'm telling Bye, you. Bye, Sammy. We'll talk in the morning. Oh, my. <laughs> now I do need that drink. Mary, did you hear what I said? Yes, darling? Ah, there you are. I was wondering... Scotch and water? How did you guess? I think I know you by now. Relax, Gregory. You deserve a break. How right you are. 
sit on the couch. I'll massage your temples before you go back to work. Ah, what a fine idea. Is the drink all right? Mmm. Perfect. As always. There. Now close your eyes. Mmm. Doesn't that feel better? I swear, Mary. You have... Oh, magic fingertips. Mmm. The least I can do for such a talented man. That brain of yours must get overheated, working hour after hour, morning till night. I couldn't have said it better myself. Oh, yes, you could. You're a genius with words. I know. Oh, Mary, Mary. Yes, Gregory? Hold me. It would be an honor. Mm. Who's that? Hmm? Outside the window, I thought I saw... No! Gregory! Not Victoria! She... Gregory! She can't be home yet! Gregory! How dare you! The home office of Mr. Gregory West. Noted playwright. And now a resident of the Hollywood Hills. A quiet, thoughtful man, even a bit shy, and at the moment, very happy, despite the fact that he is over deadline. His latest project? A script assignment taken to ensure that his household remains secure, despite the occasional fickleness of drama critics. The other ingredients of that household? There's Mary, warm, affectionate, devoted, the ideal companion for someone who values peace of mind. And the final ingredient, Mrs. Gregory West. In a moment, she's going to learn the secret of her husband's success. A method of creative writing taught only in the Twilight Zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, A World of His Own. Starring Charles Shaughnessy with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Is she gone? Mm, yeah, for the moment. Are you cold? What? The yeah, air. It's, it's chilly this evening. It was. Shall I light the fire? Not if you're with me. You're so lovely. Oh, Gregory. Uh, don't worry just yet. Oh, Mary. Immediately. I'm sorry. Greg, not again. I, I have to, Mary. But why? You don't know what she's capable of. I know you have a woman in there. Open up. No, Greg. What else can I do? I warn you, Gregory. Oh, my. Are you so frightened of her? She can make my life miserable if she chooses. All right, then. If you must. Do you hear me, Gregory? Are you deaf? Uh, be right there. Don't think you can hide her from me. Uh, what's that, dear? Don't think you can let her out the window, either. Gregory! Ah, I thought that was you. Where is she? Hmm? Who, my dear? Not behind the drapes. I, I'm sorry, I, I don't understand. Under the desk? What are you going on about, Victoria? You know perfectly well. I suppose you let her out the window. But the window doesn't open, remember? Then where? Who? You little worm, you know who. What have you I done with her? Know. Where what? did she You're... go? Where? Please, stop. My glasses! A cozy fire. Your smoking jacket. 
Hmm. Oh, only because it's comfortable. You, you know I don't smoke. Of course you don't. In order to smoke, you'd have to heat up. And you've never risen above room temperature. Sit down. Let's... let's talk this over. Have you installed a secret door in here? No, dear. The studies as it's always been. A place of seclusion for my work. For your work. For monkey business, you mean. What are you doing? I'm arranging my notes. Notes? Those are tapes. Well, oh, you know I prefer to dictate, dear. I'm not your dear anymore, you... libertine. Who's a libertine? Do you intend to stand there and deny it? <laughs> deny what? That you had a woman in here. Victoria, I never meant Liar. To... Cheat. Fraud. Victoria! If you force me to do it, Gregory, I'll have this room torn down. Panel by panel, board by board. Why? Don't toy with me. Oh, who's toying? Then you must think I'm handicapped. What? Lacking in all my faculties. The vital functions, like sight. You think I'm blind? Of course I don't. Then how can you refuse to admit it? I stood outside that window and saw the two of you on that sofa there. <laughs> don't. <laughs> Zip it. Shall I describe her to you, Gregory? Her brown hair? The simple black dress? The pearl necklace? How she handed you the drink? If I'm not mistaken, this drink right here. I... I don't recall who made that. You don't? Your private bartender, maybe? In our own home, Gregory. Our own home. That drab, ugly little creature. She's not. Aha! Uh -huh. How was your day, dear? Hmm? You uh, went to a movie, didn't you? Was it a good one? Apparently not. Oh, well, they can't all be works of art. Didn't expect me home so soon, did you? Thought I'd go out to dinner afterwards. I didn't say that. I've had my eye on you for some time now. Oh, how flattering. You thought you fooled me, didn't you? Why, no! You know you can't lie to me. You thought I'd never suspect the real reason you kept sending me away from the house. Have to be alone to work. The famous playwright. Famous philanderer is more like it. You do me an injustice. Oh, do I? All right. Out with it. Who is she? Victoria, dear. Don't you dear me. Ow! And don't touch me. At least try to understand. Oh, I understand perfectly. But you don't. Why don't you enlighten me then? There's no other woman in my life. There certainly isn't. Not anymore. Because you don't have a life. <sighs> How can I explain it to you? That's the question of the evening. How? Well, I'm waiting. I'm a very patient person. I'm not going anywhere. Go ahead. Take your time. Choose your words carefully. Because I intend to report each and every one of them to my lawyer. Now, that won't be necessary. I'll be the judge of that. Victoria. Victoria. All right, then. You recall my play, The Fury of Night, hmm? Do you? The one that made my reputation? It won a Tony Award? Oh, then there was interest from Hollywood and we moved out here? I'm listening. What about it? Well, you remember the character of Philip Wainwright? He was the first character that I was ever really successful with. The critics said he lived on stage, not a, a collection of mannerisms. He, he breathed, he... What's her name? What? Her name. What do you call her? Fifi? Foofy? Or do you just call her whenever you feel like it? Mary, but... Mary! How common. <laughs> She's not common. Oh, you mean she has hidden talents. I'll bet. Does she cater to your every need? Drain off your tensions before they have a chance to build up? Victoria, don't. I'm trying to explain. Then go ahead. I'm all ears. All right. You know I've spoken many times of how fictional characters seem to come to life for me. Such vivid life that they begin to determine their own actions. As the author, I may have some particular lines and moves planned for them, but they simply won't do it. 
they become so strong that they begin to take over the story. I'm not interested in a lecture on writing. You artistic types are all alike, full of mumbo-jumbo about feelings and moonbeams. It's all smoke and mirrors, a cover, a front for self-indulgence, wish fulfillment, laziness. I don't know what you'd do if you had a real job to go to, if your delicate sensibilities could stand up Victoria, to- Victoria, I'm asking you to bear with me. Bear? I've borne you too long. And now it's over. Finny, kaput. Ten four, over and out. Wave bye bye, mark it and strike it. But this is important. Philip Wainwright. He was the first one of my characters ever to behave like this. Like what? Like you? With a complete lack of morals? With duplicitousness? Duplicity? What? The, the word is duplicity. Is it? Well, I've got a word for you. No, I must finish this, so please don't interrupt. Now, no matter what I tried to make him do in the service of the story, he balked, flatly refused to take direction, wouldn't accept my choices any longer. This is ridiculous. He was real, alive, do you hear? Alive, with a, a will all his own. We're off the subject. No, we're not. This is the subject. Philip Wainwright was alive, so much so that one night while I was working right here in my office, he came walking in through the door. My God, you're delusional. Victoria, believe me, he did. He walked right in and, and took a chair in front of the fireplace, a real flesh and blood man. Not just words anymore. And I had created him. What are you doing? I think psychiatry is next on the agenda. No, put the phone down. I'm telling you the truth, Victoria. Characters from my plays began to come to life. I saw them. I talked with them. I shook their hands. And made love to them? Yes! I, I mean, no! You want me to put the phone down? How's this? Right on your fingers. Ow! Get out of my way. Look, hear me out. You know how I work, how I dictate my dialogue and descriptions into the tape recorder. The lazy man's way to riches. I can describe any character at all into it, and, and now, if I do it well enough, truly enough, the character will come to life. Real life, Victoria. <sighs> Listen to yourself. They don't even have to be characters in my scripts anymore. They can be any kind of characters I want. You belong in an asylum. You told me that you saw Mary in here, didn't you? Oh, I saw her. Then how did she leave? I don't know. But I trust my own eyes before I trust you. Well, think about it. She didn't use the window. I and you know very well that there's no secret door in here. The magician reveals the tricks of the trade. I'll tell you how she left. Because I want you to understand. Look in the fireplace. The what? The grating. Go ahead, look. I'm supposed to believe that she went up the chimney? Well, in a sense. Uh, but not the way you mean. Here, here I'll show you. See this? What is it? A melted cassette tape. Is that what you do with your so-called notes? Burn them? Only on occasion. When I have to get rid of something in a hurry, or someone. The tape I had recorded her on, I threw it into the fire just before you entered the study, and she was gone. Poof! Just like that. Uncreated. Look, if you'll come over here, you can see what... I've heard enough. Wait! I'm leaving. I'm telling you the truth. Get out of my way. Where are you going? I'm going to have you committed. You, look, you've got to believe me, Victoria. What do you think you're doing? Trying to save our marriage. By locking the door? Don't waste your time. It's so simple. Look, I could describe a cat or a dog or any kind of character you wanted. Uh, but I assume you'd rather see Mary. 
Besides, I've created her so often that she's readily available. Oh, is she? Give me that key. No, not yet. Recording. Uh, her name is Mary. She's 36, 5 foot 3 inches tall, simply built, brown hair, fair complexion. The key. On the surface, now. a plain, quite ordinary female, yet with that quality of inner loveliness which gives her woman real beauty. If you won't give it to a, me, I'll a take tender, it. A gentlewoman, an understanding woman. As she wears a simple black dress, a single strand of pearls at her throat. I'm warning very you. Very little makeup, her hair arranged simply. There. She's coming up I've the front walk it. now. She's crossing the porch. She's opening the front door. Greg, someone's in the house. Closing it? Walking down the hall? Who? Good evening, Mrs. West. Well? She... She's real. How did you do that? Do what? Bring her here. On cue. Don't you understand? I described her on the tape. <laughs> you heard me. But why, Greg? Why do you bring me here now? Because... Uh, it's a bit tricky to explain. Try. Uh, come in, Mary. Thank you. I'd love to. She asked you a question. I'm trying to think of the best way to put it. Uh, g give me a moment, Mary. You do know each other. Oh, yes. Your husband's a wonderful man. What do you want here? There's nothing to be afraid of, Mrs. West. I'm here because it's Gregory's wish. It's not mine to doubt him. Doubt him? You mean you don't? I'm sure he has his reasons. There. See? Well, Victoria? Do you believe me now? This is some kind of plot. You did let her out of here through a secret door somewhere. Behind the bookcase? I'll find it. Then you tell me some fool story about... about characters who come to life and walk around as big as you please. It's not a plot, I assure you. Not a very clever one, that's obvious. You lock the door and pretend to make her real. And she slips around from the backyard and comes in through the front door and tries to make me think oh, she's... Oh, no. That's not what happened. Not at all. I swear. You're trying to drive me insane. You want to have me committed. <laughs> I only did it because you said you were gonna have me committed. Oh, no. You want to get rid of me so you'll have our property all to yourself. So you can share it with this... this... Nothing of the kind. I, I only wanted to show you. Yeah, it, it's a demonstration. Greg? Mm, what, what is it? Is that why you brought me here? Not because you wanted to see me, but only to show her? Uh, Mary, try to understand. I am trying. Only... Victoria's my wife. Not anymore. Not after this diabolic conspiracy. Oh, come on, Victoria. Can't I do anything right? That's something I've been wondering for years. You haven't answered me, Greg. Answered what? Is that all I am to you? A parlor trick? Something to show off? Go ahead. Lie some more. Victoria, do you honestly believe that? I'm... Yes. And that's the only thing I believe. I hope you two are very happy together. Here we go again. Don't leave because of me. I wouldn't think of it. I'm leaving because of me. Victoria, please! Let go of me! Monster. Very well. I'll claim false imprisonment. In your own house? What are you going to do now? Oh, you'll see. I'll scream. I will. What for? No need. Is that my tape? It is. And you're going to? There's no way around it. Craig, why do you do this to me? I'm sorry, Mary, but what else can I do? But again? I just got here. 
I have no choice. That's all you ever say. Don't you think I'm nice enough? Oh, that isn't it at all. Not loyal? Not interested in your work? Not sensitive to your needs? Not giving enough? No, no, quite the contrary. If you're going to be cruel to her, don't do it because of me. Oh, of course not. Hmm? Wouldn't believe me. Oh, no. Had to make me prove it. Make me force poor Mary to... <sighs> oh, Victoria. Sometimes I wonder. A man has feelings. Feelings that get turned into thoughts, and then into words, and those words go onto paper, and eventually they live, and breathe, and walk, and talk, and strut upon the stage in their petty pace for a paying audience. But you wouldn't know anything about that, would you? Not even after living with me for so many years. I really don't want to do this. If you do... Don't bring me back again, Greg. Mary. Just... don't. I can't stand it any longer. You're a part of me. You know that, don't you? I I'm not speaking figuratively. I give you my word when I say... this hurts me more than it hurts you. I'm so sorry, Mary, but she is my wife. I understand, I suppose. Greg, I feel so strange. What's happening to me? Help me. Greg, help me. Please. What happened to her? She's burning brightly. Where is she? I've told you. But... Where? Oh, don't you believe me yet, Victoria? Where did she go? I uncreated her. No! That poor woman. Come here. It's all right, dear. But... Shh, 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 shh. Hold on to me, if you like. What have you done? It won't happen anymore, I promise you. I'll never do it again. I never would have done it in the first place if I hadn't been so lonely. It's just that... You're so perfect, Victoria. In so many ways. So impeccable. So flawless. You make me feel inferior. Really, Gregory? I, I can't help what I am. Well, maybe not, but that's why I created Mary. I, I didn't do it to insult you. I just wanted a little company, that's all. Someone who wouldn't judge me and find me wanting. Someone... I could talk to, someone I could feel comfortable with, instead of, instead of like a, a worm. You do understand, don't you? This has been a small sacrifice for me, and a giant step for the institution of marriage. What are you doing now? What else can I do? Return to work. Burn the midnight oil. And all for a paycheck. To maintain the lifestyle you so richly deserve. Another tape, another dollar. Ah, we'll work it out, Victoria. You'll see. Somehow we'll work it out. Realize that I'm inadequate compared to you. At least in some ways, it's... Oh, it's my fault. I should have been a pair of claws scuttling across a... Victoria? What do you have there? Got your keys out of your pocket. Well, but I thought... Don't try to stop me. Well, where are you going? To the nearest lawyer. What? 
I'm going to have you put away for the rest of your unnatural life, away from tape recorders. I'm going to live in this house alone from now on, in peace, free of your diseased mind. No, Victoria. Yes, Victoria. Wait. No, wait! I can't let her go. I, I can't. I, 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 I have to stop her. But, but, but how? Recording. Uh, uh a, a giant red-eyed elephant is standing just inside my front door, and he's mad. Uh, he isn't going to let her pass. <laughs> Stay? Yes. What did you say? Yes. I can't hear you. Yes, yes, yes. Very well. Hurry. Just a moment. Gregory. Yes, yes, yes. I can't hold the door. His trunk. He's grabbing my hair. Another second or two. You're mad! Uh, you shouldn't have said those things, Victoria. What things? You'll stay now? You think you can keep me here? You don't want me to do it again, do you? How about a herd this time? No! It's just a simple matter of recording on another tape. Well, I have plenty. I said no. I'll stay for now, Gregory. Good. But I can't promise for how long. No. You think I can live with a madman? I don't know, can you? Oh, Gregory. It doesn't have to be this way. Oh, you're so right. When we met, you were a struggling playwright. Then you had a play off, off Broadway. I was so proud. It moved to Off Broadway, then to the Great White Way. And the reviews. I was so proud. Oh, we were happy then, weren't we? Ecstatic. We were a team. Onward and upward, there was no stopping you. No stopping us. I remember. And then the next play, and the next, it was like a dream. Yes. I could sit up all night listening to you talk about your writing, reading me scenes out loud, and it was wonderful. I wouldn't have had it any other way. Mm. Neither would I. But then, something happened. I'm not sure how or when you began withdrawing from me, living in your head. You shut me out, Gregory. I thought when we moved here, we'd be close again. But the deadlines, the pages, you didn't have time for me anymore. You didn't have time for a wife. Well, I'm truly sorry for that, Victoria. But, but I think we can salvage it, don't you? Start fresh as soon as I finish the script. And will we move back to New York? Well, I... I don't see how we can afford to. Broadway isn't what it used to be. Nothing but revivals and musicals now. This is where the money is. Our future is here. What future? Well, if Hannibal's Animals gets good numbers, I'll be flooded with offers. But what I, what I really want to do is produce. Sammy says that's where the real money is. We'll form a production company, get some pilots going, and well, by this time next year, he should be sitting pretty. We'll move to a bigger house with a, a pool, and I'll have every room wired for sound with hidden recorders. That way I can dictate no matter where I am. And after a while, I won't have to write at all. My characters will do the work for me. I'll straighten their collars, wash behind their ears, and send them out into the world to make me famous. <laughs> Can you see the future, Victoria? <laughs> Can you? Thank you, Gregory. For what? I can see the future. What it would be like with you. And now I know I was right. 
You are insane. <laughs> oh, come now. The first chance I get, I'll have you in a padded cell. Believe it, Gregory. <sighs> I do. Well, I guess that's it. How long have you had a safe in the wall? This one? Well, only since we moved here. Before that, I had a safe deposit box. From the time we were married. What's in the envelope? Hmm? Oh, see for yourself. It has my name written on it. Victoria West. That's right. What's this supposed to mean? Well, I'll show you. A cassette tape. Your tape. What do you mean, my tape? Shall I put it back for safekeeping, Victoria? Or shall I burn it? Hmm? Which would it be? You wouldn't. Uh, the choice is yours. You want me to believe... Oh, I'm telling you, Victoria. As if I had to. Well, look at yourself, hmm? Regal, beautiful... You could have had any man you wanted. H haven't you ever wondered how you got stuck with me? That's absurd. I know who I am. I have a lifetime of memories. Oh, I know you do. I gave them to you myself. It's all here on the tape. Didn't I just tell you you're impeccable? Hmm? Flawless? Exactly the sort of wife that I... I used to think I wanted more than anything else in the world. This is another of your tricks. Why do you suppose I was so upset when you came back before, hmm? No, not because of Mary, but because it was the first time you'd ever come back against my will. The first time... Do you think you're frightening me? No. No, I guess not. You're beyond that, aren't you? I made you too strong. <laughs> I forgot to give you human frailty. Well, I guess I deserve it. It's what I asked for. I'll put it back in the safe. Give me that. Oh, you want to be careful, Victoria. Very, very careful. You tedious little bore. How could I ever have believed I loved you? Here's what I think of your childish trick. Victoria! Do, do you know what you've done? I feel... strange. Well, I, I, I'm sure you do. It, it's too late. I can't pull it out of the fire. I think I'd like to lie down. You don't, don't mean to tell me. It's true. No. No, oh, it can't be true. Do you... No. Gregory... Victoria! Vic oh. I told her. I told her. Oh, why wouldn't she listen to me? Her name is Victoria West. She... Huh. Better to leave well enough alone. Recording. Hmm. Her name is Mary. Mrs. Mary West. She's... 36, 5 foot 3 inches tall, slimly built, brown hair, fair complexion. On the surface, a plain, quite ordinary female, yet with that quality of inner loveliness which gives a woman real beauty. A tender, gentle woman. Just now she's coming into her husband's study. Hello, Gregory. There you are. What do you have, darling? Mm, oh, nothing, really. A tape recorder. One of the tools of my trade. 
Will you show me how it works someday? Oh, I, I don't think it would interest you. <laughs> oh, it's, it's of no importance. Nah, no importance at all. Is the drink all right? Mm. Perfect. As always. Oh, Gregory. Mr. Gregory West, still shy, quiet, very happy, and apparently in complete control of the Twilight Zone. Starring Charles Shaughnessy with Stacey Keach as your narrator was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and written for The Twilight Zone by Richard Matheson. Heard in the cast were Linda Ryder, Alyssa Fraden, and Doug James. The producers of The Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises and the Rod Serling Estate for making this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for The Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about The Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. Unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension. A dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. Here we have the famous temptress from ancient Egypt, Cleopatra. Her beauty almost brought about the destruction of Caesar, Mark Anthony, and the Roman Empire. And now, if you will follow me, the last group of figures in our little wax museum, the piece de resistance, if I may say so, the most infamous black-hearted killers of all time. This is not for the faint of heart, so <laughs> if there are any who would prefer to stay behind... I don't like this place. Come on, honey. They're made out of wax. But... No? Very well, then. Feast your eyes upon... Jack the Ripper, Henri Landru, and the dreaded Burke and Hare. It's Burke who's smothering the poor lady with a pillow, while Mr. Hare assists by holding her feet to the bed. And last but not least, in the sailor's garb, Albert Hicks, about to sink his gleaming axe into the skull of his hapless victim, one Martin Sinescu. Move in, please. They look so real. Closer. Closer. But not too close. <laughs> Allow me to introduce Mr. Sonescu, the curator of Murderer's Row. Thank you. Thank you. I'm sorry if I startled you. Uh, I, I thought he was one of the dummies. Oh, nothing to be afraid of. Perhaps not, young man. But who can tell? What evil lurks in the heart of the man standing next to you? Go ahead, Martin. Introduce your friends. With pleasure. Albert W. Hicks, mate on the oyster smack E.A. Johnson, a gentleman. Yet one day, in 1860, off the Atlantic coast, he murdered everyone in his crew with an axe exactly like this one. Why 
Why did he go mad? I'm afraid we'll never know. Not to mention, Burke and Hare, two more monsters of their time. But do they look like monsters? What torment drove them so late in life to behave like ghouls? You see here how they suffocated their victims. A technique called burking. Think of the agonies they endured. Which one's he talking about? Search me. Both of them, sir. All of them. Surely it's dreadful to be murdered, as our victim here would tell you, if she could talk. But to commit murder, to take a life with your own hands, again and again, and not be able to stop yourself. Can you begin to imagine the horror? No, nope, but uh, why don't you tell us about it? <laughs> I wish I could. But somewhere in the world, now, at this very moment, there is someone who can. Yeah? Who? Well, no one knows yet. But if his torment is great enough, and he kills as these poor creatures did, then future generations will know, for he will end up here, immortalized in wax, remembered as you and I will never be, like Henri Landru, so filled with love and hate. He loved nearly 300 women in his lifetime, spinsters and lonely widows. He too must have felt agony as he strangled the life out of them. A master of the garret, identical to the one you see in his hands. That looks like some kind of cord. That's just a piece of string. Let me see that. Get away from there. Get away from there. I was only... Mr. Sinescu is right. The figures are not to be touched. They are too rare and valuable. <laughs> Besides, the museum can't be held responsible for what might happen to you. And here, another soul in torment, the Ripper himself. Of all the faces in London's Whitechapel district, which was his? And why did he feel driven to kill those pathetic drabs with one sweep of his knife? Identical to the blade you see before you. Step closer, young lady. What? Go on. It's only a prop. Lean forward. There. It's quite all right. Look deep into his eyes and remember them so you'll never fall prey to such a man yourself. A man who carried a long, sharp weapon which he slashed across women's throats like this. That knife, it swung at me. It almost... A spring in the arm. Pretty good trick. A trick, yes. But one that serves to remind us how near death is to all of us. When we look at Hicks, at Burke, and Hare, at Landru and the Ripper, we see what appear to be ordinary men. What devils push them to their bloody fate? We can only guess. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you, Mr. Sinescu. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our tour of Ferguson's Museum. Exit to your right, please. Mr. Martin Sinescu, a gentleman and the curator of Murderer's Row in Ferguson's Wax Museum. He looks after these replicas with care and dedication, and he ponders why ordinary men are driven to commit mass murder. What Mr. Sinescu does not know is that the groundwork has already been laid for a special kind of madness, a torment found only in the twilight zone. And now, the Twilight Zone and our story, The New Exhibit, starring Joe B. Cerny with Stacy Keach as your narrator. There now, Mr. Landrew. Collar turned up just so. 
Easy to see why you're a real lady killer. We have to do something about that suit. <clears throat> uh, Martin? Y yes, Mr. Ferguson? I'd um, like to talk to you. All right. I'll be through here in a moment. That can wait. Uh, what I have to say to you is rather important. You know, sir, I, I think Landru needs a new suit. This one is ten years old and shows it. Something wrong, Mr. Ferguson? Well, yes and, and no. I, I think we'd better discuss it in my office. All right, if you like, sir. Mm. Is it something I've done or haven't done? No, no, nothing like that. Uh, sit down. Uh, very well. Martin, I'm abandoning the museum. Ab abandoning? I'm afraid so. Uh, is this a joke, sir? No. But, but you can't. You mustn't, sir. I know how you feel, Martin, but there isn't any choice. I, I don't understand. I've been offered a large sum of money for this property. Some people want to build a supermarket here. A supermarket? When I first opened the museum 30 years ago, I'd never dreamed I'd see this day. But the day is here, Martin, and we will just have to face it. Thirty years, sir. No, no, for heaven's sake, don't make it more difficult than it is. I'm sorry. I hate this, Martin. You're the best employee a man could have. The way you've run the Murderer's Row exhibit, why, I, I don't think you ever missed a day's work. No, never. How many more days? None. This was the last. They start wrecking the building next week. What about the wax figures? I haven't decided yet. <gasps> Sir, we can open another museum. We'll move everything somewhere else. I'm not as young as I once was. I could use a rest. But, sir, I'll, I'll do all the work. You won't have to lift a finger. I appreciate that, Martin, but it would be foolish. Foolish? Foolish? Why? We have become passé. People aren't interested in wax museums anymore. Look at the numbers. It's all here. Our attendance figures, our profits, but mostly our losses. This year has been the poorest of all. There's even a news story about the closing of the Grand Guignol. Surely not. The handwriting's on the wall. Seriously, what do we offer? The great lovers of history? The discovery room? Scientists? That isn't why people came here. That isn't why at all. What they really came to see was your murderer's row. We've always known that, but they've been coming in decreasing numbers. And do you know why? Because the evening news offers them fears we could never match. The wars, the atrocities, the perversions, they've all ruined our chamber of horrors. People are blasé. They think they've outgrown the need to be frightened. They already live in fear day in, day out. It's the world, Martin, and the world has changed. No, it would be foolish to open another museum. Maybe it's the location or, or the exhibits. Remember how people came after we installed the Ripper's arm with the knife and the spring mechanism? That was years ago. They're simply not interested anymore. But what's going to happen to them? Landru and Hicks and the others? If I could sell them, I would. But there is no market for wax figures. Mr. Ferguson... You're not thinking of destroying them, are you? I mean, they were meant to live forever. Martin, I tell you, I don't know what I'm going to do. You're forgetting something. Come with me. Martin. Look at Landru. His eyes. Don't you see the shy, frightened little choir boy he once was? The bookkeeper who so longed for freedom. Of, of course, but... Even the cheek feels real, like flesh with pores and the mouth. Isn't it about to say something? Oh, Landru was an elegant man, full of tenderness. It's right here in the lips. The way... What are you trying to say? Mr. Ferguson... You seem to have forgotten that these figures are the work of the great Henry Gilmond, the only ones he created outside of Europe. I haven't forgotten. There was genius in everything he did. 
They're not just so much candle wax. It's as though they were alive. I'm afraid it doesn't make any difference now. I don't think I could stand it if these figures were destroyed. It would be... It would be like losing five close friends. I won't destroy them, Martin. I give you my word. But where would I store them? You know how vulnerable they are to changes in temperature. I could take them. You? Yes. What would you do with them? I wouldn't put them in an ugly warehouse. I'll tell you that. They need constant care. I'll put them in my basement. That's ridiculous. Think about it. What would Emma say to having the figures of five famous murderers in her basement? Oh, she wouldn't mind. She rarely goes in the basement. It's my space. She'll understand. I'll put air conditioning down there and a heater for colder days. Oh, you'll see. I'll take care of them, just as I always have. You haven't eaten your breakfast. I'm not hungry. They should have arrived by now. They'll get here when they get here. Now, how long do we have to store them? Not long. What time is it? You asked me that five minutes ago. Oh, maybe something happened. It's not like moving furniture, you know. They should have let me ride in the truck. What if they dropped one of the crates? There they are now. Just relax. You Monsonescu? Yes, are, are, are they all right? The boxes? They okay? They didn't break, right? Nope. No bumps? No bumps. What do you want? Look, uh, carry them to the rear of the house and, and down to the basin. Uh, careful, carefully. Take your time. Well, wait a minute, how much time will it take? I don't know, an hour maybe. You gotta pay by the hour, you know. Sign here. With pleasure, and, and please, hurry. You see? All here, safe and sound. Easy! Please, please, don't jiggle them! Will you stop worrying? It's getting warm. What? I say, it's getting warm outside. They're very delicate. They can't stand more than 80 degrees. I didn't think they were so big. They're not. The boxes are big. The actual figures are not any bigger than you or I. See? Landrew's in the first one. The next is Jack the Ripper. Oh, Emma, I, I, I'm so sorry I got mad. But it's going to be like opening Christmas presents. Mr. Sinesco? Yes? Miller's Appliances. Got your air conditioner in the van. Where do you want it? Oh, good. I'm glad you're here. Look, put it there. There. The basement window. Oh, please. Please hurry. I'll do my best. Thank you. You bought an air conditioner? I had to. They can't stand the heat. How much did it cost? Don't worry about that. Well, I am worried about it. Please. Leave me alone. Just leave me alone with my friends, all right? Now, if you don't mind, I have to go downstairs. Feels cool enough. Now then, gentlemen, Bloody Jack, Jack the Ripper. How are you today? None the worse for where I see? Oh my. Cape's a bit shabby though. Martin, are you down there? Yes, dear. Positively threadbare. Martin! Yes? Are you fussing with the Ripper's cape again? No. Yes. No, no. Uh, it's his hat. His hat is going to need cleaning and blocking before long. I in fact, all their clothes could stand it. It's been almost a year since Mr. Ferguson let me do that. Martin. Emma, li listen to me. The truth is, these men need clothes. 
but the Ripper here. Oh, his are the worst. Part of his coat backs come undone, and, and... Martin! What is it, dear? We're not buying them any clothes. Oh, Emma. Emma, listen. It's not just buying. It's tailoring to fit their bodies. I don't I will... care, Martin. Oh, you don't mean that. Yes, I do. No, you don't. Honestly, Martin, you pay more attention to, to those murderers than you ever did to me. Oh, Emma, listen, that's not true. You practically live down there. <sighs> Emma, they're a trust, a sacred trust. These figures were made by Guillemont. They're masterpieces. All right, so they're masterpieces. But you told me it would only be for a few days. Now, they've been here for weeks. I've been nice about it, Martin. You can't say I haven't. How long is this going to go on? I'm sorry, dear. I, really, I, I didn't lie. I, I thought they'd be here only a little while. I really did. But, well, I, I can't find anybody to finance the museum. How can you find anyone if you spend all your time down there? Well, I phoned, but... But everyone I talk to never even has heard of Henry Guillemont. Can you imagine that? I, I, what's that? The electric bill. You see how much this air conditioner is costing us, running around the clock? Well, you know how hot it's been. Oh, oh my. That is high, isn't it? I'd like to know how we can go on paying it. Martin, there's no more money in the bank. I know, but you mustn't worry. I. I promise you, I'll, I'll think of something. There must be somebody somewhere. Mr. Ferguson. No. Why not? You've told me he loves these things as much as you do. Besides, isn't it up to him to take care of them? Emma, I don't know anyone in the world I respect as much as Mr. Ferguson. And I would never trust these figures to him. I couldn't be sure they were cared for properly. I don't even think I could sleep if if I... So we're stuck with them. Stuck. Emma, it's an honor, a privilege. For you, maybe. But how do you think I feel? I am afraid to go into the basement because of... of these monstrosities. I mean, I just about get a heart attack, Martin. The way they stand there and stare at me. They're frightening. <laughs> They're supposed to be frightening. Live with them as long as I have, and you'll come to love them. <gasps> love them? One day, they cease to be strangers to you, and you want to say good morning to them and ask them how they pass the night. And when that happens, Emma, I tell you... Emma? Emma! Emma, where are you going, Emma? <laughs> so, I just don't know what to do. I mean, we can't borrow any more against the house. That's true. There's no chance for a refi without proof of income. <laughs> And then today, when the electric bill came, I realized we've been spending a fortune just to keep the basement cool. You should have told me about this. I know, but I didn't want to bother you. I'm also your brother, remember? Oh, Dave. If only one of those people would loan him the money to open the museum, everything would be all right. Now, Emma, listen to me. Nobody's going to put money into a crazy scheme like that. Old Ferguson knew what he was doing when he sold out. And he was smart, getting Martin to take care of those dummies. I shouldn't complain. It's just that you know how much he loved his job. And it was such a shock losing it. Do you want me to help? I didn't come here to ask you for a handout. Don't be silly. We're family. And believe it or not, I've always kind of liked the guy. But what's happening now... It sounds like he could use a few hours with a shrink. I can give you the name of a good one. Oh, Dave, he'd never go. Exactly. So what we've got to do is get Martin away from those things. Does he have them all? 
only a few. How come? Ferguson had two or three hundred, didn't he? Yes, but these are special. Some man in Europe made them. Well, they can't be too special if they're not worth anything. They are to him. It's the first time that anything has come between us. I hate those murderers. I'll stop by and talk to him. It won't do any good. Then you talk to him, Emma. But not the way you have before. Lay it on him. Tell him it's those stupid dummies or you. And if that doesn't work, well, there is another way. What? Air conditioners break down. Emma? Emma? Is that you? Where have you been? Do you care? I know you're angry, but what can I do? I have to keep the figures in perfect condition. I can't let them go, or... Where did you get those groceries? I thought you said we didn't have any money left. Dave gave me some cash. Oh, no. Oh, my, oh, my, oh, my. You told your brother. Martin, we can't go on living like this. I'll borrow some money from Mr. Ferguson. Borrowing isn't going to solve anything. Now, Martin, I know what those figures mean to you, but... But what, Emma? What? I simply will not have them in this house one minute longer. Martin, once they're away from here, you'll be a different man. You'll see. You've lived with wax dummies so long, you've forgotten how to be a human being. No, I haven't. What kind of friend do you think I am? I cannot desert them now, not after all these years. They need me. They'd be lost. Martin, they're not alive. They don't need anybody. I want you to see a doctor. What? A doctor? Yes, just once. What do I need a doctor for? Because, Martin, there's something the matter with you. You haven't been yourself lately. Oh. Well, who have I been then? Well, I'm not sure. Somebody I've never known. But, Martin, staying down in the basement all day and talking to those things, honey, it's not natural. I know it's not natural, but it's my job. I'm not the only husband who brings his work home with him. This was your brother's idea, wasn't it? Well, you go back and tell him to mind his own business. So it's hard to know where it's heading. Chances are we're in for another ride tomorrow. And that concludes our broadcast day. This channel will return to the air at 6 a.m. with the early report. Until then, we bid Are you asleep? Good night. God forgive me. It's time for the air conditioner to break. Oh, it's so dark down here and cold. Well, it won't be for much longer. Oh, where's the fuse box? Let's see now. Which one is for the air conditioner? I should have brought a flashlight. I can't see a thing. Here it is. Good. What? Who's there? What's happening? Emma. Where are you? Emma? Emma, are you down in the basement? 
What are you doing? Emma, I asked you not to go down in the basement alone, Emma. I don't want you touching the figures. You leave them to me. Emma. Oh, where's the light switch? Ah, that's better. Emma! 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 Oh, good Lord, what happened? Your throat. For the love of Emma. Who could have, who could have? Oh, you. The Ripper's knife, the blood. Oh, it's all my blood. No. No. I hate to bury you down here, Emma. I know how much you hate the basement, but I don't have any money. I know I should report it to the police. Who would believe me if I told them you had your throat cut by Jack the Ripper? You just bumped into the Ripper in the dark and his spring arm went off. It was an accident. Besides, if I go to prison, who will take care of the figures? It's better this way. <clears throat> they didn't like you, you know. You said some very unkind things about them, and, and they heard you. You have to be careful around Jack. He has such a temper. I should have warned you. <clears throat> there. Now for the cement. Oh, poor Emma. But it's too late to tell her anything now. Yes, man. Come back later. <sighs> All right. Hi, Mr. Snescu. I gotta read the meter. Hey, careful of the cement, it's wet. Oh yeah, doing a little patching, huh? Floor must have been pretty bad. Yes, uh, it was cracking. I had to do the same thing. These old houses, holy mackerel! Something the matter? Woo, for a minute there, I thought they were real. How'd you ever get statues like that? Yes, well, they're wax, actually. From the museum, I'm taking care of them. <laughs> Boy, they're the most realistic things I ever saw. You sure they ain't alive? Well, not altogether. Well, you could have fooled me. Should be a fine thing come Halloween. Something like this will really throw a scare into people. <laughs> man, oh man. Even close up, they... What's this? What? Uh, whoever made these thought of everything. Even put blood on a knife. Well, I gotta go. You've got quite a layout here. Hey, tell me something. Yes? Don't they ever give you the creeps? Not when you know them as well as I do. <laughs> You're a real joker, Mr. Sinescu. Wait till I tell the wife about this. Hey, do you think it'll be all right if I bring her over for a look? No. Um, well, I mean, we're going to be gone. I don't know when we're going to be back. Oh, okay. Well, I'll see you next month. Fine. Goodbye. Best to keep the outside door permanently locked. Jack, I'm surprised at you. I really am. How did you manage all those murders without being caught by Scotland Yard? 
any killer knows you can't leave blood on the murder weapon. And I don't mean to make a joke, Mr. Ripper. It's a dead giveaway. There. Knife's good as new. Now, now behave yourself. Emma? Oh, no. It's her brother. Martin, you in there? Yes, yeah, yes, uh, is that you, Dave? I'm down here. Open the door, will you? I, I, I can't. Why not? I'm painting the stairs. Look, um, uh, give me, give me a second. I'll, I'll go out the cellar door and come in the kitchen. Okay. Where's Emma? Ah, uh, she went out to get some air. Just as well. Mind if I sit down? Why? What do you want? You sit down too. Dave, look, I, 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 I don't have time. I'm, I'm, I'm in the middle of something. Now, just tell me what you want. Emma came to see me yesterday. I'm very embarrassed. She told me about it. She did, huh? Well, uh, that'll make it easier. Perhaps. Oh, you two have an argument? Yes. But look, uh, everything is settled now. Glad to hear it. She was pretty upset when she talked to me. I know. You didn't treat her square when you brought those dummies home. That's been changed. Huh. Well, now, I guess I had you pegged wrong. You got rid of them. Yes. <laughs> Must have been pretty hot in here last night, huh? What? For a bunch of wax dummies. Hey, what's that humming noise? I don't hear anything. It sounds like it's coming from the basement. No, is that the air conditioner? I don't know what you're talking about. What are you driving at? Why is this door locked? I told you, the steps are wet from paint. I don't smell any paint. And why is the air conditioner still going if you got rid of the dummies? Well, I thought it might help the paint dry. Yeah. I thought it might get rid of the fumes. Is that all right? This is my house, isn't it? I think you locked it because you don't want me going down there. You better open up. Are you threatening me in my own house? You didn't get rid of those things at all. Where's Emma? Look, I am tired of answering questions. I've had a busy day. I'll thank you to leave now. All right. I don't want to cause trouble for Emma. So, I'll go. But have Emma call me when she gets back, here. I will. to bed now. Sweet dreams. Good night. Huh. Locked up tight as a drum, huh? And what's so important down there he didn't want me to see? Ugh. Window's too dirty to see in. So, I guess I'll just have to force it open. Ooh, air conditioner's on all right. Cold as a tomb down here. It's so dark. Now, let me light a match. <gasps> oh, a dummy in a sailor suit. 
With an axe? Oh, Martin, old boy, you need help. You really do. Ugh, when you look at these two, plug ugly. And two more big ones. Oh, some knife. Looks real. What the heck? Oh, a shovel? Fresh cement? What is he trying to cover up? Uh, blasted match. Who's there? Who's there? Wait. What the? Are you, where's the axe? going on? Who's here? Hicks. Where's your axe? Dave. Dave. Oh, no. Mr. Hicks. When I took your axe away from you, and put it up in the rafters where you couldn't reach it. I tried to make sure that nothing like this could happen. How did you get it down from there? Why did you take it off the rafter? Martin? Martin! Mr. Ferguson? Mr. Ferguson! Martin, let me in, would you please? Just a moment. Hello, sir. Hello, Martin. Waking you is like raising Lazarus. Don't you answer your doorbell anymore? I, uh, I, I, I was sleeping. Uh, actually, I, I overslept. <laughs> I was, uh, doing a lot of cleanup work in the basement. Hmm. Well, it's nice and cool down there with the air conditioning anyway, right? Yes, sir. How's Murderer's Row? Oh, uh, fine. Fine in, uh, in rare form. Good, let's go see. I would have come two days ago when you first called, but things haven't been finalized yet. What things? Uh, <clears throat> I must say, you've kept him up well. But I, I have done my best. We get along so well. You don't know what a relief it is to see you. They've been threatening to cut off the electricity because I haven't paid the bill. Think what would happen to the figures. Well, you won't have to worry about that anymore. Oh, I, I knew I could count on you, sir. Thank you. But it, it isn't just the electricity. Look at the Ripper's coat. It needs to be fixed. The threads are falling out. Look at all of their clothes. Maybe, maybe it's too humid down here after all. You won't have to worry about that either. Oh, I was going to have Emma repair this little rip in the sleeve, but... You have a remarkable wife. Thank you. There aren't many women who would have put up with an exhibit like this in their basement. She got used to it. You're looking a bit grubby. Have you been sleeping down here? Uh, yes. Oh, I, I, I wanted to show you. I came across an item in this book last night. Martin? I, I, I forgot I even had this. It's got a letter in it written by Landru himself. Martin, listen I'll, to me. I'll read it. But for you whose very walk is beautiful, whose sweet eyes and smile make a just claim to happiness, whither am I bound, my dear little friend, under your tender leadership? Oh, isn't, isn't, isn't that touching? It's the one Landru wrote to Fernand Segre. Ha! Ah, you know it then. He also strangled her as he did all the others. Martin, are you all right? Yes. Well, 
that that isn't that isn't so. I'm 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 not all right. Some strange things have been happening. Strange? Yes. You see, my house guests haven't exactly been behaving themselves. Who? Oh, come on now. It's true. I swear, you have no idea what they've been up to. Martin, you've been so close to these figures for the past three months, you're beginning to imagine things. Oh, no. Oh, no, it was not my imagination. Well, that's neither here nor there now. I can't... I can't keep it from you any longer. What, sir? The best news in the world. Martin, old friend, when I told you nobody would ever want them, I was being pessimistic. The fact is, somebody does, but not just anybody. The Marchand Museum. Did you hear me? Marchands in Brussels. Aren't you pleased? You won't have to take care of them anymore. I want to take care of them. I know you do, and I appreciate what you've done. But it's all signed. You don't mean that you've sold them? Yes, and for what I'm getting, there will be substantial compensation to you for the years you've put in. But my museum? I was going to buy them. You know you could never do that. Say you have another buyer. I'll get the money somehow. Please, Mr. Ferguson, they're all I have left. Martin, time moves on. There's no longer any need for our specialty. I thought with the closing of the Grand Guignol in Paris that things must be the same in Europe. But Marchand's is actually expanding. They were delighted to make an offer. The transaction was consummated only this morning. But what am I going to do without the figures? I'd die without them. Oh, come on now, man. You'll get over it. Why don't you go upstairs and prepare us a cup of tea or something while I take some measurements? The Marchand people want the exact dimensions. <sighs> All right, Mr. Ferguson. If you're sure that that's how you want it. I'm sure. Very well. Very well. Let's see now. Hicks. Six feet, one inch. And broken hair. Hello there, Landru. Still holding your waxed cord, I see. Be with you in a second. Now then, Mr. Hare, five feet, ten inches. What? What? Two cups of tea. Mr. Ferguson, I don't remember whether you take cream and... Mr. Ferguson? Mr. Ferguson! Your throat! The cord! Why? Did you strangle Mr. Ferguson? And the rest of you? I know you didn't have any part in this, but you didn't stop it either. Landru, you have gone too far. You wanted for nothing. I washed you. I cleaned your clothes. I waxed your shoes. The air was 
was always the right temperature because I made it so. I defended your deeds against the thousands who came to see you. And when Mr. Ferguson sold the museum, who spoke up for you? Who wanted you? And now what have you done to repay me? Murdered Mr. Ferguson? He was a good man. The books were right. You are monsters. Through and through, and for that, I am going to punish you. Do you know what I'm gonna do? Do you know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna take my soul. And I am gonna cut you into little pieces. Then I'm gonna turn up the heat and let you melt into pools of wax. It's no more than you deserve. Who's gonna be first? You, Landrew? Cause it was you. Mr. Ferguson. It was not I, Martin Sinescu, who strangled your friend. It was you. No, it was you. You killed him while I was upstairs making tea. No, maid, it was always you. With my blade, you murdered your wife. You killed her. While I was asleep. You used my axe to kill your wife's brother. Get away from me, Ix. Get away from me. You are the murderer. Perk, stay back. You are the murderer. You killed them all. You, you, you lie. You're monsters. Not so, Martin Sinescu. No. <gasps> And here is the latest addition to Marchand's Wax Museum. Murderer's Row. Complete with its newest cast member, Martin Lombard Senescu. A remarkable and most versatile man. Who knows what thoughts went through his mind as he dug the grave for his wife, Emma, whom he killed with a knife. His brother-in-law, David, whose skull was split with an axe. And his friend and employer for 30 years, Mr. Ernest Ferguson. We'll never know. We can only guess what fierce devils tortured Seneski's soul and drove him to his destiny. But he has taken his place with the infamous and depraved. Next to Albert X, Burke and there, Landru. And Jack the Ripper himself. This way, please. The new exhibit became very popular at Marchand's, an instant hit. But of all the figures modeled so lovingly in wax, none was ever regarded with more dread than an American named Martin Lombard Seniscu. There was something about the eyes, people said, dazed, vacant, as if he had seen too much and come to understand it a moment too late. But they shouldn't have been surprised. It's the look one often gets after a quick walk through the Twilight Zone. Exhibit, starring Joby Cerny with Stacy Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etchison and Joby Cerny. 
and written for the Twilight Zone by Jerry Soule and Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were Jim McCants, Nancy Baird, Richard Hensel, Nick Sandys, Tom McElroy, Christian Stolte, Damian Arnold, Roderick Peoples, Craig Harris, Martin Aestro. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Sound design and custom Foley effects for the Twilight Zone by Cerny American creatives Bob Benson, Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, and Matt Sorrow. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. You unlock this door with the key of imagination. Beyond it is another dimension, a dimension of sound, a dimension of sight, a dimension of mind. You're moving into a land of both shadow and substance, of things and ideas. You've just crossed over into the Twilight Zone. There's a fork in the road up ahead. Oh, for... <laughs> haven't they heard of signs around here? No, I didn't think so. Well, Rowdy, I've kept it from you long enough. The fact is, we're lost. And you know what else? <laughs> Take a look at the fuel gauge. Almost empty. Don't whine at me. It isn't my fault. This map is useless. So much for shortcuts. Which way do you think it is, right or left? Okay, left. Hope you know what you're doing. <laughs> well, what do you know? I do believe that's a town up ahead. Peaceful Valley, population 981. <laughs> At least it's got a gas station. Rowdy, you just earned yourself a steak. Hey, anybody here? How do? Hi, can you fill it up? Don't see why not. Convertible, huh? Hmm, one of those new foreign jobs? The gas cap's under the license plate. Oh. Oh, I'll check the oil and water. Sure enough. Rowdy, stay. Pretty empty, huh? She's running on fumes. How'd you let that happen? Oh, I listened to a friend. Told me I could cut four hours off the trip if I took the back road. <laughs> no traffic, nice scenery. If I'd gone the way I know, I'd be in Albuquerque already. Ah, oh, you mean you're lost. That's what I mean. Think you could point me toward a highway? A great big highway with signs? Just go back to the fork and take the other road to Braden. That's about 80 miles. When you get there, ask somebody for a map. I'm fresh out. Shouldn't have any trouble, though. I shouldn't, but I always do. Here, take it out of this. Sure thing. Nice little town you've got here. What's it called? Peaceful Valley. Well, it isn't exactly a valley, but it looks peaceful enough. Where's the nearest restaurant? Ah, uh, down the street. It's closed, though. You'd be better off in Braden. Yeah, but I'm hungry, and so's my dog. <laughs> I promised him a steak. Sorry, we don't have many visitors here. I can see why. I'll get your change. Stop it. Rowdy, you take it easy. Rowdy! 1850 out of 20. Rowdy, come back here. Leave my kitty alone, you bad dog. Rowdy! <laughs> he's just playing. No, he's not. I'll fix him. 
What's that? Rowdy? Hey, where is he? What did you do to my dog? Um, what dog, mister? You've seen them. Little towns in the middle of nowhere, off the main roads and highways. You've seen them, and chances are you kept on driving. But have you ever wondered about them? Who lives in these towns? Who are they? What do they do, and why do they stay? Philip Redfield never bothered to ask such questions. And until now, he had no reason to stop and find out. If not for his dog, an errant cat, and a little girl with a peculiar electronic device, he might have driven through Peaceful Valley and continued on his way without a second thought. But he can't do that now, because whether he knows it or not, this particular shortcut has led him off the beaten path and into the capital of the Twilight Zone. And now, The Twilight Zone and our story, Valley of the Shadow, starring Chelsea Ross, with Stacy Keach as your narrator. Come on, Kitty. Let's go in the house. No, little girl, wait. Huh? What did you do to my dog? Nothing. Oh, yes, you did. Look, I was standing right over there. I saw you. You leave me alone. Not until you tell me what you did to my dog. What in the... Rowdy, here! Here, boy! <whistles> Rowdy, where are you? Hey, fella, you scared my little girl. That makes us even. Your little girl scared me. What do you mean by that? Just what I said. I don't know how she did it, but, but she made my dog disappear. What? She pointed something at him, about the size of a remote control. She took it out of her pocket, and he vanished into thin air. Are you feeling all right? No, I never feel all right when I see a miracle happen. It raises my blood pressure. Easy now, mister. What kind of dog is he? A golden retriever. Ah, uh, let's look around the yard. He's bound to be here somewhere. What's his name? Rowdy. Here, Rowdy. Here, dog. Uh, look, this isn't doing us any good. I told you. You try over the hedge, I'll go around back. Don't worry, we'll find him. He couldn't just disappear. That's what I'm trying to tell you he did. Here, Rowdy. Rowdy? Rowdy! Here he is. Wait, there you are, boy. Good dog. Where were you? In the back. I guess he must have found another cat to chase. Yeah. Yeah, I guess so. Yeah, I'm sorry I popped off at you. I could have sworn. It's all right. The way Sissy disappears sometimes? Well, I know how you must have felt. How you doing, boy? Sissy's your daughter? Yep. What was that thing she had, anyway? What thing? In her hand, some sort of electronic device. Now, I know I didn't imagine that. Oh, it must have been her transistor radio. Yeah. Well, I'm sorry I bothered you. Come on, boy. I'm sorry, Dad. I didn't know anyone would see me. It's all right, sissy. It'll be taken care of. You see all that? Hmm? All what? Uh, never mind. Okay, Rowdy, back in the front seat. Let's get going. Hey, Braden's the other way. I know, you told me. Evan, 
Evans. I want to talk to Dorn. He's not here. Then you better find him. It's important. What's happened? We've got an outsider and he saw something. There's the restaurant. The sign in the window says, uh, closed, all right. Great. Well, don't worry, Rowdy. I said I'd find you a steak, and I will, somewhere. Wait here. I'm hooking your leash to the steering wheel. Hello? Anybody here? Hello? I'm sorry. I didn't hear you come in. Hi. Is the hotel open? Open? Oh, yes. But we don't have any vacancies. No? Why is that? Well, the rooms are all taken. But all the keys are still hanging on the wall. Everybody's out. They're right. Well, the fact is, I don't want a room. I just wanted a restaurant. Maybe you could make a suggestion. I'm afraid it's closed. You mean there's only one restaurant in Peaceful Valley? Yes, sir. Then where do you eat? At home. And what about your guests? They do eat, don't they? If you'll excuse me, I have some work to do. Uh, ju just a second, miss. Look, uh... My name's uh, Philip Redfield. I'm a newspaper reporter, and if I sound nosy, I guess that's because it's part of my job. Oh, I see. You don't mind, do you? No. Good. Then just answer one question for me. Look, ever since I pulled into town, people have been trying to get rid of me. They have? At least that's the feeling I get. I was just wondering why. Well... We don't get many outsiders. Mm. So I've heard. Enough to fill the hotel, though. I really have to go. I think you should, too, Mr. Redfield. All right. I get the hint. Oh, miss. Yes? Mind if I take one of your newspapers? What? Oh, not at all. Please. Hey, you better get your subscription renewed. This paper's nine years old. Come on, Rowdy, let's get out of here. So long, peaceful valley. Thanks for the memories. You tell him, boy, nothing here for us. Just let me turn around. A few minutes from now, we'll be back in the real world. Oh, it's a good thing they don't fix this road. Might make people want to come here. There's the fork. Don't see any stop sign. Do you, Rowdy? Nope. Me neither. Well, let's punch it. What was that? Rowdy, are you okay? Rowdy? 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 fault, boy. I shouldn't have been going so fast. Breathe. Breathe, please. Oh, Rowdy. Rowdy! Had an accident, did you? No, an accident had me. I had the top down. He was thrown out of the front seat. There's no heartbeat. Let me check. Nope. I don't believe it. He's dead. Front end's pretty smashed up. Radiator shot, too. Doesn't make sense. The road was clear. There wasn't another car for miles. Maybe it was a rock. There are no rocks around here. Can't be too sure. 
Yeah, must have been. Rain washes some big ones into the road every now and then. If there were, it would still be here. Could have knocked it off the road. Come along, Mr. Redfield. Come where? We'd better get you to a doctor. Do what about my dog? You have nothing to worry about. Can you walk okay? Here, lean on me. Wait a minute. I don't think I want to go back into town. Not your town, anyway. You need to be examined. I'm all right, I tell you. You don't know that. Could be internal injuries. If anything's wrong with you, it'll be on our conscience forever. Take it slow. In here, Mr. Redfield. This is a doctor's office? In a way. Thank you, gentlemen. You can leave now. If you're not a doctor, what are you? My name's Dorn. You might say I'm the mayor. And these are my associates. Mr. Evans on my right and Mr. Connolly. Hello. How do you do? And how do you feel, Mr. Redfield? Terrible. Oh, I'm sorry to hear that. Would it help you to learn that your dog is well? He's dead. Oh, no. Not at all. Merely stunned. I assure you, he's quite happy. How do you know? Mr. Swanson called in. That's the man who helped your dog. He thought you'd be pleased. I am, if that's true. You have a suspicious nature, don't you? I thought I was supposed to see a doctor. Oh, of course. But you don't really need one, do you? If you did, we'd have one here in no time, believe me. Then why am I here? Just to bring us all up to speed, in a manner of speaking. Please, sit down. We'll try not to detain you too long. After all, you can't go anywhere in a wrecked car now, can you? You've got that right. We'd like to ask you a few questions, if we may. Don't worry, only a few. Uh, Mr. Evans, perhaps you'd care to begin. Mr. Redfield, it's been reported that you saw something, a miracle, I believe you called it, across from the gasoline station. Would you please tell us about this miracle? Sure. My dog ran after a cat. What were the details? That's it. You're quite certain? Nothing more? Yes, yes, I'm certain. Mr. Connolly, your question. I was simply wondering, Mr. Redfield, why you told the girl at the hotel that people were trying to get rid of you. What is this, a quiz show? Look, I've got a wrecked car, and I'm already a day late for work. I assure you, it's being taken care of. Just a few more questions, if you please. I think you mentioned that you're a newspaper reporter. So? A noble calling, but limited. I suppose you have a novel in the planning stages? Who told you that? <laughs> no one. It's a fact, though, that most reporters aspire to be novelists. I wouldn't know. Are you married? No. Engaged? No. Listen. So you came to Peaceful Valley by mistake. No one knows you're here. Oh, they will. A lot of people are going to know I was here, Mr. Dorn. Oh, dear. What's the story on this place, anyway? Rowdy didn't just run after a cat, and I didn't crash into a rock that wasn't there. What did happen? Come back in an hour, Mr. Redfield. Perhaps then you'll have the answers you seek. I'd uh, like to speak with my associates first. Where can I find a phone? There's one at the hotel. One hour, then, Mr. Dorn. <laughs> Do you think it's wise let him go like that? He'll be watched. Well, gentlemen, it's happened. It had to, eventually. No, it didn't have to. And it wouldn't have if we'd kept our wits about us. But we didn't. We were complacent, so infernally sure of ourselves. Dorn. It's true, Mr. Evans. Would you explain the point of keeping the hotel open and the restaurant closed? Doesn't it seem likely that there would be more inquiries for food than for rooms? There haven't been either in over 16 years. You see? Complacency. And I'm as much to blame as anyone. If only the Johnson girl hadn't been so careless. If only Fredericks hadn't behaved suspiciously. If only I hadn't panicked and activated the barrier. You had to. There wasn't any choice by then. So now an innocent young man who's done no one any harm must suffer for our mistakes. Mr. Redfield. I was told there's a telephone here. Well, yes, but... Where is it? 
I keep it under the counter. Uh-huh. A real antique, huh? Figures. How do you get the long-distance operator? Just ask for her, but... Hello? Hello? Yes, I'd like to call Albuquerque. Chapel 77205, station to station. That's quite a mayor you've got there. Makes a person feel really welcome. You've spoken with Dorn. Yeah? Um, all right, uh, keep trying. My name's Redfield. Well, I see they haven't come back. Pardon? Your guests? All the keys are still here. Oh. Because there aren't any guests, isn't that right? You should have left when you had the chance, Mr. Redfield. I tried to, believe me. But I smashed my car up on a rock that's invisible. Now, how could that be, do you suppose? I don't know. Do you have a name, or is, is that a secret, too? It's Ellen. Ellen Marshall. All right, now, Ellen. I want you to let me know when my call comes in. It's very important. Will you do that? Yes. Where will you be? Well, I'm going to check on my car, and then I'll be in the mayor's office. Still starving to death, probably. Rowdy! How you feeling, boy? I counted you out, you know that? I gave him some water. What about the car? Uh, it's pretty banged up. Hood sprung and the radiator's punctured. Yeah, I know. You were supposed to be fixing it. Nobody told me. Well, I'm telling you. Can't do anything unless it's authorized. It is authorized. 200 bucks extra in cash if you get it fixed by tonight. Consider it a bonus. It has to be official. Sorry. You're going to be a whole lot sorrier, I promise. Mr. Redfield, come in. I thought you said my car was going to be repaired. Sit down, please. I don't want to sit down. I want to know why nothing has been done to my car. Why is it just sitting out there? Primarily, Mr. Redfield, because you won't be needing it anymore. No? And why not? Because you are never going to leave Peaceful Valley. Is that supposed to be a threat? You see, Mr. Redfield... Now, the situation is rather complicated. While we hold no brief against you personally... Wait, I think I've got it figured out. Oh? Peaceful Valley is an insane asylum, and you're the head lunatic. I'm never going to leave. Who's going to stop me? We are, if necessary. There's nothing you can do, Mr. Redfield. And we'll see about that. Don't do anything foolish. Please listen to Mr. Evans. Tell him to get his hands off me! Come with us. I said don't touch me! Mr. Redfield, be reasonable. You be reasonable. As far as I know, kidnapping is still a crime in this state. Gentlemen, I implore you. This violence must stop now. Oh, you've got one of those too, huh? What are you going to do, make me disappear? Don't you fall. There. You shouldn't have done that, Dorn. Now he's seen the device up close. You mustn't bring him back. I have to. What did you do? How, how did I get in this chair? You were disassembled. D but I, I... I was across the room. Your molecules were transported and reassembled with this. That's the same thing the little girl used. So what is it? I'm afraid you wouldn't understand. Even if you were a physicist, which you aren't. Try me. Let's say it's a device by which we move objects from one location to another. All things are collections of atoms with spaces in between. Even you, Mr. Redfield. And those atoms are in a given mathematical order. This mechanism breaks them up and stores them, then puts them together again in the same order. That's ridiculous. Perhaps. But it saves time when you want to move your furniture around. Dorn. Yes, Mr. Evans? Let's get this over with. What's he talking about? You smelled a story in this town, Mr. Redfield. And you were right. You turned off onto the road to Peaceful Valley. You saw certain things that defied logic. You became curious. So we had to stop you. 
And now, I'm sorry to say, we must do worse. Because you have stumbled upon the best kept secret in the world. What secret? Our gift. Dorn. Relax, gentlemen. It will do no harm to tell him now. Our gift, Mr. Redfield, bestowed on the people of this village. 104 years ago, a man came to Peaceful Valley, from what land or even what planet, no one knows. Ugh, oh, come on. He was a brilliant scientist, but he was also wise, as you shall see. From his brain came equations the likes of which no one has seen or dreamed of. No one on this planet, at any rate. What kind of equations? Of course, I can't tell you what they were, but... You're aware, I trust, that the basis of this complicated process we call life is energy. It is a powerful, mysterious force. If enough of it were to strike a single square inch of Earth, it could run all the machines in the world. It could perform miracles. And you expect me to believe in this, this magic? No magic. The scientists' equations unlocked the force, Mr. Redfield. And from them has come the greatest power for good or for evil that the universe has ever known. Where do you come in? He decided to entrust his secret, the equations and the machines he'd built, to three men. He instructed them to give the people of Peaceful Valley the benefits of this power, but under no circumstances to reveal the secret to the outside world. It was to be kept here until humanity learns the ways of peace. And that is your story, Mr. Redfield. So you can see why we cannot allow you to leave. Our law is very clear. It says, let him who discovers the secret be eliminated. There is more at stake here than your life, much more. And now it's time to finish it. What are you doing? Come with us. Get away from me! Don't make it hard on yourself. Come, Mr. Redfield, we can't do it here. I promise you it won't hurt a bit. No! Wait! Wait! What is this place? A laboratory, built by our benefactor. There's the original of the dissimulator, somewhat larger than the one we used on you upstairs. And this is a second generation model. The same principle, with one important difference. It works in what we call the time dimension. No end of uses for it. For example, please step over here, Mr. Redfield. And don't be afraid. Mr. Connolly? Yes? Hand me that letter opener on the desk. Now, let's say that your automobile accident had been more serious. If you had been injured, if some metal had penetrated your flesh, like this. Ah, ah. Oh. Ah, you s stabbed me. Precisely. But don't worry. As soon as I direct the time ray at your wound, you will be restored to a moment before the letter opener entered your chest. My skin, I can, I can feel it closing up. This is fantastic. Isn't it? Even the fabric of your shirt. Now, let me see. This console is a duplicating machine, but not like others you've seen. Here, for example, on this card is a description of the atomic structure of a ham sandwich on white bread with mustard. One ham sandwich. I believe you said you were hungry? Not anymore, Mr. Dorn. Out there on the road, what did I run into? In the car. I'm sorry about that, but we had to stop you. It was an energy field, a wall of loosely packed atoms, so to speak. Purely an emergency measure. Now, behind this wall panel with the cards is a folder containing the sacred papers, the original equations from which everything you see came about. In case you still doubt that they exist. Do you know what you've got here? I believe so. And you mean to say you don't intend to share it with the world? Oh, good heavens, no. I've already explained why. The world isn't ready. But Peaceful Valley is? We have no wars here, no crime, no violence, no greed. Unlike your world, ours is a place of peace. We use the power for good, not evil. And what makes you so sure the rest of us wouldn't do the same? Come now, Mr. Redfield. The history of civilization is written in blood. 
Because people wanted things. With this power... With this power, they would destroy the universe. They are children. But that one machine, it could stop sickness and suffering. It could cure disease. And you let people... Haven't you any conscience? Yes. That is why we cannot release the equations. The same power to heal the sick could be used to kill the innocent. It could mean the end of the world. I don't believe that. Think, Mr. Redfield. What did you do with Professor Einstein's primitive equation E equals MC squared? It could have been used to make the waters flow in the deserts, to feed the starving millions, was it? No. It was used to destroy countless lives with a bomb. So you're just going to sit on your secrets, use them for making ham sandwiches. Ham sandwiches are a bit better than total destruction, wouldn't you say? Let's get on with it. He knows too much, we have to eliminate him. You hypocrites. You talk about us, but when you want someone out of the way, what do you do? You eliminate him. Be quiet. No, he has a point, Mr. Evans. That is what I've been pondering. If we kill this man, then in what way do we differ from the outsiders? It's the only solution. Thank you, Adolf Hitler. Oh, dear. We didn't anticipate this, did we, gentlemen? It is the law. Not necessarily. The law says, let him who discovers the secret be eliminated. It doesn't say killed. You can be eliminated one of two ways, Mr. Redfield. Through death or through assimilation. The choice is yours. Will you die or will you join us? You mean live here the rest of my life? Exactly. Become one of us. It won't be unpleasant, you know. We'll give you a nice house built to your specifications. Time to write that novel. Nothing or everything, huh? Well, which shall it be? What do you think? In that case, welcome to Peaceful Valley. I've equipped it with bookshelves, a desk, reference materials, paper. I'm sorry about the old-fashioned typewriter. We couldn't find a card for anything newer. But Dorn has promised me... Miss Marshall. Yes? Why are you going to all this trouble? Because Dorn asked me to. Is that the only reason? I suppose I'd like you to know that I'm not really unfriendly. I'm not. In fact, I think we could be very good friends. Mr. Redfield. Yes? May I ask you a question? I wish you would. Do you play chess? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. Is something the matter? Uh, no, no, everything's fine. You do like the house, don't you? I tried to make it nice. It's beautiful, Ellen, but I'm afraid you wasted your time. Why? Because I won't be here very long. As long as you think that way, you'll have no choice. Dorn won't trust you. He's trusting me now, isn't he? Is he? Hello? I'm leaving Mr. Redfield's house now. You see, I'm required to tell him everything you do. But you're not like the others. If you get hungry or want anything, call me. I'll look in on you later. Oh, and don't try to go beyond the border. The force field's still active. Yes? Mr. Redfield, on your call to Albuquerque, the circuits the are... The circuits are still busy. <laughs> Easy, Rowdy. <laughs> Hello? I brought you a new typewriter ribbon and some erasers for now. Dorn's still looking for the atomic structure of a word processor. Thanks. Have you started the novel yet? Not really. I find it hard to concentrate in prison. I don't understand. You ought to. You've got the same problem. I can leave any time I want to. Then why don't you? Why should I? What could the outside world offer that we don't have? That isn't the point. It's what you could offer the outside world. Right now, at this very moment, millions of people are starving. You could feed them. They're suffering. You could make them well. But you don't care. Let them starve. 
Let the children die because their mothers can't give them enough milk as long as you're happy. Philip, those things... Are they really happening? All over the world. Every minute of the day and night. What would... you do? A terrible thing. I'd get those papers, and I'd give them to the world. You mean you'd steal them and run away. But you promised Dorn... I promised myself to be a decent human being, and that means helping other human beings. And what's the use? You don't know what I'm talking about. You never wanted anything you couldn't whip up in ten seconds like a cake. I did once. When you were going to leave Peaceful Valley. I've thought about you since then, Philip. Even asleep, I've thought about you, and it hurts. I don't know why, but it hurts. We have machines for so many things, but I can't stop this feeling. There's an equation that might help. One plus one equals one. Don't people fall in love here? I don't know. But now, Philip, I want us to be together. I could want that too, in a real world. But as long as I'm in Peaceful Valley, I'm going to want just one thing, out. All I know is, I want to be with you. Then help me. If I do, will you take me? I promise. I'll be back. Wait for me outside. Easy, Rowdy. My car. You got it fixed. Dorn always keeps his word. What about the force field? I had him take it down temporarily so I could check the road outside of town. We only have a few minutes. Then let's go. There's just one stop I have to make. Come on, Rowdy. What do I need? Maybe, uh, atomic structure of gold, uh, guitar, gun, 38 police special, that'll do. Put the equations back, Mr. Redfield. Get out of my way. Do as I say. No, you don't. Not this time. Dorn! He's bleeding. Use the time ray, quickly. Keep your hand off that machine. I don't want to shoot you! Don't! What have you done? We've got to restore them. What are you... I can't let them die! Are you going to shoot me too? No, of course not, but... Have you looked at the equations? Right here. It... Wait a minute. The first one's blank. The second one? They're all blank. You tricked me. Thank you, Miss Marshall. So now you see what would happen if our secret were to get out? The first thing you do is make a weapon. The second, you kill with it. It was all a setup, and you were part of it. Everything you said was a lie. Not everything, Philip. She thought you would prove your good intentions, as I did. But you are like the others. You believe that if the end is just, then so are the means. A pity. You have lost paradise, Mr. Redfield, and you don't even know why. Gentlemen, the machine. Yes, sir. So now you're going to do the same thing. Not quite. You're going to be rendered harmless, but it will not be an execution. I've been studying our law, and I believe I have found a way with the second-generation machine. Try to appreciate our position. 
Imagine a state which has carried the death penalty on its books for a hundred years, but has never had to invoke it. That was the case here. You were our first prisoner, so to speak, and you forced us to re-examine our law. Adjust the time ray, Mr. Evans. Goodbye, Mr. Redfield. I was becoming fond of you. Here's your change, mister. What? Your change? Oh, ah, uh, sorry. <laughs> I must have dozed off for a second. Uh, happens when you drive too long. Yeah. You say Braden's back that way. 80 miles. Down, boy. It's just a cat. You stay. That's strange. Anything wrong? Well, just that woman who walked by. Thought I knew her. Wishful thinking, I guess. Nice little town you've got here. We like it. Well, so long. Don't know that I'll be back this way, but uh, keep it peaceful. You've seen them. Little towns in the middle of nowhere, tucked safely away from the main road. Ever really thought about them? About the people there? What they do and why they stay? The next time you're tempted to take a shortcut, think twice. Because what happens there might change you and the world in more ways than you could imagine. Of course, change can be a good thing. As long as you're on your way out of and not into the Twilight Zone. Valley of the Shadow, starring Chelsea Ross with Stacey Keach as your narrator, was adapted for radio by Dennis Etcheson and written for The Twilight Zone by Charles Beaumont. Heard in the cast were David Darlow, Frenette Lebo, Christian Stolte, Amanda Amari, Doug James, Steve Key, Kurt Nabig, Richard Shavzen, Carl Amari, and Roger Wolski. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to obtain audio cassettes and CDs of these programs, visit our website at twilightzoneradio.com. The producers of the Twilight Zone wish to thank CBS Enterprises, Carol Serling, Dennis Etcheson, Claire Simon Casting, Terry Jennings, XM Satellite Radio, Sirius Satellite Radio, our sponsors and our radio affiliates for helping make this series possible. This copyrighted radio series is produced and directed by Carl Amari for Falcon Picture Group. Audio editing, sound design, Foley effects, and mix for the Twilight Zone radio dramas are by Cerny American creatives Craig Lee, Michael Slaybach, Bob Benson, and Jason Rizzo. To learn more about the Twilight Zone radio dramas and to contact us, visit our official website at twilightzoneradio.com. Doug James speaking. 